In a remote corner of the world, 12 dark figures plummet through the nighttime sky, opening their parachutes just 2,000 feet above the ground so as not to give themselves away to the terrorist group below. Thousands of miles away, a cruel dictator sends his forces to crush rebels fighting to create a democratic government. A single laser beam, invisible to the naked eye, paints the lead tank, and moments later a barrage of Hellfire missiles devastate the entire formation. In the South China Sea, one nation's bullying has alarmed its smaller neighbors, and a hundred feet below the waves a diver delicately cuts into a communications cable and inserts a remote tap, giving US forces access to classified intelligence. These men are all members of one of the most elite group of special forces in the world, and today you're going to find out if you've got what it takes to join their ranks. Could you survive Navy SEAL training? Special operations forces have existed in virtually every military. While not formally recognized as an actual military unit after World War II, special operations forces have historically been tasked with missions too risky or delicate for normal troops to conduct. An operator is a cut above a normal soldier, typically more intelligent, better trained, and far better equipped. In modern times, special forces are asked to take on a variety of missions, and some are sent on operations so risky yet so vital for national security that they are forbidden from wearing any rank or insignia or from carrying any personal identification. If caught, they will not be rescued by their government, who use their shadowy status to gain plausible deniability and avoid international repercussions. Special Ops forces come in a variety of types, each typically specialized or renowned for certain types of operations. Some, like the US Army's Rangers, are well known for operating behind enemy lines and recruiting and training partisan forces. Others, such as Germany's GSG-9, are world famous for counterterrorism operations. And if you're an evil terrorist, there's nobody you want knocking on your front door less than Germany's most elite cops. Yet, out of all the formidable special operations units throughout the world, Few have the reputation or are as feared as the US Navy's SEALs. These elite warriors have a specialization that few others can match, as they're trained to operate from the sea, air, or land, hence the name SEAL, and sometimes operate in all three realms simultaneously with a drop from an aircraft over water, then requiring a swim to shore and a trek to the enemy. Specializing in everything from reconnaissance to direct action missions, or in special forces parlance, killing the enemy and breaking his shit. Navy SEALs have seen action all around the world, and few soldiers, present or past, are as skilled as these elite operators. But what is their training like, and do you really have what it takes to join the ranks of the SEALs? SEALs operate in the most dangerous and remote parts of the world, and thus their training program is meant to produce sailors who can handle any sort of situation without panicking. Unique amongst the other special operations units of the US military, SEALs on average lose more personnel in training than they do in actual combat. Although the classified nature of some of their engagements might be keeping accurate combat casualties out of the public eye, blacking out underwater or suffering heat strokes are common, and drowning leads the way in SEAL training fatalities. Hardly surprising given the fact that SEALs must be expert swimmers. Injuries in SEAL training are commonplace and expected by the instructors who always have medical personnel on standby. SEAL training is widely regarded as the most difficult in the world and takes over 30 months for a candidate to complete his training and be ready for his first real deployment. During that time, they will go through various evolutions or events in the training schedule, with each one designed to push candidates past their physical and mental limits. Of all who enter training to become a SEAL, only 1% will ever complete their training, the rest either quitting or being forced out due to injury. In fact, instructors constantly encourage trainees to quit, known as ringing the bell for the iconic silver bell that can be rung in some events to indicate that you finally quit. Becoming a SEAL is a completely voluntary process and anyone can volunteer as long as they qualify. In order to qualify, you must be an active duty member of the US Navy, be male, be 28 or younger, have at least 40-20 vision in one eye and 70-20 in the other, although corrective surgery is possible. You must also be a US citizen, pass the Armored Service Vocational Aptitude Battery, and pass an initial physical examination that includes swimming 500 yards in 12 and a half minutes or less, rest for 10 minutes, then do 42 push-ups in under 2 minutes, rest for 2 minutes, do 50 sit-ups in under 2 minutes, rest again for 2 minutes, do 6 pull-ups, rest for 10 minutes, and then run 1 and a half miles in boots and long pants in less than 11 and a half minutes. If you qualify, then you're accepted into SEAL training, which starts with basic underwater demolition SEAL or BUDS training which itself is divided up into four phases – indoctrination, basic conditioning, scuba training, and land warfare training. 
buds will last for seven of the most grueling months of your life. Though it starts out with the five-week indoctrination course, where you learn what's expected of you as a SEAL and their ways. It also gives you a chance to prepare for the grueling challenges ahead of you. After the luxury that is indoctrination is over, eight weeks of basic conditioning begin, and this is where you'll be pushed to your physical limits and most dropouts happen. Each day you'll engage in running, swimming for one to two miles in the open ocean, calisthenics, and learning how to operate small rafts. Each of these events are timed and your scores must improve continuously or you will be discharged. One of the most important and dangerous aspects of basic conditioning is known as drown proofing, during which you'll learn how to swim with both your hands and feet bound together. To pass this evolution, you must complete a course where you bob for 5 minutes, float for 5 minutes, swim 100 meters, bob for 2 minutes, do some forward and backward flips, swim to the bottom of the pool and retrieve an object with your teeth, and return to the surface and bob for 5 more minutes. Yet another evolution meant to condition you mentally is known as surf torture or cold water conditioning. Here you must do calisthenics in the surf, which is a chilly 65 degrees, and run a mile and a half down the beach in wet clothes and boots. Then you're ordered to hop back down into the surf and do it all over again. If you've made it this far, congratulations because before you leave this phase of training, you'll have to go through the infamous Hell Week. This is an evolution where you'll train non-stop for five days and five nights with a grand total of four hours of sleep. You'll begin at sundown on Sunday and end the week at sundown the next Friday, and during that time you'll train non-stop. You'll spend Hell Week carrying your inflatable rubber Zodiac raft over your head as you run from event to event taking part in timed exercises, crawling through mud flats that are freezing cold, and diving into the chilly ocean for swims. You may not get much sleep, but you'll at least get four hot meals a day, a luxury when for most of your training you've been eating cold MREs. The hot food is meant to be a psychological boost and comfort, as you'll be freezing solid the entire time. This may seem excessive, but the extreme training is critical as on a mission, you and your team's lives may depend on ignoring sub-zero temperatures and your discomfort. SEALs don't just need tough candidates though, they need intelligent ones. Throughout Hell Week, you'll be expected to listen very closely to orders, as once more in combat, hearing an order properly, no matter how mentally and physically exhausted you may be, will be critical. For those trainees paying attention, it might even lead to a reward. For instance, an instructor may leave out part of an order to see who's actually listening. If conducting exercises with a 300-pound log, the instructor may purposefully leave out mention of the log from one of the orders, and a sharp-eared trainee will catch this and be rewarded with his team doing the task without the added burden. They may even be rewarded by being allowed to stand by a fire and rest or sit and sleep for a few precious minutes. While you're catching a few quick Zs, other teams who weren't paying attention will be lugging their heavy log around with them only to discover at the end, much to their dismay, that doing so was completely unnecessary. If you've made it past the conditioning phase, now you're going to enter your scuba training. For eight weeks, you'll train in a variety of scuba devices, many of them classified, and train in operations such as deploying from a submarine or conducting an airborne insertion into the ocean. After the eight-week scuba phase, you'll enter your final phase, land warfare. Here is where you'll learn things such as intelligence gathering, reconnaissance, patrolling, and close quarters battle. You'll learn how to execute assaults into enemy-held structures, and how to use edged weapons such as knives to defend yourself. You'll also learn how to react to and neutralize enemy snipers, and learn how to operate any vehicle while executing high-speed and evasive driving techniques. You'll be trained in small unit tactics, and how to handle explosives, how to infiltrate enemy lines, snatching grab techniques, and proper handling of prisoners and high-value friendly VIPs. You'll also learn how to survive in any environment and provide medical treatment if needed. If you've made it this far, then congratulations, the hard part is mostly over. From here, you'll head over to Fort Benning, Georgia for Army Airborne School, where you'll learn how to parachute from an airplane. After three weeks of airborne school, you'll then head to SEAL Qualification Training, your final phase of training. Here you'll undergo 15 weeks of additional training which will improve basic skills and teach you new tactics and techniques required for your assignment to an active SEAL platoon. At this point, you can clap yourself on the back because you've done what 99% couldn't do. You've received your SEAL Trident pin and are officially a Navy SEAL, one of the most elite warriors the world has ever known. 
looming over the horizon, the nearly 60,000 tons of American diplomacy waits menacingly as the enemy aircraft approach. The pilots are stunned. They can't believe they've made it this far without being spotted. As they get closer and closer to their target, they make their missiles ready to fire and wait until they're sure they can hit their target. With the American supercarrier unusually quiet, the pilots let go their deadly payload and peel away. As they head back toward the base, they can see that their missiles hit the carrier but did not even cause a scratch. Disappointed, but not undeterred, other units join the fight to try and take it out. Next up is a destroyer that launches a surface-to-surface -surface missile at the carrier. It too hits, but it causes little damage to the integrity of the carrier. Lastly, a submarine tries its luck by launching torpedoes at it. Torpedoes are known to snap ships in half with just one shot, and with several on its way, surely the carrier must go down now. But to the submariner's dismay, even with all direct hits, the American behemoth still floats. While this scene might sound like wishful thinking or something out of a cheap war movie, it actually happened in real life. The USS America was a Kitty Hawk class aircraft carrier and holds the title of being the only supercarrier sunk, intentionally or in battle, in world history. After she was decommissioned in 1996, the carrier was slated to be destroyed in a live fire testing for the up and coming Nimitz class carriers. The reason why she was selected was because she was quite similar in design and make to the Nimitz class carriers, and US Navy engineers wanted to see really how much punishment a ship like this could take. The results of the testing far exceeded any of their expectations. Over the course of four weeks, the America was pounded with missiles from aircraft and ships, as well as torpedoes from submarines. She definitely took some heavy damage, but due to her construction was still able to stay afloat by herself, even without a crew on board conducting damage control. In the end, Navy explosive specialists had to board her and place demolition charges in specific places in order to sink her which they finally did on May 14, 2005. It's incredibly unlikely that a team of skilled saboteurs could ever board the US Navy carrier and sink it with timed explosives. But even against conventional threats, these behemoths of American diplomacy are pretty darn hard to take out. Here are 10 reasons why US Navy aircraft carriers are impossible to sink. Number 10. The F-18 Attack Aircraft What would an aircraft carrier be without their aircraft? After all, their carrier air wing is what gives them their ability to attack from hundreds of miles before enemy units can even get within firing range of the carrier. There are three main aircraft that make up carrier air wings, and the F-18 Super Hornet is the strike warfare side of the house. The F-18 is the workhorse of the air wing, and each carrier can have up to about 50 of these aircraft on board. They are an all-purpose fighter that can combat targets in the air and on the ground. With their speed and maneuverability, they can easily outrun most combat aircraft in the world today. Though they have limited history in proving their air-to-air -air prowess with just two kills in the Gulf War, they've seen extensive use against ground targets in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Because of this, the F-18 is more than capable of knocking out enemy aircraft and shore installations hundreds of miles before they even become a threat to the carrier. Number 9. Link 16 US and NATO units use what are called tactical data links to share information. Though most NATO units only have Link 11, US forces are all equipped with the newest and most secure data link called Link 16. Broken down in its most basic form, tactical data links are simply a secure way to share information. By utilizing a variety of measures like frequency hopping and encryption, the data can be near impervious to enemy attempts to intercept or disrupt the information flow thereby guaranteeing the free flow of communications. In a real-world scenario, the carrier would be able to link up with the entire strike group and as many other units as the carrier wanted, thereby ensuring all units would have secure comms and a means of feeding information quickly in a real-world scenario. Number 8. The Skiff Going along the lines of secure information, on board every carrier is what's called a skiff, which stands for Secure Compartmentalized Information Space. These spaces are top secret, and only those with extensive security background investigations and a need to know are allowed to enter. While the equipment inside is highly classified, skiffs are an incredibly useful tool in that they allow processing and dissemination of vital information quickly. The information that could be received could be intel about an upcoming strike, indications and warnings of a terrorist attack, or anything else that would be of national security interest or pose an imminent danger to the carrier. Because other small ships like destroyers and cruisers do not have a skiff, the carrier becomes crucial as a means for getting vital information quickly and securely. Because of this, even if an enemy was planning an attack, the carrier would be forewarned about it. Number 7. 
their personal defense systems. All warships are equipped with a robust line of defenses that when all other measures fail and a ship must stand on their own, she can still counter an attack. Carriers are no different. They have a variety of active and passive countermeasures on board that can be their last line of defense should an enemy threat ever get through. The most dangerous threat a carrier would face would be an enemy missile. For this, carriers have multiple Sea Sparrow or rolling airframe missiles designed to take out enemy missiles as a last resort before they strike the carrier. They are also armed with a close-in weapon system designed to shoot 20mm tungsten-tipped rounds at a rate of thousands of rounds a minute. The Sea Whiz also can be fired in surface mode against small contacts like skiffs or suicide boats. For subsurface threats, carriers can employ active countermeasures known as Nixie. Nixie is a towed array that can be fired with acoustic buoys that attract torpedoes away from the carrier and toward it. Lastly, the carrier can pick up and fight against attacks along the electromagnetic spectrum with its Slick 32. The Slick 32 is a powerful piece of equipment that can operate passively and actively against enemy threats like jamming. Number 6. The EA-18 Growler The EA-18 Growler is a modified version of the FA-18 Hornet in that it has advanced electronic warfare suites on board to counter a variety of threats. Its primary mission is the suppression of enemy radar defenses, and it does this in two ways. The first way is called passive countermeasures, whereby it can pick up electromagnetic frequencies from enemy radars and pass that information along about their bearing and range to the carrier or other units. If needed, the Growler can then take out the threats itself through active measures by launching a missile at the radars. Because of this aircraft, carriers can feel relative comfort from the threat that anti-ship missiles and even ICBMs pose, since without fire control radars to find and track a target, the missiles are essentially high-priced junk. Number 5. Their Escorts Carriers are never alone, and they always deploy with escort ships. This combination of ships is then called a carrier strike group. Within each strike group, there's typically one carrier, three destroyers, one cruiser, and a submarine. Though in today's operations, escorts may peel off to conduct other taskings. In a scenario where the strike group would be under a real threat of attack, all the escorts would return to be within range to protect the carrier. As grim as it sounds, the escorts, especially the destroyers, would act more or less as a bullet sponge for the carrier in an actual battle. This is because, though the goal of a destroyer is to take out missiles well before they reach their target, in the end if it came down to trying to save a carrier by losing a single destroyer, commanders would make that difficult decision only to save as many lives as possible. But don't worry, since though cruisers and destroyers may seem expendable, they're all in reality highly capable ships and even taking down one of these ships would be a challenge for any major power in the world. Number 4. Compartmentalization On board a vessel, there are not just a couple floors and a few dozen compartments. Rather, even a smaller ship like a destroyer will have about 10 decks and hundreds of spaces, while a carrier will have a dozen decks and thousands of spaces. This large number of spaces is crucial, since it means that even if some spaces are lost due to damage or flooding, they can be sealed off and the ship can continue fighting. Another benefit of all these spaces is what's called cross-flooding. Cross-flooding is whereby perfectly good spaces are intentionally flooded out. This is usually done as a way to manage the stability of a vessel. Because of this, even if large numbers of spaces are lost or flooded, the ship will not lose mission capability and definitely will not sink easily. Number 3. The E-2D Hawkeye the most advanced and top secret aircraft on board a carrier, the E-2D Hawkeye is the eyes and ears of a carrier air wing. It's also its number one intelligence gathering asset. With a huge radar dome on top of the aircraft, the plane can coordinate strikes of all the other aircraft already in the air. Additionally, with the combined engagement concept, it can congregate data from other aircraft to help the carrier form an accurate and real-time picture of the battle space. The onboard sensors are also quite powerful in picking up enemy missile radars, surface search radar, and other electromagnetic signals that can be sent back to the carrier. Because of all these functions, it's unlikely that any enemy aircraft, surface contact, or missile will get close undetected. Number 2. Their Redundancy Carriers are just like any other warship in that redundancy is built into the system. Take for example the electrical system. There are numerous electrical generators on board an aircraft carrier, along with a port and starboard bus. Taking out just a few generators or even one of the electrical buses will not take power out of the ship. Another example would be its fire main system. 
Fire main is just seawater that's the primary method of attacking fires on the ship. The fire main loop, or how the water travels, is varied and full of twists and turns. That way, if the fire main loop is affected anywhere, it can be quickly isolated and water can still be directed toward a casualty. Number 1. Their speed The best defense an aircraft carrier has is its speed. Though the official stance is that they can go greater than 30 knots, in reality it's believed that they can go much faster than that. So fast, in fact, they could outrun practically every other warship on the planet at full power. Why speed matters is that if a carrier can move extremely quickly to avoid danger, then it's unlikely the threat will hit the carrier, whether it's a missile, torpedoes, or another ship. If the carrier cannot defend against it, then it can just run away. That's not to say that a carrier can go anywhere close to what a speeding missile can travel. Rather, a carrier can move so fast, so quickly, that the enemy's fire control solution will be outdated by the time the missile gets there, or that the seeker on the missile will have a greater difficulty in reacquiring the carrier. For missiles and torpedoes that are passive, moving out of the general area quickly would surely defeat most of those systems. Those were the top 10 reasons why an aircraft carrier cannot be sunk. Though extremely unlikely to be sunk by any singular threat, there are emerging technologies that seek to overthrow carrier dominance. One of the main ones is the threat of swarm attacks, either through drones, missiles, or suicide boats. With the prospect of facing hundreds of threats at once, this yet untested tactic is perhaps the only means to actually sink a carrier. But as of yet, the enemies of the United States have not tried such a method, and the US Navy has probably already come up with ways to counter such a threat if it were ever to face it on the battlefield. The British Army Special Air Force, aka SAS, began operations in 1941 during the Second World War. The reason for having such a specialized set of soldiers was to get behind enemy lines and attack them from within, or at least destroy what they could while gaining intelligence. It still takes part in operations that involve the United Kingdom, but as it's very much a covert special forces unit, much of what the SAS does is a secret. The Navy SEALs, Sea, Air, and Land Team, was formed much later when President John F. Kennedy established them in 1962 as a clandestine unit which, like the SAS, would take on special missions much of the time in very hostile environments. They also act under a veil of secrecy and are sometimes referred to as America's secret warriors. If both these units are so secretive, then how does one get a job with them? Well, with the SAS, there is a small problem to begin with if you are a mere civilian. They won't allow you to apply. So to start with, you must already be in the British Armed Forces or be a soldier in the British Commonwealth. Another way to get in is to join the SAS reserves, and they do accept civilians. As long as you've passed the reserve training and worked with them at least 18 months, you can apply to work in the SAS proper. To apply for the SAS, you should be between 18 and 32 years of age and be in amazing physical and mental shape. You'll be required to do at least a three-year stretch. Women can apply, but have so far been excluded from most combat movements. To apply, you must accept that you know the harsh demands expected of you, people have died during training, and that means signing an Army General Administrative Instruction Form. You're basically acknowledging you are willing to go through hell. Next comes the medical, the battle fitness test, which will mean running fully kitted or squatted for one and a half miles in 15 minutes. Apparently 10% of applicants don't even make it past this point. That pace for even an average person in running shoes and shorts isn't too bad. Now you start your real training. To join the Navy SEALs, you need to be a natural born or naturalized American between the ages of 18 and 28, although at 17 you can join if your parents say it's okay. If you want to become an officer, you can be up to the age of 33. The first woman ever started the training in 2017, but dropped out soon after. You'll need to have a clean record, and many background checks will be done. You'll then undergo physical and mental tests, including an eye test to make sure you have under 2070 vision. As for what shape you must be in, well, you are going to go through hell with the SEALs, so they suggest you follow their Navy Special Warfare Physical Training Guide. This includes lots of long and short swims and runs, lots of interval training, as well as other workouts. As for other strength training, their gym workouts basically tell you you'll have to be as strong as a bull as well as have all the cardio attributes. You'll be screened before you can start training, and that will mean you must show that you can run 1.5 miles in 11 minutes but not squatted. This also comes after a 500 yard swim in 12 and a half minutes, 42 push ups, 50 sit ups, and 6 pull ups, all with a short rest in between. Once you actually start training with the SAS, the first phase lasts 4 weeks. This will test your endurance and ability to navigate through the wilderness, that being a harsh mountain range in Wales. In 2015, a young recruit died during this exercise just half a kilometer from the end. He died at the part nicknamed VW Valley, standing for Voluntary Withdrawal Valley. Two other soldiers died that day too, leading to an inquest into the treatment of soldiers. Some of the activities in the mountains included a 15 mile hike to start with. Those that can get through that then have to do a 40 mile hike carrying a 55 pound backpack, a 
a rifle, plus their food and water. They are not allowed to use any established trails, but they do have a map and a compass. After that, they can rest a bit and start the weapons training phase, as well as do parachute training. After that, there is six weeks of jungle training, usually in the rainforests of Belize, Borneo, or Brunei. The last phase is called escape and evasion, which will mean being forced into some horrible survival scenarios, as well as learning how to handle being interrogated. This will include humiliations and other psychological harassment, as well as being blindfolded, deprived of sleep, given nothing to eat or drink, being put in stress positions, imprisoned in a small cage, and having to listen to loud noises all the time. SAS tough guy turned novelist said physical injuries finish a lot of people off during training, but you need a lot of strength of will to get through the psychological stuff. In 2016, the Washington Times reported that one Navy SEAL died in three out of the last four training classes. One was a drowning, another a suicide, and another a car crash after drinking heavily. The Post states that the six-month training will include a seven-day stretch of little sleep, self-induced hypothermia, and brutal physical conditioning known as Hell Week. It's Hell Week where most recruits drop out. The training in Colorado starts with five weeks of pre-training in class, get through that and you enter the realm of pain and indignity. The Navy SEALs website doesn't go into specifics, but states that you'll be tested to your limits of fatigue. This will include running through sand, swimming in oceans, sometimes in the middle of the night with your clothes on, rappelling down cliffs or buildings at speed, enduring cold and heat, getting lost and finding ways out, combat training, long distance underwater dives, weapons and explosives training, mission planning, tactics training, and more. Hell Week seems to be the worst part. One soldier described it as being designed to put you through 24-7 days of no rest and continual harassment. From his class of 300, only 19 completed the training. In all, it will last five and a half days and you'll almost continuously be pushed to your limits. You are allowed no more than about four hours sleep during the entire training. You'll also have to deal with integration in what's called the survival, evasion, resistance, and escape phase. Former SEAL Brandon Webb said it will involve sacks over your head, being beaten with sticks, and humiliation. It's here he said that some people lose their minds. At least after that you get some classroom time. For seven weeks you'll also have a land warfare phase as well as parachute training. If you pass it all, you'll be given the Navy SEAL tri but then have to do advanced training. This will include sniper, communications, and free fall parachute training. Once you are done, you'll have way more weapons to use than a regular soldier. In the SAS, this will include a C8 carbine assault rifle, an ultra compact individual weapon, an M16, an HK MP5 submachine gun, an HK417 sniper rifle, an AW50 anti-material rifle, handguns, tear gas, canister launchers, stun grenades, rocket launchers, portable anti-personnel mines, grenade launchers, surface-to-air missiles, and many more things it will take too much time to talk about. You'll also, of course, get all the kit, including things like body armor. According to the Navy SEALs website, your regular SEAL on land will carry such things as the Colt Automatic Rifle 15, the M60 machine gun, M203 grenade launchers, a shotgun, an SASR 50 caliber sniper rifle, an M107 anti-material rifle, a Beretta M9 handgun, a 20mm Gatling gun, and AT4 rockets. Again, these are just some of the most used weapons as the list is endless. In recent years, China's aggressive expansion of its military presence on disputed South China Sea territories has highlighted for the nation's leadership the necessity for a blue water or ocean-going navy. As the cornerstone of any modern naval force, the Chinese turned their ambition towards developing a homegrown aircraft carrier. Now, nearly a decade after refitting a half-built former Soviet carrier as a test ship, the Chinese have recently put to sea their first indigenous aircraft carrier, the Type 001A. Meanwhile, the USA is simultaneously launching its newest model of aircraft carriers, the Ford class, as it finishes a three-year pivot of its naval forces to the South Pacific in preparation for a possible confrontation with an increasingly aggressive China. Today, we'll take a look at a potential showdown between two of the mightiest ships ever constructed. In this episode of the Infographic Show, the Chinese Type 001A versus the US Ford class carrier. To determine a victor, the ships will go head to head in three key areas, crew, speed slash power, and armaments. China's navy is re-entering blue waters for the first time in over a century and faces a combat proven United States Navy. But who would win in an all out fight? A modern aircraft carrier is essentially a small, floating city, housing a crew of thousands who must flawlessly execute dangerous takeoff and landing operations 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in all weather conditions. In combat, crews can potentially be launching and recovering 240 aircraft a day, meaning that this small city must operate in perfect unison at all times and all the while with hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of live bombs and jet fuel on or below the flight deck. 
Needless to say, crew expertise is a critical component of any aircraft carrier. The American Ford class is entering service into a Navy with a rich aircraft carrier tradition. Both in its own wars and assisting allies or UN forces, the aircraft carrier has been the tip of American power for over 70 years, and its pilots and crews indubitably the most experienced in the world. During the height of carrier-based strikes during the invasions of both Iraq and Afghanistan, American carriers were generating sortie rates of more than 200 a day, an absolutely incredible feat of teamwork and expertise. The Chinese, meanwhile, have only now reached six years of aircraft carrier experience. For any new Navy, and especially its pilots, the task of operating and launching sorties from a carrier is a difficult and often painful one to master. Landing a 70,000 pound airplane atop a moving deck in the middle of the ocean is an incredibly difficult task for any airman, and Chinese pilots were not only learning how to do this for themselves, but actually designing the training program for future pilots simultaneously. Due to Chinese censorship, exact figures are impossible to verify, but it is clear by the leak of reports of ongoing accidents involving pilots both at sea and testing carrier technologies on dry land that the Chinese are finding the process of cutting their teeth on carrier operations to be as painful as any other nations. Another important factor, however, is the Chinese government's shaky faith in its own troops due to decades of corruption. As he assumed office in 2012, Chinese President Xi Jinping was warned by senior staff that they doubted China's ability to fight and win any war due to the prevalence of corrupt and incompetent military leadership. Xi would immediately launch a series of historic anti-corruption purges, announcing in 2016 that an incredible 1 million officials had been punished for corruption. Western observers note that corruption is still a major concern for Chinese leadership, and also point at a three times lowering of military recruitment standards as signs of questionable fitness from its service members. Still, the launching of the Type 001A clearly signals a Chinese Navy that's shaping up and literally shipping out. Shaking off the dark shadow of corruption and boldly stepping forward into its first carrier program, China is still unfortunately overwhelmingly outclassed by America's experience, giving the Ford class the advantage for crew expertise. Our next critical assessment of the two aircraft carriers lies in the area of speed. Aircraft carriers are the vanguards of a nation's naval forces and as such need to be fast enough to get to hotspots anywhere in the world quickly. Speed isn't just important for getting to war fronts quickly though, but also to make a carrier harder to detect and target. By staying in constant motion, an aircraft carrier is much harder to neutralize than an airfield, but can be just as big a threat. America has a long history of forward deploying its carriers around the world, and thus it's no surprise that speed was a big priority for the US Navy, with the Ford class displacing a whopping 100,000 tons and still reaching speeds in excess of 35 miles per hour. By comparison, the Type 001A is a lithe 70,000 tons and travels at 36 miles per hour. Slight, but the advantage would seemingly still go to the Type 001A, except for the reason why, though it is 30% lighter, the Type 001A is only one mile per hour faster than the Ford class. Nuclear power. The US Nimitz class, which the Ford replaces, carries dual nuclear reactors capable of generating a combined 450 megawatts of electricity, but the 40-year-old design is incapable of generating enough power for modern systems. The Ford class was thus designed not only to operate modern power-hungry electronics, but with a projected service life of 90 years, its nuclear reactors can generate up to 700 megawatts, over 25% more than its Nimitz predecessors, and leaving plenty of juice for future weapons and upgrades. Though the Chinese Type 001A is faster by a hair, the Americans once more have the advantage courtesy of the Ford's dual A1B nuclear reactors and all the modern and future capabilities a Ford carrier can thus bring to bear. Crew, speed, and power are all important for any vessel. But what about the actual weapons both ships bring to bear against one another? Unlike any other combat vessel, an aircraft carrier is unique in that it is equipped with few, if any, long-range strike capabilities in the form of guns or missiles. Instead, 
they rely completely on the aircraft they launch for both offense and defense. Because our two carriers would never physically see each other in our hypothetical combat, we instead must look at the combat aircraft each brings to bear. China's Type 001A's exact air wing complement remains unconfirmed as the ship has only now entered sea trials and is yet years away from being operational. Analysts, however, have estimated that the Type 001A will carry either four more fixed wing aircraft or eight helicopters than the Type 001, bringing its air wing to 24 to 28 fighters and 17 to 25 helicopters. Once operational, the Type Type 001A will be equipped with the J-15 Flying Shark fighter jet. Denounced by Russia as a copy of their Sukhoi Su-33 fighter, the J-15 is indubitably heavily influenced by the Su-33, but features indigenously developed technologies, an important goal for Chinese military aviation. However, by China's own admission, the J-15's engines are not as powerful as either the Russian Su-33s or the American Super Hornets, requiring the Type 001A carrier to be equipped with a ramp-like ski jump to help get the plane into the air. Its weaker engines and need for a ski ramp for takeoff assist means that the J-15 cannot take off with as much fuel or weapons as an American plane, a critical vulnerability in carrier-on-carrier -carrier combat. By comparison, the American Ford class is predicted to field between 75 and 92 aircraft, potentially tripling its combat power versus the Chinese Type 001A. More important though is the configuration of the American Air Wing versus the Chinese Air Wing. A Ford class carrier will be equipped with stealthy F-35s, EA-18G Growler electronic attack jets, MQ-25 Stingray refueling and reconnaissance drones, and E-2D Hawkeye airborne early warning and control aircraft. The addition of electronic attack, airborne refueling, and early warning aircraft to the American Air Wing means that US jets will be able to fly further, for longer, and fire first on radar-jammed and blind Chinese fighters. In the combat calculus of armaments, it is a no-contest win for the United States who comes armed with triple the firepower and more sophisticated fighter and support aircraft. So who would win in a fight between the Chinese Type 001A and an American Ford-class carrier? The United States brings proven combat veterancy and decades of experience in both operating and building aircraft carriers. Its new Ford-class carriers are not only based on a proven design, but will come equipped with the world's first fifth-generation aircraft and have plenty of capability to adopt emerging technologies such as energy and railgun weapons. While a brave and very impressive start, the Chinese Type 001A is still just that, a start based on an obsolete design for a nation that for decades had no interest in aircraft carriers. Still, some critics argue that the Ford class is too ambitious and fields too many new technologies that have never been tested in combat. Should the worst come to pass and an American Ford carrier ever finds itself in combat versus China's Type 001A, the victor will almost certainly be the American ship. But who knows? Maybe somewhere deep within the American high-tech carrier lies a critical vulnerability that may spell doom for America's flagships. November 2nd, 2021, the world is reeling from the economic devastation brought about by the coronavirus pandemic. And for world powers, as some might see it as an opportunity to make a move. Believing the United States is too distracted by China and the lingering effects of the coronavirus, Russia makes its move in Eastern Europe, seeking at last to reunify its military conclave of Kaliningrad with the motherland. It will also cut off the renegade Soviet provinces of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia from NATO and force them back into the loving arms of Mother Russia. NATO immediately responds, but quick reaction forces stationed along Eastern Europe are no match for the overwhelming might of the Russian army. It will take weeks for NATO to organize a proper military response, but the United States has already begun to strike back. Not in Eastern Europe, but in the Pacific. A U.S. Naval Task Force, part of the U.S. Pacific Command, is on its way to attack the headquarters of the Russian Pacific Fleet in Vladivostok. Russia's Far East has always been problematic for the Russian military to defend. The incredible size of Russia makes reinforcing the Far East extremely difficult and impossible to accomplish in a timely manner. Then again, the U.S. stands to gain little by attacking Russia's Far East except for knocking the Russians out of the Pacific for good. A push into Russia from the East is impossible. The distance to any military objectives worth seizing in the West entirely too far, and transportation networks easily sabotaged by the Russians. Russia, however, is not ready to give up its presence in the Pacific. And luckily for it, the Russian Pacific Fleet is its second most powerful fleet. Suffering from years of neglect, though, that's not saying much. 
Steaming out of their home port to meet the first American carrier strike group en route to their shores is a fleet consisting of six destroyers and a half dozen corvettes, led by the cruiser Varyak, flagship of the Russian Pacific Fleet. The Russians know they're outmatched in open water, so instead they opt to use the same tried and true tactics of the 1904 Russo-Japanese War. They'll be fighting the same way they fought the superior Japanese Navy, and the same way the Soviet Union expected to fight the American Navy, utilizing the doctrine of a fortress fleet. Supported by shore-based installations and aircraft, the Russian Pacific Fleet never strays more than a few dozen miles from shore. But the first strike against the Americans will come from below the waves. The Russian submarine fleet has suffered from similar levels of neglect as the surface fleet. However, with only one active carrier in the Russian Navy, great emphasis has been put into maintaining available Russian submarines. Gone are the glory days of the Soviet Navy, when hundreds of Soviet subs prowled the world's oceans, forcing the Americans into a game of underwater cat and mouse. Russian military command does not believe their Kilo-class submarines, dating back to the waning days of the Cold War, are survivable against the American fleet. Therefore, Kilos are ordered to remain silent, close to the shore, dashing in for attacks of opportunity once the enemy fleet is fully engaged. The three improved Kilo-class subs have a greater chance of approaching the American strike group, but only the Petropavlos Komchatsky is combat ready. The attack will fall on the small fleet of Oscar IIs, capable of launching long-range attacks with anti-ship missiles. Had the attack come just 10 years earlier, the Russians would have likely found great success using their subs against the Americans. After developing the greatest anti-submarine warfare capabilities on the planet during the Cold War, the United States allowed its ASW capabilities to seriously atrophy, resulting in a series of embarrassing mission kills on American carriers during training exercises with friendly nation subs in the early 2000s. However, the Americans were quick to correct their mistake, even contracting a Swedish submarine for two years to help them restore their ASW capabilities. The American 2021 fleet is not the 2001 fleet that couldn't see a submarine in the swimming pool. The four Russian subs must close to within 350 nautical miles to launch their granite anti-ship missiles. They don't dare close in for torpedo strikes against the American carrier, knowing they'll be easily spotted well before then. In order to reduce the chance of detection, the subs approach the carrier strike group on a 30-degree offset from each other, which has the benefit of greatly increasing the search radius of the strike group's ASW assets. The Americans know that their first strike will likely come from beneath the waves, and they've been prepared. ASW helicopters fan out dozens of miles around the strike group, equipped with torpedoes and sonar that they periodically dip into the ocean to listen for the telltale acoustic signature of a Russian sub. American attack subs always held an advantage over their Soviet and Russian counterparts, and during the Cold War, US subs tailed Soviet subs without being detected, allowing them to record a vast acoustic library of all known Soviet and now Russian submarines. Further aiding the efforts in the hunt for the Russian subs are the P-8 Poseidons based out of Guam, Japan, and South Korea. With the world's largest air tanker fleet, the United States is able to drastically increase the range of its Poseidons allowing the aircraft to sweep a corridor across the Pacific for the carrier strike group. The Poseidons lay down vast fields of airdrop sono buoys. On contact with salt water, the sono buoy's batteries activate. Some of the buoys are set to active search mode, pinging the ocean for miles around them with powerful sonar and listening for the report. Others are set to passive, listening for the telltale sound of a Russian sub. But further aiding the hunt for Russian submarines is a brand new development by the US Navy, a radar that can penetrate the waves and detect the underwater wake of a submarine. The subs can't evade the vast fields of sonar buoys deployed by the Poseidons, and eventually each sub begins to generate a good track. Poseidons now drop down to just a few hundred feet above the waves, allowing their magnetic anomaly detector to verify the presence of Russian submarines below. Upon confirmation, each Poseidon drops two torpedoes. The torpedoes don't even need to score a direct hit. Even a miss of 100 feet generates so much pressure that the submarine's hull will rupture. Round one goes to the Americans. Submarines aren't the only way to kill a carrier, though, and Russian Tu-22 bombers are already airborne. During the Cold War, Soviet military planners knew that attacking a carrier strike group would be an extremely dicey proposition. Official battle plans called for attacks with a minimum of 100 bombers, with an estimated loss rate of 50%. Even then, a mission kill was likely but not an outright sinking, merely taking a carrier out of action for a few months to a year as it underwent repairs. Today, the Russian Air Forces only have 67 222s, and most of them are stationed in the much more important Western beater. What they do have is the Granite anti-ship missile, K-1 
capable of being launched from standoff ranges that should hopefully keep the bombers safely out of the strike group's air defenses. Two dozen Tu-22s leave the Russian coast behind. The American carrier is moving at full power, making it a surprisingly fast and evasive target. Russian satellites fix the carrier group's location for the bombers, but only for 15 minutes before they dip past the Earth's horizon and lose radar contact. The best way to fix the carrier long term would be to use airborne radar assets. But with American air bases in Japan hosting fleets of fighter aircraft, the AWACS planes would be splashed in a matter of hours. The greatest difficulty Russian forces are having in taking the American carrier out is simply finding the damn thing. Satellite surveillance gives the Tu-22s a box a few hundred square miles wide where the carrier could potentially be hiding. Now the bombers must approach that target box and remain within range of their granite missiles, 388 miles, until a new satellite fix can help the bombers get better targeting data. The bombers could turn on their own radars, but that would make them stand out like a spotlight in a dark room, making them easy prey for the carrier's combat air patrol. While the Russians are having difficulty fixing the carrier's location, the Americans are not having similar problems. Even under intense cyber attack, the American recon satellite network is vast, outnumbered only by the Chinese in physical assets but not in capabilities. AWACS planes launched from Japan each have a detection range of just over 250 miles, and once more supported by aerial refueling tankers, the US Air Forces are able to cover a wide swath of Russia's Pacific coast with radar coverage. Further supplementing the land-based AWACS planes are carrier-launched Hawkeye airborne radar planes and EA-18 Growlers. The Russian attack wave is easily vectored, and the carrier's combat air patrol is dispatched. While the Tu-22s must get within 388 miles to launch their attack, the carrier's F-18 Hornets and the new F-35Cs each have a combat radius of over 1,200 miles. Guided by airborne radar, the F-35s take point. The Tu-22s realize they've been targeted when the F-35's fire control radar illuminates them, but by then it's too late. Countermeasures spoof a quarter of the incoming missiles, but 10 of the bombers are still down. The limited missile capacity of the F-35s is its greatest weakness, able to carry only four missiles internally in order to preserve its stealth capabilities. Instead, the F-35s are forced to switch to guns, and for the first time in decades, US fighters strafe enemy aircraft with guns. Cannon capacity is also very limited on F-35s, however, and the Russian planes are built tough. Three more Tu-22s are splashed, leaving nine. They're still hundreds of miles from launch, though, and the follow-on F-18s may not be stealthy, but with Russia unable to provide effective air cover past its shores, they don't need to be. The bombers are sitting ducks, speeding straight into a head-on deathmatch with the approaching Hornets. Wisely, the surviving nine Tu-22s turn around and head back for home. Round two, once more, goes to the US. As the surviving Tu-22s arrive home, however, the crews are sent for chow and a few hours sleep. As they rest, the bombers are being refitted with a brand new weapon, just delivered from the Western theater. The Russian military still has very small numbers of them and must use them extremely judiciously. But with the strike group now within 1,500 miles of the shore, the time is now. Half a day later, the Tu-22s are once more back in the air. They know they'll be immediately spotted by the American satellites and AWACS planes once they leave the Russian coast, but this time they don't need to get so close to deliver their deadly payload. The Americans can't believe it. The Russians must be crazy, they're trying the exact same attack that just failed so catastrophically. Vectored in by Hawkeyes and Air Force AWACS, the combat air patrol once more moves to intercept the incoming threat, well outside of anti-ship range. This time, the Tu-22s only need to get within 1,000 miles of the carrier. They have to once more rely on targeting data from the overhead satellites, meaning the American carrier can only be fixed for brief moments in time. The carrier isn't close enough to the shore for installations to aid in tracking. They must once more target a very large box of the Pacific Ocean, but this new Russian weapon is fully capable of finding its own targets. It's perfect for the task at hand, and long before the Americans' combat air patrol can intercept him, each Tu-22 drops two 10-meter black and silver missiles from their wingtip pylons. The Zircon anti-ship missiles immediately fire their rocket engines, boosting them to over two times the speed of sound. The rocket engine now detaches from the missile and falls to the ocean below, as the missile's scramjet fires into action. The missile scramjet engine has no moving parts, instead it compresses incoming supersonic air and simply adds fuel, which causes the superheated air to explode. The energy redirected behind the missile by the engine nozzle. It's a brilliant design, but only works when you're already at supersonic speed, which has limited its use by militaries for decades. 
The missiles rise to the edge of the stratosphere where the air-breathing engines can still supply needed oxygen, but high enough that the missile's onboard targeting suite can pinpoint the American carrier. A stealthy body helps the missiles evade the American Aegis radar sweeping the sky. As a satellite enters proper phase over Earth, it sends a new fix on the carrier to the missiles, redirecting their course and greatly increasing their accuracy. A few dozen miles from their targets, the strike group's Aegis radars begin to pinpoint the incoming missiles. Traveling at Mach 9, though, the strike group's missile defenses have less than 30 seconds to respond. The strike group's missile defense systems are fully automated. Humans are no longer fast enough to respond to deadly hypersonic threats. Only a machine is up to the task, and Americans have built themselves one hell of a missile defense machine. Beams of powerful electromagnetic energy reach up toward the missiles in an attempt to directly interfere with the sensitive electronics of the targeting suite or confuse them. Three missiles suddenly careen wildly off course, tearing themselves apart thanks to their hypersonic speed. Fifteen missiles remain, twenty seconds to impact. The destroyer escorts prepare to launch decoys. They first deploy chaff as a means to make the missiles think a better target is somewhere else through its superheated metal flakes. However, it soon becomes apparent that these missiles are much more advanced than the Americans thought when they don't even begin to alter course. Quickly altering course themselves, the destroyers deploy their more advanced Nolka rounds that are more powerful and try to walk the missiles away from the formation. 15 seconds to impact. The Russian missiles are finally within interceptor range of the strike group's destroyers, and within moments salvos of interceptors are fired. However, the Russian missiles are moving at such incredible speeds that a superheated layer of plasma around them is making radar lock difficult to maintain. It takes three seconds for each volley of interceptors to be fired, and by the time the second volley is fired, the Russian missiles are too close to be intercepted by American rams. Another four Russian missiles are splashed, eleven missiles remain. Five seconds to impact. Each missile is now moving at almost 7,000 miles per hour on their descent phase. The layer of superheated plasma around each missile grows in size as the missiles plunge down and the atmosphere thickens. The last line of defense for the strike group comes online and will have mere seconds to respond. On ships across the strike group, SeaWiz cannons have already been placed on standby. The plasma surrounding the descending missiles once more makes radar lock difficult to achieve. The missiles move so unbelievably fast that by the time they've entered SeaWiz range and the SeaWiz systems have swiveled the cannons in the right direction, there's only two seconds left to fire. Most of the cannons never fire, there simply isn't enough time for the onboard radar to work out a good lock through the layer of plasma around each missile. A few do, but their accuracy is abysmal. Only a single Russian missile is knocked out a mile above the carrier. Ten missiles have penetrated the carrier's defenses. Two of the missiles have suffered manufacturing defects and never detonate as they strike the carrier. The Zircon hypersonic anti-ship missile is after all bleeding-edge tech for the Russians. Bugs in the software and defects in the manufacturing are inevitable. The missiles are moving so fast, however, that sheer kinetic energy alone punches a hole through the decks of the carrier, each missile penetrating almost to the bottom hole. The electronic brain in one of the other missiles has slightly misjudged its geometry and explodes in the ocean a few hundred feet away from the carrier. The other seven, however, find their mark. The hypersonic missiles move so fast that they penetrate several decks before the onboard explosives are triggered, which only increases the destructing potential of each missile. Armed with 800 pounds of explosives, the Zircon carries only half the explosive power of a granite anti-ship missile. But with seven direct hits, it doesn't matter much. Explosions rip through the inner decks of the carrier, buckling the flight deck and destroying dozens of aircraft in the below deck hangar. Secondary fuel explosions rock the ship as black smoke belches out. Hundreds of sailors have died in seconds. Hundreds more will die soon. The carrier is dead in the water, but she doesn't sink. The incredible size and engineering of a supercarrier makes it almost impossible to sink with anything less than a massed missile attack. That's why the Soviets planned on using a hundred bombers to do the task. Russia's new Zircon hypersonic missiles are deadly to the US Navy but they are still available in such low numbers that unless Russia dedicated the majority of its stockpile to a single attack, sinking a US carrier is still incredibly unlikely. Achieving a mission kill, however, is very likely, and though the carrier won't sink, it will be out of combat for at least a year as it undergoes repairs. Modern Russia would be very hard-pressed to sink a US carrier. Finding and hitting a carrier out at sea is incredibly difficult, especially when it's on the move. Without a recon fleet of air assets the size and scope of the US's own fleet, and the ability to dominate the skies far from its own shores, Russia's first problem is just finding American carriers in the first place. Of course, in the real world, Russia is moving to develop land-based variants of the Zircon anti-ship missile, 
because it recognizes that in a realistic scenario, its 222 bombers would be unlikely to survive long enough to actually get in range of a carrier out at sea thanks to the US fighter bases in South Korea and Japan. This video is sponsored by Vikings War of Clans. Vikings War of Clans was inspired by the best strategy and RPG games of the 90s like Age of Empires. What makes Vikings World so addictive is that more than 20 million online players are constantly changing the way the game evolves. Vikings is holding a competition where they will give away Spark DJI drones to three people who reach level 10 and a Phantom drone to one person who reaches the highest level. Download Vikings for free and support the infographic show at the same time by clicking the links in the description below. With our links, you'll receive a special bonus of 200 100 gold coins and a protective shield. Our nickname in the game is the infographic show spelled as one word. Search for us and we can play together. Now let's move on to the main part of our video. China's meteoric economic rise in the last three decades has seen the world's largest nation pick itself up from its agrarian roots to become a robust and modern economy. While not more powerful than the US economically, China's is the only economy in the world to truly rival the US's. Yet all of China's economic expansion has created a crippling national Achilles heel, its overwhelming reliance on naval trade routes to export its trade goods and supply its ravenous appetite for oil. If China is to truly become a peer competitor to the US, it must secure and defend its access to the world's most important shipping lanes. In today's episode of the Infographic Show, we're taking a look at the Asian powerhouse and asking, is China ready to take on the US Navy? For decades, China focused primarily on maintaining national sovereignty by establishing a large ground force capable of fighting off another Japanese invasion or their former Soviet rivals. As China's economy expanded though, its reliance on maritime trade grew to a staggering disproportion. While every nation relies on maritime trade, China's economy depends on the sea for 60-80% to 80 of its imports and exports, and almost all of its oil supply. This has placed China in a precarious situation where it is uniquely vulnerable to disruption of those trade routes and forced a shift in focus from a ground army to a growing naval and air force. China's maritime strategic position is unique and completely stacked against it. With the bulk of its oil passing through the Indian Ocean, another of China's longtime rivals, India, is in a position to easily disrupt and even completely shut down Chinese shipping. While China maintains a larger and better equipped naval force than India, Indian ships would enjoy land-based support and quick resupply, while China would have to find a way to forward deploy a sizable battle group to the Indian Ocean that could fend off not just the Indian Navy, but the land-based Indian Air Force as well. Not only is this currently strategically impossible for the limited Chinese Navy, but China also lacks the supply and logistics ships needed to keep a task force out at sea for extended periods of time. War against the US would likely involve India as an American ally, but even if it didn't, China would still have to face America's formidable Pacific fleet. With 2,000 aircraft and 200 ships, to include 33 nuclear attack submarines, America's Pacific fleet alone is more than a match for China's entire navy, which numbers at 100 93 combat ships and 710 aircraft. In any conflict, the US Pacific Fleet would also quickly be augmented by other American naval forces. So could China hope to fend off the US Pacific Fleet in the event of war? In 1996, in response to the US granting a visa to Taiwan's President Li Teng Hui, China launched massive military exercises meant to intimidate Taiwan, beginning with live fire missile and artillery firing just kilometers from Taiwan's shores. This was followed by a widely publicized amphibious assault exercise meant to signal that China was ready and willing to cross the Taiwan Strait and invade the long independent island. In response, the United States deployed three aircraft carrier battle groups to the area and an amphibious assault ship, the largest display of American military might in Asia since Vietnam. This brief confrontation forced the Chinese to admit that they could not hope to stop the US from defending Taiwan, and internally, Chinese military leadership doubted the possibility of defeating the US Navy in any combat scenario. Humiliated by the US's response and their inability to prevent it, China reshuffled its military priorities, placing a much greater emphasis on its naval, missile, and air forces. Two decades later, their efforts have paid off in spades, with China boasting the largest ballistic missile force in the world and a competent, if still limited, navy. 
yet China is still saddled with a great deal of internal issues, the most pressing being the systemic corruption that has for decades thrived amongst the Communist Party leadership and the armed forces both. Despite Xi Jinping's anti-corruption purges, the damage to China's military by a long legacy of corrupt and ineffective leadership could take years to reverse. China also faces a serious recruitment, training, and experience problem with its armed forces. Unable to meet military recruitment quotas, China's armed forces have been forced to lower their recruiting standards several times since 2010. This has resulted in a crop of recruits whose current capabilities are questionable to say the least. As noted by Chinese observers, in 2012, a People's Liberation Army unit became so stressed out in the midst of a 15-day wartime simulation that the ongoing exercise had to be put on pause and time taken out for movie nights and karaoke parties. By day 9 of the exercise, a cultural performance troupe, PLA parlance for song and dance girls, had to be brought in to entertain the homesick soldiers whose morale had plummeted. Further reporting notes that this is likely not an isolated incident, and Chinese watchdogs have long observed that China engages in little comprehensive training of its troops in comparison with their Western counterparts. In fact, China's confidence in its own troops is so low that it was only in the early 2010s that Chinese units began to take part in UN peacekeeping deployments, long refusing to take part out of fear of international embarrassment. To further compound China's challenges in waging war against the US or another peer power, the nation has not fought a major conflict since a brief skirmish against Vietnam in 1979. The modern Chinese military has absolutely no experience in modern combined arms warfare, and to further compound China's problems, it also lacks a joint command structure amongst its various military branches like the US employs. This means that in war, it would be difficult to coordinate Chinese ground forces with their air forces or naval forces with their missile forces, etc. Given the fast pace and chaotic nature of modern war, this would leave China unable to quickly respond to and defend from threats. After the humiliation of the 1996 Taiwan Strait Crisis, China began to invest heavily into its missile forces with the goal of threatening American aircraft carriers from deep within the Chinese mainland. Maintaining the world's only missile service as a separate branch of its military, China's commitment to long-range standoff weapons is not to be underestimated. Yet despite boasting that its new DF-21 carrier killer ballistic missiles could shut the US out of the West Pacific, the truth behind these boasts is dubious at best. A ballistic missile strike on a moving target in the middle of the ocean requires a long and very complicated kill chain involving land-based radar, airborne radar, satellites, and command and control nodes to all coordinate tracking and targeting of an enemy ship, and to date, China has not displayed the capability to successfully execute every step in this complex kill chain or to protect the individual links from attack or interference. Yet even the most optimistic American naval commanders acknowledge the threat that China's ballistic missiles present to a carrier battle group, which is why the US has responded by engaging in the most ambitious ballistic missile defense program in its history. Testing everything from airborne to ship-installed directed energy weapons such as lasers, to a new generation of the standard model anti-air missile, to classified anti-satellite weapons projects, the US has taken the Chinese ballistic missile threat very seriously. China's missile forces are its best tool for keeping the US Navy at bay, but unproven as they are, it's doubtful just how effective they would ultimately be. However, the one thing that China, and most people in the US, tend to forget about are the US's submarine forces, and that's no coincidence. Secretive by design, the US's Silent Service is the most advanced submarine force in the world, and it maintains a constant rotation of 18 subs forward deployed in the Pacific, with another 8 loitering in potential conflict zones. For the US Navy in the Pacific, this means Chinese coastal waters, and with China's very limited anti-submarine capabilities and notoriously noisy subs, this underwater force alone would be enough to choke China's trade completely and sink the entirety of China's very small amphibious assault fleet should it try to invade Taiwan. Immune to China's ballistic missile forces, America's nuclear attack submarines are its best weapon in any conflict against China, something both China and the US are keenly aware of. In response, China has installed underwater listening sensors across the South China Sea, and for its part, the US has increased annual production of its new Virginia-class submarines to two a year through to at least 2030. 
China is not yet ready to take on the US Navy and win. Yet this is a deficiency it has clearly identified and is working to address with a huge expansion of its own navy, the building of two aircraft carriers, and building new diesel-powered submarines. But with a looming population crisis set to explode a demographic time bomb by 2030, where over 65% of its population will be of retirement age, China may find itself pressed for the economic resources it needs to continue expanding its military. The US also faces challenges in maintaining its global peacekeeping naval fleet, but with with a strong network of alliances and access to financial networks China does not, it will take some serious and very focused investment in its navy, perhaps at the expense of its other branches, for China to ever truly challenge America in the open ocean. From video games to Disney movies to livestock to anime, we're about to take you on a crash course of some of the craziest things the Navy SEALs found inside Bin Laden's compound after he was shot dead. First the surprising, before we work on our way up to the truly weird. Emails and extensive diaries were found on Bin Laden's computer showing that contrary to popular belief, Bin Laden still had a lot more influence and control over Al-Qaeda than anyone believed. He communicated with the group extensively through thousands of written correspondences, issuing everything from strategic commands to religious fatwas. Bin Laden didn't have an internet connection at the compound, so couriers would instead take his written emails on a flash drive and send them out from a local internet cafe. And that's sure to get a laugh out of anyone who knows anything about cybersecurity. We can only hope he was at least using a VPN. Other deeply personal things soon became CIA property after the raid, including Bin Laden's personal diary and the wedding videos of his son, Hamza. Incidentally, the wedding video actually had great strategic importance to US intelligence. It was widely believed that Hamza was being groomed to take his old man's place at the seat of the Al-Qaeda table, but they hadn't received any photos of him since he was a child. Until now. This was presumably pretty useful intelligence as Hamza bin Laden was killed by US forces in Afghanistan between 2017 and 2019. Okay, so that's all the serious stuff out of the way. Now, let's get strange. Did you know bin Laden was very possibly a gamer? While we can't ever know who was playing or watching what on the Al-Qaeda leader's computer, he was cooped up for a half a decade and had a multitude of video games on his PC. <laughs> it's more than likely he used some of his favorite video games to blow off some steam. So what kind of games did this architect of terror like to indulge in? A big one was Counter-Strike, the iconic multiplayer game where two teams play as either terrorist or counter-terrorist groups in conflict with one another. We can only wonder which team he preferred to play as, whether he continued to do what he did best online, or if he decided to play as the counter-terrorists instead for a little escapism. He also had a pirated copy of Half-Life on his computer, and there's a kind of satisfaction in knowing that he died before he ever got a chance to play Half-Life Alex. He also had Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars, the puzzle game Zuma Deluxe, and Sniper Elite Nazi Zombie Army 2, because we guess even Bin Laden doesn't approve of Nazis. But he wasn't just a PC gamer, Bin Laden also apparently loved a good emulated Nintendo DS game, because he had a whole bunch of them. These included classics like Super Mario Bros. and Animal Crossing Wild World. Incidentally, he didn't pay for official releases of any of these games. The man truly was a monster. But wait, it gets weirder. Without going into too much detail, Bin Laden's computer had a vast number of graphic screen caps from 8-bit Japanese adult games from the late 1990s. His computer also contained such classy file names as, no, we're not kidding, booby2.jpg and horsedance.flv. It must have been a very long five years. Incidentally, Osama bin Laden must have been an otaku, the Japanese expression for someone who's incredibly enthusiastic about niche topics, more commonly used in the West to describe someone heavily invested in Japanese culture and media. Bin Laden had a vast collection of anime on his computer, including Dragon Ball, Detective Conan, Bleach, and a little-known anime adaptation of the Devil May Cry game series. Incidentally, he also had a Dragon Ball video game as well as Final Fantasy VII. Doesn't quite seem like a hobby befitting of a man who had the top spot on the FBI's most wanted list for years on end. But enough about Japanese media. For a guy who despised the West as much as Bin Laden, surely we couldn't expect him to indulge in anything as corrupt and sinful as Western TV and movies, right? Not quite, as it turns out. Bin Laden actually had a vast number of Western movies and TV shows, particularly cartoons. These included Cars, Ice Age, Dawn of the Dinosaurs, Chicken Little, and Ants. There's a real irony in a man as anti-Semitic as Osama Bin Laden owning a Woody Allen movie about talking cartoon ants. Because he probably needed a laugh during his five years of de facto house arrest, he also kept several episodes of the cartoon Tom and Jerry on his computer, as well as an episode of Mr. Bean. He also had the movie adaptation of Resident Evil, which has made a number of viewers wish a team of Navy SEALs would storm in and shoot them. 
But he wasn't all about the fiction. Like many of you fine intellectually curious infographics fans, he was also a lover of documentaries. These included Mysteries of Egypt, Sex Crimes and the Vatican, BBC Battlefields, and Welcome to the 11th Dimension, the final part of Nova's Elegant Universe series, a surprising pick for a hardline religious fundamentalist. But without a doubt, Bin Laden's favorite documentary topic was himself. That's right, Bin Laden had a large number of documentaries about himself and his crimes, including Biography, Osama Bin Laden and Where in the World is Osama Bin Laden. These presumably gave him a little bit of self-esteem boost whenever the isolation was getting too much for him. In the interest of balance, he also owned a copy of Loose Change 2, the 9-11 truther documentary created by Alex Jones, suggesting the attack was an inside job. We can only assume Bin Laden thought of this one as a dark comedy. But looking at screens for all those years can really mess with your eyes. What about when one of the most evil men on earth just wants to kick back and read a book for a little while? Bin Laden had a pretty vast and varied library, including books on American diplomatic and foreign policy, including Noam Chomsky's Necessary Illusions, Thought Control in Democratic Societies, and Bob Woodward's Obama's Wars. He was also a big fan of books on conspiracy theories, such as the Illuminati and of course, 9-11 conspiracy theories. He truly was the has-been one-hit wonder of infamous international criminals. And finally, some of the things on Bin Laden's computer that were so odd they defy other categories. Internet videos, pictures, and of course memes. We're talking ancient memes too. He had saved a copy of Charlie Bit My Finger, the popular viral video from 2007, a respectable collection of funny and cute cat videos, and even an adorable picture of a stuffed monkey. He also had a weirdly high number of crochet guide videos, including a guide to crocheting an iPod sock. It's almost surreal to think that Bin Laden had these goofy videos on the same hard drive as footage of Al-Qaeda beheadings. Bin Laden had a lot of saved YouTube videos on his computer before his death. Thankfully, because we started making videos only a few months before his death back in 2011, there was nothing from the infographic show on that deeply cursed hard drive. And finally, one of the strangest things of all on Bin Laden's computer, his press release bloopers. You might remember the sinister videos of Bin Laden sharing his ideologies and threats against the West on VHS tapes, normally sitting in a cave and flanked by his Al-Qaeda henchmen. But while in the Abbottabad compound, Bin Laden filmed a number of practice videos that never ended up getting released to the public, serving almost as a kind of Al-Qaeda blooper reel from the master of terror himself. Personally, we can't imagine it'll be finding its way onto America's Funniest Home Videos anytime soon. And that's all you need to know about the strangest things the Navy SEALs found in the Abbottabad compound. Good riddance, Bin Laden. We're sure they have a copy of Chicken Little in Hell. Day 1, 0, 100 hours. Crawl, dirtbags! An instructor tears into your tent quickly followed by several others. They're all carrying rifles or old M60s and are firing blanks with wild abandon. Some of the instructors toss out a grenade simulator and smoke grenades. The fake grenades still explode with a hell of a bang, and the sudden cacophony of noise is enough to temporarily drive you deaf. You've made it through weeks and weeks of the toughest training on Earth, but what awaits you now is five days of absolute hell. If you survive, though, you'll have the privilege of joining the ranks of the single most elite fighting force the planet has ever seen. You were smart and slept in your uniform and boots, so it's only a matter of flipping out of the bunk and landing on the ground before starting the low crawl. Instructors fire off blanks over your head as more flashbangs and smoke grenades go off. It's utter pandemonium, meant to stun and disorient you. But you know war will be worse. It's all a mental game. You simply have to shut out the screaming instructors, the firing of hundreds of blanks all around you, and the bursts of grenade simulators. Just focus and crawl. You crawl 100 meters on asphalt from your tent to the compound, the place you've sweat in harsh PT for months now. On a raised platform stands a senior instructor awaiting for your class of 90 to fall into formation. As your fellow classmates make the grueling crawl, you already see one standing up. That can only mean one thing, he's quitting. He looks dazed and slightly confused. He may have been a little too close to one of the flash grenades when it went off. Oh well, injury and accidents claim as many would-be SEALs as the inability to continue in the brutal training. San Diego is seated right in sunny SoCal, but in the fall the area is prone to rainstorms and temperatures can dip into the 30s at night. Today is no exception, and as the instructors order you to double time it back to the tents, rain starts to fall. Don't worry though, Buttercup, because the last thing the instructors want is for you to be left out all cold in the rain. That's why they had the decency of tearing your sea bag apart and removing all the carefully packed uniforms from the plastic waterproof packaging. Next, you'll be taking it into the ocean for a quick half-hour wash in neck-deep water. You have less than a minute to repack your sea bag and get your ass to the beach. Then it's an icy cold plunge into the Pacific Ocean, so you can fight the waves in tide and neck-deep water. 
Everything inside your sea bag is going to get soaked in seawater, and that's the point. There'll be no comforts these next five days, and even if the uniforms dry off on their own, you'll still have to contend with all the chafing sand and salt they're getting covered in. Though, don't worry, because you'll be real good friends with the ocean this week. You're in the surf for just over half an hour with the instructors watching over you from a 12-foot berm. The entire time they're complaining about how cold it is, despite the fact that they've got warm jackets on and rain ponchos. It's all part of the psych game. They're probing each and every one of you for weakness. With teeth chattering so hard you're legitimately afraid you might chip one or two of them, you briefly think that all you have to do to make the cold and pain end is just quit. Nobody would even blame you for it. But you shove that thought out of your mind and you blank your brain. That's the key to survival here. Don't think about anything except the task set before you. One of the instructors makes an offer. He knows that you and your class have prepped for Hell Week by stashing little snacks around the training area. If one of you gets him a snack, he'll let you out of the water. Initially, nobody says anything. It's true. You've personally hidden at least two candy bars in the sand in spots only you know of. Surviving Hell Week isn't just about carefully obeying orders and following rules, it's about breaking them and cheating when you can without getting caught. Because in combat there are no rules, there's only mission success. You expect one of your other classmates to give in to the temptation of giving up their own stash just to spare some time in the water, but it seems everyone's wise enough to know that the extra calories later is worth more than avoiding some discomfort now. After another 20 minutes, you're given the order to get out of the water and return your sea bags to your tents. At least they'll be out of the rain, but you won't be, because you're going for a little boat trip. You and your class are ordered to report to the beach assembled in boat crews with your IBS, or inflatable boat, small. You think you know it's coming. You've been rowing out to surf despite waves as tall as 12 feet for weeks now, but the instructor throws a curveball at you. Tonight, you'll be doing rock portage. This sends a shiver down your spine. And it's not the cold, because you're shivering all the time now as your body fights up hypothermia. This is pure fear. You and your crew drag your boat out onto the surf and climb aboard it, fighting the raging waves. They still manage to flip over several of the small boats, and you think yours might be next, so you grab your paddle as hard as you can. There's a rule here in SEAL training, no loose paddles. You can get tossed out of your boat as much as you want, it's bound to happen, but you don't ever let go of your paddle. You're not just saving Uncle Sam money by not having to replace it, but you're also preventing serious injury to yourself and others by holding on to it. You've seen people get teeth knocked out and faces gashed open by loose paddles. Incredibly, you managed to break past the 10-foot waves and now paddle out into the Pacific Ocean before paddling down to a point directly across from a mess of sharp, jagged rocks. Other boats line up, and then on a signal from the instructors on the shore, you and a second boat begin your approach. The goal is simple. Land your team on the rocks. The reality is far from it. The waves are vicious and the boat takes a pounding. As you get to the rocks, a wave picks up half your boat and brings it crashing down. Someone smashes their face right onto a flat rock. They're lucky to avoid one of the jagged ones, while another student who is struggling to get out of the boat gets their foot cut between two rocks as the boat pushes them over. You can hear the sickly snap of an ankle being broken in two, even through the rain and roaring waves. You're lucky, and you only get some mild cuts and bruises as you scramble over the slick rocks. But then you turn back because there's no lifeguards here. Someone has to get your buddy with the broken ankle out of the water before the waves break him to pieces on the rocks. And that someone is you and your boat crew. Working together, you manage to pull them to safety. There's already a medic on scene and waiting, another dropout. But you see the respect in your instructor's eyes. Injury doesn't mean a pause in the training, and it's far from the only one this night. As the final boat crews make the extremely dangerous landing, you're given a moment to rest, literally a moment, before grabbing your boat, putting it over your head, and jogging to a pier. Then it's back in the water for another hour of treading water. Eventually, the instructors order you to inflate your pants by tying off the bottom of the legs so you can use them as flotation devices. That's a small mercy. You get a hot breakfast at 6 a.m. and you're allowed to eat it indoors at the chow facility. You eat everything on your plate and fill yourself with some hot coffee while you have the chance. It's an incredible luxury. And the Navy isn't feeding you well out of the kindness of its heart, it's literally keeping you alive. You're burning so many calories shivering and exercising that without four meals a day you will die. Then it's back into the water for more swimming and paddling. By the time night approaches, you've completed your first full day of Hell Week, and there's four more coming. Day 2 you wake with a start to the sound of a screaming instructor. You were dreaming of sleeping comfortably in your cot, but when you come to, you're right back on the beach. Your team was fastest on the latest lap swim, and as a reward, you've got a whole 10 minutes of rest. That's it. Now you've been up for 24 hours and you've slept less than 20 minutes that entire time, snatching up a minute of shut-eye here or there whenever you could get it. The instructors have a surprise for you today. 
They decided to give you a break from the ocean and instead order you to grab your IBS and get marching south along the beach. The Mexico border isn't very far from here, and you're wondering where in the world you're headed when you spot the outlet of the Tijuana River. You've been marching for eight miles through sand with a 300-pound boat on your head before you see it. Welcome to Camp Swampy, also known as the Mud Flats or the Sloughs. This is where the Tijuana River runs along the Mexico border and empties into the Pacific. The river brings with it plenty of churned up mud, and even worse things as some of the sewage from the city of Tijuana ends up in that water. This is the perfect playground for seals to be, and the instructors are waiting for you with huge grins on their faces. Getting here was a race against the other remaining teams. There's nine now. Everything you do is a race, and the prize for coming in first is the sweet few minutes of relief you get for waiting for the final teams to make it. Your team got here second, and you get an incredibly luxurious five minutes by a roaring fire to warm up and do what your body is screaming for. Sleep. Inevitably, the sound of a whistle wakes you right back up. Uncle Sam cares deeply about your self-esteem, which is why he's prepared a mud treatment just for you. At the sound of a second whistle, it's elbows and asses into the mud, and you're ordered to cover yourself in it completely, even shoving it down each other's pants and into your shirts. Hey, don't look so glum. A Beverly Hills spa would charge hundreds of dollars for this treatment, and the US Navy is giving it to you for free out of the kindness of its heart. Never mind the mud is seeped in random sewage, probably at least partially toxic, and smells like the devil's… hole. Stick it in your face and get it into every nook and cranny. All the instructors want to see from you is white eyeballs and teeth. Then it's time for games. Mud races mostly, with random breaks to ensure everyone refreshes their exfoliating mud treatment by covering every single square inch of their bodies in freezing mud all over again. When it comes time to eat, you do your best to eat as little mud as possible, but it's inevitable. Several more students quit. One of them looks physically ill. The instructors wrap them up in warm blankets, give them hot coffee and fresh jelly donuts. Then they make them sit in front of you and eat their donuts and drink their hot coffee. It's yet another mental torture, but you'll shove it out of your thoughts. Day 3 Days blend into each other in Hell Week, especially when your brain is actively hallucinating because it's so sleep deprived. You're still in the mud flats and spend hours playing hide and seek games with the instructors and against other teams, darting from bush to bush and rock to rock. You run into several illegal border crossers only to send them off screaming. You don't blame them, you look like a monster covered head to toe in wet caked mud. People's bodies are starting to give out on them, and a class full of 20 year olds is now moving around like they're in their 90s. The instructors give you one break, allowing you to collapse into bleachers built there specifically for SEAL trainees. 50 feet away, just far enough that none of the heat reaches you, is a blazing bonfire. An instructor makes you all a deal. If you can tell him a funny story that makes him laugh, you can go stand by the fire. A trainee gives it a shot, gets rejected. As punishment, he has to go dunk himself in the mud again. You think you've got something about the time your stepdad walked in on you while you were watching some adult entertainment online. It's a hit, and the instructor roars with laughter as he allows you to stand up and double time it over to the fire. The heat is a godsend, and you revel in the first warmth you felt in days. You could stand here forever, it seems, and you want nothing more than to roll up on the ground and go right to sleep. The heat is so intense that it causes steam to billow off your uniform. And then, one of the instructors begins shouting, Student on fire! Fire! Everyone in the water! It's a big joke to the instructors, but you respond automatically, gritting your teeth as you hit the freezing water. It's back into the wet mud for you as your entire class is ordered to stand neck deep in the water for another hour. Then the instructors tell you all to stick your head down under the water and keep it there for a full five seconds. If anyone got up early, everyone would have to do it again. You take a gulp of air and go down, counting 1-1000. 2 1000, 3 1000, 4 1000, 5 1000, 6 1000. You give it an extra second. You don't want to be the reason everyone has to repeat the torturous exercise, but it's all just a mind game. And the instructors call out random students, forcing everyone back under the water. You do this again for who knows how many hours before it's back on the beach and back on the bleachers. Another round of funny stories, another opportunity to stand next to the fire, and inevitably, another shout of student on fire, everyone in the water and it happens all over again. Day 4 It's 2 in the morning, and you're allowed your first official sleep of Hell Week. You and your team are crammed underneath the overturned IBS, nuts to buns, desperately trying to leach each other's body heat. The guys in the middle are the luckiest since they get the most body warmth. But the Navy doesn't play favorites, and it wants everyone to have a chance at the middle. That's why one member of each boat crew has to get up and run around the perimeter of the camp, shouting out, It's Hell Week at Camp Swampy, and all is well! It takes approximately a minute for the run to finish, 
after which he ducks under the boat and the next person in the front of the human stack gets to go. The process repeats itself over and over again until morning. But if there's a lapse in the running and shouting, the instructors immediately descend upon you, ordering every single boat crew to get their asses back in the water. You manage to snatch a few minutes of sleep across the entire four hours from 2 a.m. to sunrise, then it's back up into the mud. A few more mud races and then finally a chance to clean yourself off with a long swim into the breaking surf. You're almost grateful to be out of the mud, even if the 8 to 10 foot waves do their best to drown you or pound you into the underwater rocks. There's a few more dropouts by the time the swimming is over, some from sheer physical exhaustion and others from even more injuries. The mud made yet another student too sick to continue on and you hate to think about what crap you've covered yourself in for over a day. There's three less boat crews by the time you get to your IBS and put it over your head for the eight miles back to the compound. Bowel movements are becoming a serious concern at this point, and you've all been fighting them. There's no bathroom breaks in Seal Hell Week, so you and your buddies do your best to rush into the water to relieve yourselves. However, often accidents happen, and number twos just come while marching in the boat on the beach while you're sitting next to them, arms locked together, singing songs during the surf torture. What would have absolutely disgusted you a week ago is now nothing more than a minor annoyance, even when the contents of someone else's stomach end up on you. The human body can only function for so long without sleep, and when you refuse to let it get the rest it needs, the brain will snatch sleep when it can. You've fallen over at least five times while paddling your boat, going straight into the freezing cold ocean only to wake up with a start and drag yourself back up into the boat. It happens to everyone. Hallucinations are becoming much more frequent too. Most people hallucinate about food or warm fires. Others have full-blown mumbled conversations with themselves. A guy on your boat crew insists he sees a cartoon character rowing your boat with you. Everyone's brains are so starved for sleep that they're projecting dreams straight into reality. After evening chow, it's time for a special treat. The Navy wants to reward all your hard work with some rest and relaxation. So everyone strips completely naked and jumps into the outdoor pool for a game of water polo. It's the most vicious game of water polo you'll ever play in your life because the stakes are high. The winning team gets a brief rest while the losing team has to stand under the outdoor showers for five minutes with the cold water running. This is on top of the freezing cold wind that's picked up. The motivation is high to win, and the race to five points is brutal with injuries on all sides. Your team wins the first game but ends up losing the second, so it's off to the showers for you. There's no word to describe the cold you feel under the showers as a blustery wind blows onto you. Your teeth are chattering so hard by now that you're sure you need dental work after this week is over. Day 5 You have no idea what time it is, but you've entered into Day 5, your final day of Hell Week. At some point past midnight, not too long after your freezing stay in the showers, you all pile back into the pool after being ordered to bring only a single IBS with you. This is confusing, as there's still over 30 of you left, and you wonder what fresh hell the instructors have come up with. The game is simple. Everyone needs to get onto the IBS and remain atop it. Failure means doing it all over again. Those who get loaded on first have it worse. Sure, they get to rest briefly as the rest of the class climbs on, and you've learned to revel in seconds of rest, but as more and more people get onto the small boat, the more and more pressure that gets put on them. Eventually, the IBS begins to take on water, and while it won't sink, it'll go down a few inches into the water. This causes the people stuck at the bottom of the human pile to fight to keep their heads above water and breathe, which inevitably ends up with them kicking people off the IBS. In response, the instructors order you to do it all over again, and so it goes for at least two hours as you struggle to cram an entire class onto one boat and hold steady for at least a few seconds. To congratulate you in a job well done, the instructors reward you with a low crawl on the asphalt back to the beach and into the surf. The asphalt is torture to low crawl over, especially since you're back in your uniform which is crusted in sand and salt. The sand and salt tear at your skin as you drag yourself over the pavement a hundred meters before you hit the sand. The sand is easier, but it's much colder. Still, you prefer the sand over shredding your skin to ribbons on the hard pavement. Once at the surf, the 30 or so of you remaining lock arms and sit right where the waves break on the beach. They smash into you with tremendous force, and combined with the ever-blowing coastal wind, work to leach every ounce of heat from your bodies. You're on day 5 though, and you refuse to quit. Together you sing to keep spirits up, everything from old Baptist hymns to modern pop songs. The instructors meanwhile torture you psychologically by presenting you with steaming hot cups of coffee and warm jelly donuts. All you gotta do is quit, and a delicious donut and hot cup of joe and a warm blanket is waiting for you. But none of you do, at least not at first, because the instructors have saved the worst trick for last. Looking at your pathetic selves up and down, one of the instructors spits into the surf and declares you the worst motivated class he's ever personally seen. 
you're so poorly motivated that he's decided to enact a rare but special provision which allows an instructor to extend Hell Week by as much as two days. Your sorry asses have failed to impress him, and he's decided what you need is another two days of motivational training. Then he orders you all out of the surf and back onto your boats. The thought of putting that IBS back over your head is torture. The rubber boat rubs against your scalp with every single step and bump, rubbing it raw and even tearing your hair out. If you're in the back and put it onto one of your shoulders, it literally wears the skin off your bones. Then the salt and sand gets into it. It's absolute torture, but you sigh and begin to double time it straight to your boat. You didn't come this far to give up now, even though the news that you'll be doing another two days of this hits you like a sledgehammer, wrecking your morale. But when you get to your boat, one of your crew is missing. He's standing on the beach, tears streaming down his face. You know what this means, and you don't blame him. He can't bear the thought of another two days of this. And while some would call him weak for quitting now, the truth is he's proven he's a lot tougher than most people to make it this far. One less man means a lot more load for you to carry as the 300-pound IBS slams into the top of your head over and over again. You're at the front and too tired to lift it with your arms, so you let it rest on your skull. It's a good way to get a mild concussion, but at this point you're well past your physical limits and simply don't care. It's a race to the next evolution as usual, and against the odds and despite your missing crew member you manage to get there first this time. You collapse on the ground ready to soak up the few minutes of precious rest, but to your dismay the other teams were nearly as fast as you. You struggle back onto your feet, but your knees give out under you. One of your classmates grabs you and helps you up. That's probably the biggest part of Hell Week. Teamwork. Without it, none of you would make it. An instructor comes strutting up, and you can't imagine what fresh hell he's got in store for you. To your amazement, however, he says the sweetest words you've ever heard. Class, you are secured from Hell Week. There's no cheer. Everyone is too tired, and there's no celebration. Instead, you pick back up your IBS and lug it to the compound to stow it away. After this, you'll clean up a bit, get a medical inspection, and then be allowed to go home for the weekend. you still got weeks and weeks of brutal training ahead, but you've completed the single most challenging event of becoming a Navy SEAL and joining the ranks of the deadliest fighting force humanity has ever produced. How does a modern Navy lose a war against a country with no Navy? That's a question that Russian admirals will be asking for decades because despite having no surface combat ships, Ukraine is dismantling the Russian Black Sea Fleet. On October 29, 2022, a mini-drone swarm launched an attack on the Russian naval base at Sevastopol. Information about the attack is quite scarce, and as usual, Ukraine is remaining extremely tight-lipped about an attack that it obviously carried out itself. However, what's even stranger is just how tight-lipped the US is also remaining about the incident. When in the past, the US has publicly touted the effectiveness of weapons it sent to Ukraine. It's difficult to separate fact from fiction when trying to figure out exactly what happened. And with the US and Ukraine both keeping quiet, we have only the Russian Ministry of Defense to rely on for information. According to the Russian MOD, the explosions filmed at Sevastopol were the results of new naval variant of Russian cigarettes, similar to the same cigarettes responsible for the multiple explosions at the Crimean airbase of Saki, which definitely didn't destroy multiple aircraft and seriously damage many others. The naval cigarette variant responsible for the Sevastopol explosions was no doubt the same responsible for the sinking of the Moskva. This is what the West doesn't want you to know. NATO envies superior Russian cigarette technology. Fine, the real report from the Russian Ministry of Defense doesn't state that cigarettes caused the explosion filmed in the early hours of October 29th, but their explanation is just as ridiculous. According to Russian sources, an attack by seven unmanned submerged vehicles and an indeterminate number of airborne drones was successfully repelled, resulting in only light damage to one landing craft. However, despite Ukraine remaining silent on the operation, it was quick to bring the receipts, and we can verify from footage filmed by the drones themselves that at least three ships were struck in the attack, along with one crane. Piecing together the attack is going to be impossible until someone more credible than the Russian Ministry of Defense comes forward with details, but for now we can at least try to put together some of the clues and ultimately try to understand what happened. What we do know is that the attack did indeed take place via sea and air simultaneously, using drones. We have one video of air defenses sending missiles up to meet the airborne threat, and it appears as if the airborne attack was largely successfully repelled. Or at least we have no verification of strikes against Russian targets by airborne drones. But that doesn't mean that those attacks were unsuccessful. We also have verification of at least three Russian ships taking direct hits from suicide drones, including the famed Admiral Makarov. 
The Makarov is the only Grigorovich-class frigate currently in the area, and the ship's class has been confirmed by open-source intelligence. The minesweeper, the Ivan Gulebez, has been confirmed as a likely target, with the Russian Ministry of Defense admitting that at least the Gulebez had indeed suffered quote-unquote minor damage. This likely means that the ship has been sent straight to dry dock for very extensive repairs, if not sunk altogether. We can see from the footage that the ship took a suicide drone straight to the stern, which would have caused serious damage to its propulsion, though not necessarily sunk it. The Admiral Makarov, however, the new and possibly now former flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, seems to have taken a blow toward the rear of the ship, near where the launch cells for the caliber cruise missiles are located. With the Russian Black Sea Fleet using both submarines and surface ships to launch cruise missile attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure, this was likely the intended target, as the drones do not appear to have packed enough firepower to actually sink a large frigate. This likely has led to a mission kill for the Admiral Makarov, though given what we've learned of Russian engineering, the Makarov may have the not-so-rare privilege of becoming Russia's latest submarine, having been retired from surface combat by Ukraine. As details of the attack pour in, some conclusions become immediately obvious. First, this is an attack of historical significance, as it marks the rare occurrence of a superior navy being ambushed on its own port. The fact that Ukraine carried out this attack via drones makes this the first such attack in history and a turning point in naval warfare. Another conclusion is that Russia was perhaps unsurprisingly caught with its pants down for what must be the umpteenth time this war. We know this because the first recorded explosions from successful drone strikes occurred just after 4 a.m., but it's the location of the attack that is the most stunning of all. Volunteers using open source intelligence have confirmed that the sea portion of the attack took place inside of Sevastopol Bay, which is supposed to be protected against intrusion by enemy surface or submersible ships. Indeed, multiple Russian military bloggers have expressed outrage that the security netting meant to stop such an attack was either not in use or easily defeated by Ukraine's drones. It wasn't until the second wave of the attack that the Russian forces began to intercept the incoming drones using helicopters, smaller surface vessels, and even artillery. It appears that at least one drone in the second wave was in fact successfully intercepted, as the video of the attack cuts out just before the drone reaches its intended target. We can also see in this video how a Russian helicopter is desperately trying to blow the drone out of the water using its cannon. So, was this attack successful? And why couldn't Russia stop it? Even if no ship was sunk, it's clear that at least three ships suffered serious damage. It's likely that all three suffered what the US Navy calls mission kills, or damage sufficient enough to force a ship out of the fight, relegating it to dry dock for repairs that could take days to months to complete. Knocking two surface combat vessels out of the fight, which Russia is using to launch cruise missiles against Ukraine, is a major win for a smaller nation. But the real victory comes from the possibility of having caused damage to any of the ship's more sensitive high-tech systems. Under the most intense sanctions from the modern era, Russia is very poorly prepared to replace high-tech systems or even conduct repairs on them. It's rumored that part of the reason why the Moskva was apparently so easily sunk is that some of its air defense systems were not fully operational due to a shortage of parts. Victory also comes in the form of cost analysis. For the price of a few hundred thousand dollars, Ukraine has certainly managed to cause tens of millions of dollars worth of damage. That's the type of economic exchange between combatants that wins wars, and given the fact that the United States and other NATO partners have been supplying Ukraine with its naval drones since April, this almost certainly is not the last drone attack the Russian fleet is going to be going up against. So why was the attack so effective? It's popular to rag on the Russian military as being incompetent and ineffective, and that's partly because the Russian military has in fact proven to be incompetent and ineffective. It's better suited for causing civilian casualties in Grozny and Aleppo than waging a modern war against a Western-backed power. However, the fact of the matter is that even modern Western militaries might have found themselves very hard-pressed to defend themselves from a similar attack. It's unknown what aerial drones Ukraine used in the attack. But what we do know is that current air defenses in Ukraine are having trouble spotting Iranian-made suicide drones at long distances. That's because these drones are small and made of materials that don't give off strong radar returns, dramatically shortening the range at which they can be not just identified but targeted. While contacts can be identified at long range, getting a weapons quality track on a low observable craft typically only happens at very short distances. The partially submerged drones used in the sea attack are also very difficult to spot on radar. These craft sit partially submerged and under the water, presenting very little surface areas above the waves to bounce radar waves back with. 
This doesn't just complicate detection but targeting by long-range defenses. We have evidence of how difficult these drones were to target from the fact that the target ship in the daytime attack video was busying itself with evasive actions while destroying the drones was up to the circling helicopter above. The United States recognized the difficulty in defending large surface vessels from smaller attack boats back in the early 2000s when it launched a war game between friendly forces and those of an unnamed hostile nation completely believed to represent Iran. The commander in charge of this enemy nation knew that he couldn't stand up to the power of a US carrier strike group with his own surface combatants, so instead he chose to attack the mighty US carrier with a swarm of small, fast attack boats. The result was the sinking of the American carrier. The US Navy took the lesson to heart and immediately began to research ways of using existing SeaWiz systems to target small surface targets. However, the development of naval lasers is the US's response to the surface drone threat, but as it stands, even the mighty US Navy is incredibly vulnerable to the same type of attack that just rocked the Russian Black Sea Fleet to its core. Sirens scream as British sailors run across the aircraft carrier deck. Japanese kamikaze planes are inbound. Anti-aircraft guns fire into the sky. Planes are launched from the deck. Sailors dive for cover. An enemy plane goes down, then another, and another. The sky is filled with explosions. But out of the smoke comes a horrible sight. One of the kamikaze pilots has made it through. The plane dives. The bombs on the underside of the aircraft reflect the gleam of sunlight. The kamikaze plane slams into the aircraft carrier's deck. There's a huge explosion. Fire streams across the runway. Sailors sprint with hoses to put out flames. When they're under control, the mechanics and engineers look over the ship. It's relatively unscathed. With a few quick repairs, the carrier is once again ready for battle. Nothing is going to stop the British Pacific Fleet, not even Japan's most deadly kamikaze pilots. As World War II progressed and Allied forces started gaining ground in Europe, a decision was made to turn their attention to the threat in the Pacific. The Japanese were invading parts of mainland Asia and wreaking havoc on the United States' bases and fleets in the eastern part of the world. With Nazi Germany Germany slowly falling apart and Allied forces closing in on all sides, it was clear that more resources needed to be deployed to the Pacific to aid in the battle against the Japanese. The British had lost ships to the Japanese earlier in the war. Less than three days after Japan entered World War II in December of 1941, they destroyed several British ships in the Pacific. The Japanese aircraft sank the Prince of Wales and Repulse, two of the most powerful Royal Navy vessels. After the loss of the British ships and many sailors' lives, Japan attacked and captured naval bases in Hong Kong and Singapore basically driving any British presence out of the Pacific Ocean indefinitely. The British were too focused on fighting in Europe at the time to send supplies and ships back to the Pacific. But in August of 1943, at the Quadrant Conference of Allied Leaders in Quebec, the Allies agreed that more resources and ships should be sent to the Pacific. The Allied forces still maintained a Germany-first principle, thereby cutting off the head of the Axis powers. But Japan was posing a real threat to an Allied victory to end the war. The Pacific was of strategic importance for Allied forces for multiple reasons. One of which was the oil-rich areas of Sumatra. Then, in September of 1944, at the Second Quebec Conference, a finalized plan to launch the British Navy back into the waters of the Pacific was formed. Britain offered to send a fleet of ships, including at least four aircraft carriers, to the Pacific waters by the end of 1944. The stipulation was that the United States welcomed the help, but the British forces needed to be self-sufficient, as the U.S. was already struggling to maintain their footholds and supply chains in the Pacific as it was. Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser was appointed the commander of the newly designated British Pacific Fleet, and ships were sent to the Japanese-controlled waters. The British Pacific Fleet set up its main base of operations in Australia. It took a long time for the men, materials, and ships to travel the 12,000 miles from Britain to Australia, but the support that the British Pacific Fleet would provide was vital to defeating the Japanese and ending World War II. The fleet was already planning to sustain itself, since most British ships, weapons, and planes differed from what the Americans were using. The differences in the British Pacific Fleet was actually one of the things that made it so successful. The United States was struggling to defend their ships and bases against the kamikaze pilots in the Japanese Air Force. And although kamikaze planes posed a threat to the British ships, the way the vessels were designed allowed them to stand out better to kamikaze attacks compared to their American counterparts. Specifically, aircraft carriers in the British Pacific Fleet had armored decks, which greatly reduced the damage caused by kamikaze impacts. It wasn't long after the fleet had docked in Australia and made final preparations that they were called into action by Admiral Nimitz. Their mission was to attack and destroy key 
key Japanese-controlled oil refineries. This was an important objective, but more than anything else, Nimitz wanted to see what the new British Pacific Fleet was capable of. It did not disappoint. On January 24, 1945, the British Pacific Fleet attacked the refinery at Plagio. They destroyed it and moved on to the second target at Songi Gerong five days later. Using planes launched from aircraft carriers, the British Pacific Fleet was able to destroy both refineries with relative ease. This slowed the supply of oil being used to fuel the Japanese warships and aircraft. This first mission had not only dealt a blow to the Japanese Navy, but the rest of the Japanese war machine as well, including the ability to launch kamikaze attacks. It did not stop Japan entirely, but it was a start. Unfortunately, a delay between the two attacks allowed Japanese forces to organize a defense around the Siongi Gerong. On January 29th, enemy forces located the British Pacific Fleet and tried to stop them from destroying the second oil refinery. As the fleet approached their target, Japanese fighters took off from a nearby airbase. In response, combat air patrol fighters took off from the aircraft carriers in the British Pacific Fleet. They met the Japanese planes en route and destroyed all of them before they could cause any significant damage. Any kamikaze pilots that were planning to fly into the ships of the British Pacific Fleet were shot down before they could reach their target. However, 16 British planes were lost during the battle. The pilots gave their lives to protect the fleet so it could carry out its mission of destroying one of the major oil supplies fueling the Japanese forces. After the completion of their mission, the British Pacific Fleet returned to Sydney. Luckily, the maintenance carrier Unicorn had just arrived with replacement aircraft. The lost planes were replenished, and the fleet was ready for its next mission. The success of the British Pacific Fleet's first assignment caused Admiral Nimitz to insist that the fleet be used as a flexible reserve for vital missions occurring across the Pacific. The next mission was Operation Iceberg, also known as the Battle of Okinawa. The fleet was tasked with intercepting any aircraft, including kamikazes trying to reach Okinawa. To do this, the British Pacific Fleet launched attacks on airfields on the Sakishima Islands. On the day of the landing on Okinawa by Allied forces, the British Pacific Fleet was on guard to stop any Japanese planes trying to leave their sector. The Japanese launched a series of attacks on the ships patrolling the waters, but planes from the aircraft carriers intercepted them. Intense dogfighting occurred over the open ocean. Then, out of the thick of the battle came a kamikaze plane. It broke the line of defenses and crashed directly into the indefatigable. This was the first British aircraft carrier to be struck by a kamikaze plane. Kamikaze attacks normally had devastating consequences, but after only a few hours of repairs, the indefatigable was able to launch and land aircraft once again. This would not be the last time a vessel of the British Pacific Fleet was struck by a kamikaze. During the battles to maintain control over the waters and airspace around the British Pacific Fleet, every single one of the aircraft carriers would be hit by kamikazes, yet none of the impacts would cause critical damage. What made the British Pacific Fleet so resistant to kamikaze attacks? A lot of it had to do with the pilots and planes stationed on the aircraft carriers. They would take out enemy planes before they could reach the fleet. The expert pilots maneuvered their planes into attack positions and put themselves between kamikaze pilots and the fleet. But kamikazes did get through, and they did strike the British ships. However, the British vessels had armored decks that helped them prevent damage by kamikaze attacks that would otherwise have incapacitated them. The reinforced decks allowed the aircraft carriers to sustain damage from kamikaze impacts and still remain in action. For example, the collision on the deck of the indefatigable could have caused a massive hole in a non-armored ship deck, but instead the indefatigable Fatigable deck only dented about three inches. There was a large fire, but the crew quickly got it under control and immediately started repairing the ship, so it would be combat ready in just a matter of hours. The amount of damage the British Pacific Fleet could sustain impressed the United States. About a week after the Indefatigable shrugged off the kamikaze attack, the U.S. aircraft carrier called the Hancock was struck by a Japanese plane. The Hancock was so badly damaged it had to return to the United States for repairs. The United States had so much faith in the British Pacific Fleet and its armored aircraft carriers that they were sent to strike vitally important airfields on the island of Formosa. The thought was that since the British ships were holding up so well against Japanese forces and their kamikaze pilots, that they would be less vulnerable to counterattacks. The operation to destroy Japanese targets on Formosa was a huge success. The British Pacific Fleet wiped out planes, airfields, and railways. After Formosa, the fleet resupplied and headed back to battle. The British Pacific Fleet engaged Japanese forces once again and this time ran into some trouble. A kamikaze made it through the fleet's defenses and slammed into an aircraft carrier called the formidable. Just before the kamikaze hit, it released a 500-pound bomb onto the deck. It was enough to put a two-foot hole in the flight deck of the carrier. However, later that day, the crew was able to plug the hole and resumed flights from the carrier. Once again, the British Pacific Fleet seemed to be resistant to Japan's most deadly tactics. Later in the mission, a group of four kamikazes made it through the fleet's defenses and struck the HMS Victorious. The first kamikaze smashed into the flight deck and knocked out the carrier's catapult. The second committed to a dive, but Captain Michael Denny quickly ordered evasive actions 
turbulence causing the plane to hit the aft deck and bounce off into the ocean. The third kamikaze was taken out by an anti-aircraft gun before it could reach the ship. The last kamikaze hit its target. The plane caused the most damage. When it crashed into the Formidable, it took out 18 aircraft that were parked on the aft deck, destroying them. Even with four kamikazes making it through to the Formidable, the ship sustained only minor damage, another testament to the kamikaze resistance of the British Pacific Fleet. During Operation Iceberg, the fleet spent 62 days at sea, launched planes 5,335 times to defend the Pacific Fleet, dropped 1,000 tons of bombs, and shot 500,000 rounds of ammunition. The British Pacific Fleet destroyed 42 enemy aircraft in the air and more than 100 on the ground. This prevented Japanese planes and kamikaze missions from reaching the United States forces at Okinawa. The British Pacific Fleet had already accomplished so much and resisted numerous kamikaze attacks, but they were not done yet. The squadron was split up and the carriers were destined to be a vital part of Operation Olympic, which was the first phase of the invasion of Japan. The special task force of the British Pacific Fleet ships dropped hundreds of tons of bombs. The planes from the carriers flew 416 defensive missions to protect both the British and US forces. The ships had to sail through rough water and even typhoons, but continued their support of the Allied forces so they could take the mainland of Japan. The British Pacific Fleet destroyed countless enemy planes, ships, and bases up until the Japanese surrendered on September 2, 1945. Without the support of the British Pacific Fleet, the war in the Pacific may have lasted much longer. The British ships were especially effective at resisting kamikaze planes, one of Japan's most deadly tactics. It was due to the extra armor on the ship's decks and the expertise of the pilots that launched from the aircraft carriers of the British Pacific Fleet that allowed them to fend off the kamikaze attacks and complete their missions. This video is sponsored by Conflict of Nations, the free online strategy game where you get to find out what it's like to take control of a real country and lead it in modern global warfare. The Cold War is turning hot. In this all-new scenario set in the 1980s, you'll choose a real country to lead and take on up to 128 other players in real-time games that can take weeks to complete. Which strategy will you use, diplomacy or all-out nuclear war? Simply click the link in the description to try the new Cold War map to find out. It's fully cross-platform, so you can play on the same account on PC and mobile. And the infographic show viewers also get a special gift of 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free when they use the link. It's only available for 30 days, so click the link, choose a country, and start fighting your way to victory right now. Three B-52s scream across the sky on a bombing mission to take out the North Vietnamese Army, or NVA, targets. For added protection from the NVA's electronically guided surface-to-air missiles SAMs, the bombers are escorted by two Douglas EB-66s, call out signs BAT-21 and BAT-22. One of the main duties of the EB-66s is to sweep for enemy radar and jam it. On BAT-21 is a crew of six, a pilot, a navigator, and four electronic warfare officers EWOs. Unusually, the navigator on this mission is a senior senior officer, 53-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Iseel Hamilton. Generally, he's responsible for scheduling navigators, but they were short-handed, so he took position of navigator for this flight. The NVA fires several missiles, and the B-52s, as well as the EB-66s, perform evasive maneuvers. On BAT-21, one of the EWOs calls out a warning as a SAM heads toward them. The pilot assumes the missile is going to go left and initiates a right turn for a SAM break, an evasive violent flying maneuver that can cause a homing missile to exceed its gimbal limits and destroy itself as it tries to follow the rotations of its target, but the missile flies right, so the plane turns straight into it. The crew yells at the pilot to go left, and he tries to reverse his turn, but it's too late. The missile explodes into a massive fireball as it collides with the belly of BAT-21. The pilot makes a hand signal to eject, having practiced it countless times before. Hamilton automatically fumbles for the firing mechanism on his ejection seat. As the compressed air cylinder under his seat fires and rockets him away from the falling aircraft, a second missile hits. Suddenly, Hamilton is 30,000 feet above Vietnam. He's spinning. Something's gone wrong during ejection. Worried that he's going to black out, he pulls his manual ripcord. His upper body snaps back as his parachute billows open and slows his fall. Hamilton looks around. There should be other parachutes in the sky, but there are none. His eyes sting. He's the only survivor. As he drifts lower, Hamilton realizes he's near a forward air control FAC-02 observation plane. He takes out his survival radio and tries calling using the call sign BAT-21. The pilot, First Lieutenant Bill Jankowski, confirms visual sight. He thinks about trying to snag Hamilton out of the air, but his co-pilot dismisses the idea as impractical. Hamilton hits the ground hard. He quickly disentangles himself from his parachute and looks around. He's in the middle of a dry rice paddy. 
he can hear the thump of mortars being fired nearby. Not good. He darts into a nearby shallow ditch. Hamilton's bruised his back and there's a gash on his finger, but generally he's okay. The O2 circles overhead and notes Hamilton's position. He's landed in a bad spot, about a mile east of the village of Camelot, near a huge buildup of NVA troops. Jankowski gets on the emergency frequency and calls for any support available to help with the search and rescue or SAR mission. Two Jolly Greens, aka rescue helicopters, a few Cobra attack helicopters, and a couple of other aircrafts respond. But as they approach the area where Hamilton is, they take on heavy fire. A Cobra is shot down behind enemy lines. One crew member escapes the exploding helicopter and is taken prisoner. The rest of the crew is lost. Due to how hot the area is and the growing poor visibility, the rescue is called off. The Joint Search and Rescue Command, Jay Sark, orders 24-hour FAC coverage over Hamilton's position to watch over him. As they order the 7th Air Force to establish a standard 27 kilometers no-fire zone around Hamilton, basically without approval from the JSARC, no friendly artillery, naval gunfire, or aircraft engagement can take place in the zone. The FAC arranges for Hamilton's position to be ringed with CDU-14 gravel, so he'll be hard to access. Those anti-personnel mines are about the size of a lemon. They explode when stepped on. When it gets dark, Hamilton finds a wooded area. Sitting under a tree, he inventories his gear. Among his supplies are a first aid kit, survival radio with extra batteries, flares, a loaded 38 revolver, a hunting knife, a signal mirror, and a mini compass. Hamilton digs a hole big enough to lay in, then he creeps around the area and does some reconnaissance. He reports to FAC on enemy vehicles and troops for several hours. Finally, he creeps back to his hole, covers himself with foliage, and sleeps. April 3rd. A SAR mission consisting of Jolly Greens and Douglas A1 Sky Raiders, aka Sandys, attempt a first light rescue, hoping to extract Hamilton with minimal force. Unfortunately, the weather's overcast, making it hard for the FAC to have visual control of positions and strikes. To make matters worse, most of the flight crews receive a briefing that doesn't tell them the extent of the battle developing near Hamilton. Also, the NVA has a listening post in the area, where they monitor and jam US radio traffic. Once the aircraft flies through the bank of clouds, all hell breaks loose. The rescue mission comes under heavy fire. One of the Jolly Greens is seriously damaged and has to make an emergency landing at Fubai Airfield, which is actually also under attack at this moment and doesn't want them to land. They land anyway and avoid crashing by the skin of their teeth. The rescue mission holds, but the Sandys continue to drop ordnance to soften up the area. They also pinpoint targets to take out to support the SAR effort. A few hours later, a second rescue attempt is made, but they also come under heavy fire. A second helicopter is forced to make an emergency landing at Fubai Airfield. Further SAR missions are aborted. The area around Hamilton is just too hot. Meanwhile, on the ground, Hamilton reports on NVA positions when he can, but mainly stays hunkered down in his hole to avoid the troops searching for him. April 4th. Incredibly hungry and thirsty, at dawn, Hamilton goes foraging. He finds some berries and unripe pineapple. Carefully studying the ground to avoid mines, he sneaks close to a village and steals a few ears of corn from the fields. Jay Sark is briefed with some bad news. From listening to chatter on North Vietnamese radio broadcasts, the Air Force has learned that the NVA knows who Hamilton is. Not only do they want to stop its reconnaissance, but capturing such a high-ranking officer who's a ballistic missile expert with a top-secret clearance would be a strategic feather in their cap. Hamilton needs to be rescued ASAP. The day is overcast. Hamilton creeps to his observation spot to see how much damage the bombardment has done. A little Vietnamese boy playing in the woods with his dog spots him. The kid heads back to his village, carefully following the dog to avoid the mines. Hamilton watches as the kid tells some soldiers and points in his direction. Soldiers come to investigate, but they have to make their way through a minefield to reach Hamilton's area. As it's midday, there's no way he can get back to his hole without being seen. Hamilton radios FAC, who quickly agrees to create a diversion. They fly an O2 overhead and drop two white phosphorus marking rockets, engulfing the soldiers in a cloud of choking white smoke. The soldiers panic, turn, and race back toward the village. A few of them step on mines and don't make it. Taking advantage of the diversion, Hamilton crouches low, races back to his hole, and frantically covers himself with leaves. He lay there panting until he falls asleep. Hamilton wakes thirsty and disoriented after his nap. It's afternoon. Visibility has improved. A SAR mission with Jolly Greens and Sandys once again has to turn back because of heavy artillery. F-4s, Sandys, and some other aircrafts continue their bombardment of various targets. Targets. Unfortunately, some of them end up severely damaged due to intense anti-aircraft gunfire. One of the FAC observation planes, call sign Nail 38, is shot down by a missile, and its pilots, Captain William J. Henderson and First Lieutenant Mark Clark, have to eject. Henderson lands very close to Hamilton, about 500 meters away. He hides in a bamboo patch, but that evening, NVA soldiers come to dig a pit for an anti-aircraft artillery gun in a nearby field. Henderson's forced to surrender when they begin cutting the bamboo down. He becomes a POW. Clark parachutes to the ground safely, manages to elude capture and hides out. He's further away, on the other side of the Mew Gang River, but within two kilometers of Hamilton. Now there are two soldiers who need rescuing. April 5th. The weather is
is rainy. Hamilton catches some water and thirstily drinks it. He also saves water in a small jug. The Air Force performs some strikes and blows up several tanks and a few other targets a few miles from Hamilton. It's mostly quiet. The poor weather causes the SAR Force to regroup and strategize. They spend much of the day repairing their aircraft. April 6th. The sun shines with minimal scattered clouds, great visibility. In the morning, the SAR Task Force waits on the ground while several F-4s and B-5s, with permission to fight in the rescue zone, destroy several previously identified targets. Both Hamilton and Clark see some of the action from their respective hiding places. In fact, the action gets so close to Clark that he radios FAC and asks them to back off a little. The Vietnamese Air Force VNAF, also launches several devastating strikes just outside of the no-fire zone. In the afternoon, a SAR force of two Jolly Greens and four Sandys takes to the sky. The Sandys drop ordnance, again softening up the area for a rescue attempt. One of the Sandys is rigged to drop a survival resupply kit for Hamilton, but the arming device fails and the pilot doesn't realize that the kit didn't deploy until after he landed. As the SAR force flies toward Hamilton, he gets out a flare, poised to dash to the clearing. One of the helicopters suddenly breaks into an evasive maneuver, but it's too late. A strike hits the fuel line of the Jolly Green 76 and it explodes into a massive fireball. Both Hamilton and Clark witness the destruction. The six men aboard are lost. The survivors feel guilty that the men were lost trying to save them. The Air Force is able to pinpoint where the deadly ground fire is coming from. It's a nearby village. The Air Force and the VNAF bombard the area, taking out the artillery in the village and several other targets. April 7th. While directing naval gunfire from the destroyer USS Buchanan against NVA tanks, a USAF plane call sign Covey 282 is shot down by a SAM just a few miles from Hamilton. The two crew members survive the crash, but flyover attempts to pinpoint the survivors' locations are bombarded with SAM strikes. As a result, rescue attempts have to be halted. Sadly, neither survivor is ever seen again. This is the final straw, and General Crichton Adams, commander of military operations in Vietnam, declares that no further helicopters are to be used for SAR missions to pick up Hamilton and Clark. Lieutenant Colonel Andy Anderson, commander of the Joint Personnel Recovery Center in Saigon, begins working on plans for a rescue by ground. If Hamilton can get to the river some two miles south of him and float down it a couple miles, they can get a team to rescue him. Clark would need to do the same, but as he's nearer to the river, his journey should be quicker. Anderson has a team of Vietnamese commandos that he's been working with that he can assign to the mission, but he needs an American to go along as an advisor. Navy SEAL officer Tom Norris has recently finished an assignment as part of a team training Force Recon Marines to run covert special operations. He's quickly dispatched to lead the rescue operation. Anderson briefs the commanding ARVN Brigadier General Vu Van Gyai on the rescue mission. In the last few days, the ground war has really ramped up and Gyai has his hands full, battling NVA troops. He thinks the mission is insane and tells Anderson that he cannot guarantee the operation's safety, especially when they cross the Mu Gyang River. However, Gyai agrees to provide them transportation to his most forward unit. This is a Ranger platoon of about 20 men and three M48 tanks at a forward operating base along Highway QL9 within observation range of the strategic Camlo Bridge. During the evening, Hamilton is notified that he'll no longer have a babysitter. FAC patrols are scaled back due to how hot the region is. Sometime later, Hamilton hears the roar of B-52s. He hunkers down as they heavily bomb near his area. For the first time, he wonders if he's being left behind by the war. In reality, the B-52 raid was carefully planned around where Hamilton was hiding. They hit several big gun emplacements, destroy a SAM site, and some ammo dumps. April 8th, to the 13th. It's known that English-speaking NVA are monitoring radio communications, so coded instructions for the survivors are prepared. In fact, SAR contacts the commanders of the survivors' parent units and asks them to create a message based on each survivor's background that would clearly tell him to move to a specific location in a way only they would understand. They discover that Hamilton's an avid golfer with a photo-like memory of golf courses. FAC radios Hamilton and tells him, you're gonna play 18 holes, and you're gonna get in the Suwanee and make like Esther Williams and Charlie the Tuna. The round starts on number one at Tucson National. Hamilton is puzzled. They have to repeat the message a few times. It takes him about 30 minutes to break the code. The Suwanee is a river made famous by a song. Esther Williams is a competitive swimmer, and Charlie the Tuna is the cartoon mascot for sun-kissed brand canned tuna. The number one hole at Tucson National is 408 yards running southeast. So the code meant that they're going to guide him to the Mugang River using the courses of 18 specific golf holes. At the river, he would need to swim. His first task is to move southeast 400 yards yards. The other survivor, Clark, also receives a similar type-coded message. Hamilton quickly discards some items since he needs to travel lightly. He takes his knife, revolver, first aid kit, radio, and boots. Everything he leaves behind, he buries, attempting to wipe away all traces that he'd been there. Hamilton checks his compass and makes his way through the foliage, trying to move quickly without making too much noise. Hundreds of yards away, he can see soldiers gearing up for another minesweep. He finds his way to a path and counts off the approximate number of yards. The first hole is right where there's a fork in the path. Hamilton rests in a clump of brush 
crush at the intersection and clicks on his radio. FAC tells him that his next play is hole number 5 at Davis Montham Air Force Base. The first four holes go well. Hamilton has a terrible fright when he stumbles over something in the dark that turns out to be a dead pig. The fourth hole takes him near an abandoned village that concealed the artillery guns that shot down Jolly Green 76. Around dawn, Hamilton hides under a pile of hay in the outskirts of the village to rest and wait for darkness. He falls asleep and wakes in the afternoon. During the fifth hole, Hamilton passes by a seemingly abandoned small hut. A scrawny chicken scratches in the doorway. Meat. Hamilton gets out his knife and pounces at the bird. A man collides with Hamilton and they wrestle on the ground. The man stabs Hamilton in the shoulder, but he fights back and shoves his knife into the man's chest. Hamilton backs away in horror from the crumpled bloody figure on the ground and runs. He hides under a pig trough. Hours later, when he's calmer and it's become apparent that no one is searching for him, Hamilton crawls out. He unzips his flight suit to check on the wound on his shoulder. Thankfully, it's not too bad. He uses his first aid kit to dress it. He's exhausted, but ready to go when it's time to check in with FAC. The SAR task force receives photos from a reconnaissance drone that flew over the area where Hamilton originally hid. Several armored personnel carriers are in the photo. The NVA made it through the minefield, searched for Hamilton and found him missing, so they've brought in additional troops for an extensive search. The US command in Saigon orders special high-altitude B-52 bombing raids on nearby targets to divert the NVA from searching for the two survivors. Clark makes it to the Miugang River and floats downstream. Norris and his team of commandos take a dangerous journey skirting several NVA patrols to intercept him. Thankfully, they're able to rescue Clark on the night of April 10th and deliver him to Anderson at the forward operating base. Clark is transported to the last outpost on the Qua Viet River at Dong Ha by an ARVN M113 armored personnel carrier, and then flown to Da Nang. Meanwhile, Hamilton completes a few more holes, then gets a little lost. He falls off a cliff and breaks his arm. Finally, he makes it to the river and, per FAC instructions, floats downstream. It's mainly willpower keeping Hamilton moving at this point. He's cold, wet, stressed, and has gone over a week with minimal food and water. Finally, he reaches his destination spot. He crawls out of the water and hides in the undergrowth near the shore. Later, Hamilton wakes up stiff and sore. He hears splashing and realizes that someone is paddling. Several soldiers are coming down the river in a sampan, guns in their laps, shining flashlights on the shore. Hamilton's heart beats frantically. It's a long moment before the soldiers move on. Anderson calls in airstrikes in an attempt to soften the area, but the NVA fights back with mortar rounds and B-40 rockets. Some rockets strike the team's position. One commando is killed. Anderson, Lieutenant To Ngak Vu, the senior Vietnamese commando, and all of the Vietnamese officers are hurt. Anderson and the wounded Vietnamese troops have to be evacuated. Navy SEAL Norris is left with five Vietnamese commandos with limited English-speaking skills. After dark, Norris and his team set out, but the NVA attacks again. Two of the five remaining ARVN commandos are killed. Norris and the team regroup. They'll try again next night. Meanwhile, Hamilton is fading fast. He's erratic and not checking in on the radio. The next night, Norris and his team head upriver more than four kilometers, evading several NVA patrols. Upon seeing the extremely large number of North Vietnamese forces, two of the commandos balk, saying they refuse to follow an American just to rescue an American. Norris manages to convince them to stay by saying the only way they'd get back to safety is to stay with the team. Unfortunately, they don't find Hamilton, and after a few more hours of searching, return to the forward operating base. The next day, FAC pinpoints Hamilton's new position for Norris. He's moved 50 meters overnight. A Sandy drops a survival pack containing food, water, ammunition, and extra radios to Hamilton, but it lands 50 meters away on a hill. Unfortunately, due to rough terrain and exhaustion, Hamilton can't retrieve it. FAC and two Sandy pilots flying over are shocked to see Hamilton coming out of his hiding place and standing in the open on a sandbar, waving a white handkerchief at them. FAC convinces or orders him to go back into hiding and wait a little longer. Hamilton's mental and physical health are giving out. That evening, Norris realizes he can't force the commandos to go on the mission, so he asks for volunteers. Petty Officer 3rd Class Win Van Kiet steps forward. The two-man team sets out. While walking upstream, they come upon an empty, destroyed village and find an abandoned sampan and some clothing. The two disguise themselves as Vietnamese fishermen and quietly paddle up the river. It's a dangerous journey. It's pitch dark and eerie, dense fog hangs low. Several times they pass NVA troops and tanks on the shoreline. When they break through the fog, they find themselves under the Canlo Bridge. They've overshot Hamilton's last known position by half an hour. They quickly turn around and paddle back. Norris and Kiet find Hamilton lying in some bushes on the shore. He's weak and delirious. It's close to sunrise and Norris thinks about hunkering down and waiting for night, but Hamilton needs medical attention ASAP. It takes both Norris and Kiet to get Hamilton onto the bottom of the boat. They cover him with bamboo before paddling down the river. Soon, they're spotted by an NVA patrol. Some soldiers fire, but the rescue team furiously paddles away, using the current to their advantage. Unfortunately, their luck soon run out. As they round a bend in the river, NVA soldiers fire a heavy caliber machine gun from the north shore. The commandos pull the sampan over to the opposite bank and turn it over for 
cover. They call for air help. Five A-4 Skyhawks from the carrier Hankook immediately answer. The fighters drop ordnance and completely obliterate the NVA on the opposite bank. Two Sandys also assist, dropping both explosives and MK-47 smoke bombs to provide a smoke screen. Norris and Kiet move Hamilton back to the sampan and quickly paddle. As they get closer to the outpost, they receive support from South Vietnamese forces. When they land on the bank, they are met by some ARVN soldiers. Hamilton is unable to walk, so Vietnamese commandos carry him into the bunker. Once inside, they lay Hamilton on a stretcher and give him first aid. Norris radios for an M113 armored personnel carrier to carry him, Hamilton, and Kiet to brigade headquarters in Dong Ha. While waiting for the carrier to arrive, Hamilton smokes a cigarette given to him by a Vietnamese soldier. When the three arrive at Dong Ha, a reporter comments to Norris, it must have been tough out there, I bet you wouldn't do that again. Norris stares him down and replies, an American was down in enemy territory, of course I'd do it again. Hamilton is transported to a hospital where he recuperates for a month. During his 13-day ordeal, he lost 45 pounds. As a direct result of attempts to rescue Hamilton, five aircraft were lost and several more were severely damaged. Eleven people were killed and two were captured. Ultimately, the operation changed how the military approaches high-risk rescues. For his heroic efforts and putting his personal safety at risk to report on targets while in hiding, Hamilton is awarded the Silver Star, Distinguished Flying Cross, Air Medal, the Meritorious Service Medal, and a Purple Heart. Lieutenant Thomas R. Norris receives the Medal of Honor, and Petty Officer 3rd Class Wynne Van Kiet receives the Navy Cross, the highest award that the Navy can give to a foreign national. Thanks again to our sponsor Conflict of Nations, the free online PvP strategy game with a new historically accurate Cold War scenario. Don't forget, the exclusive gift of 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription is only available for 30 days, so click the link in the description, choose your country, and fight your way to victory. Picture this, a 6'2 Navy SEAL who's just reveling in his victory, receiving the certification to officially be able to call himself one. He's been through hell and back to earn this. He's convinced that what he's endured as a SEAL has prepared him with the ultimate mindset to conquer anything. He sweat and ran and jumped and traversed through water only on four hours of sleep at times. And then, in the blink of an eye, he's in a battle surrounded by mean and scary-looking Spartan soldiers. The men are kind of similar, yet very different, than his SEAL comrades he got so close to during training. After all, his superiors drilled it into their heads that this brotherhood was essential to winning. But now, he's alone and forced to confront a battle that he's never seen the likes of before. Could he do it? We'll take a closer look at his odds and more in this episode of the Infographics Show, a Navy SEAL versus the 300 Spartans from the Battle of Thermopylae. The tension that caused the Battle of Thermopylae all started with Darius I, the king of Persia who ruled from 522 to 486. He sent heralds or announcers to Greek cities in 491 BCE to convince them to yield to Persian rule. His predecessor Xerxes followed suit, invading Greece but not Athens or Sparta. Sparta, both of which formed a resistance. To help dissect what the odds are, let's backtrack and do a deep dive into what Navy SEAL training is like to see how he'd fare in the scenario he's just been dropped in. Even before starting the BUDS training or basic underwater demolition SEAL training, he had to endure the Naval Special Warfare Prep in Great Lakes, Illinois for two months of physical and mental preparation. Rewinding to even before then, he took the ASVAB, which stands for the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Test. This tested skills like mathematical reasoning, word knowledge, and paragraph comprehension, all of which seemed pretty useless when Spartans are coming at him with spears and swords. The Computerized Special Operations Resilience Test, or CSORT, was completely like the ASVAB, but at least a bit more useful. This test was designed to determine his mental toughness, something that a paper study guide couldn't possibly help him with. The CSORT was designed to see how he'd hold up in stressful situations and if he could employ different tactics to get through them, like self-talk and breathing. He passed that, and he'll certainly need that resilience now. The CSORT also aimed to vet our personality traits and see who was the fittest. While his SEAL Brotherhood was made up of different types of personalities, there are certainly personality traits that give candidates like him an edge over the others, the most important of which was resilience. It didn't stop there. Of course, he wanted to master the Navy SEAL training, but he had to prove that he could do the 500-yard swim in 12 minutes and 30 seconds, 42 push-ups in 50 seconds, 52 sit-ups in 2 minutes, curl-ups, and 1.5-mile run in 9 minutes and 30 seconds. The surf passage test he went through during BUDS is etched into his memory, too. He distinctly remembers the clothes that clung to his tired body as he held heavy paddle inflatable boats through the waves at the Silver Strand Beach in San Diego. So if this battle's got any serious water to trek through, he can do that. 
BUDS is the main part of SEAL training, and it was held at Naval Special Warfare Training Center in Coronado, California, and was the next step. For six months, he and other almost SEALs crawled through the mud, tied nearly impossible knots underwater, and were on the brink of hypothermia. This was all designed to break him down mentally, but he did something right. Hell Week, the aptly named part of BUDS, began two weeks in, on day 15 of overall training. Hell Week meant swimming miles upon miles through unholy cold waters and then toiling through sand and mud in heavy gear. On top of all that, Hell Week was made even more fun because he was running on just four hours of sleep throughout the ordeal. One ex-seal, a guy named Marcus Luttrell, said this about Hell Week in his book Lone Survivor. Guys collapsed onto the sand, others just stood there, too many of them wondering how they could possibly go on. And he went on to include himself in this account of his suffering, writing, including me, knees were buckling, joints throbbing, I don't think anyone could stand up without hurting. Because he survived Hell Week, he was one of the lucky ones who continued on to train in diving and land warfare, learn to become a sniper who could leap out of planes and navigate the depths of the ocean. Sniper school lasted three months and was made of 12-hour days without any off days. Training was broken up into three parts. The first month was focused on technology, digital photography, and satellite communications. The second focused on mastering camouflage and stealthily navigating through prospective enemy turf. The last leg was focused on sharpening his focus and perfecting marksmanship methods. Methods. But he was one of the few who made it through Hell Week and Buds, generally because about 70% of their peers just straight up quit. Ringing that bell signifies utter defeat. Okay, so it's pretty clear being a Navy SEAL gives him an edge over the average Joe on the street. But these are the Spartan 300 we're talking about here. It's looking like less of a battle and more like a heavy defeat. And here's why. Well, for one, it's him against an army of 7,000 Greek soldiers, 300 of which are Spartans. And these men have primed since they were 7 years old. Yeah, that's right. When he was still in first grade coloring and really nailing down this whole breeding thing, Spartan boys were sent off to enter a weird sounding thing called an agoga, where these tinies were subjected to awful circumstances. Think of the way training tried to break him down mentally but happening as a wee type. To help picture what the agoga was like, it was a state-sponsored training program to turn kids into soldiers from this very early age. They were housed in a barracks with all the other would-bes and were immersed in academics, warfare, and sports. At 12 was when the torture started though. Initiates, as they were called at that age and state of the agoga, were stripped of all clothes except for a red cloak. They were also made to sleep outside on a bed that they made for themselves from reeds. If that wasn't enough to make our seal shake in his boots, they gave these kids a limited amount of food and were violently punished when things went wrong. After 14 years of being subjected to this, they were signed on to serve a term that lasted 40 years. But all of this training and these brutal conditions made them unstoppable. In the 8th century BC, Sparta conquered Laconia and Messenia. The captives from these two cities were made slaves for the Spartans. At their beck and call for farming, nursing and domestic servitude in Spartan homes and military attendants. The Spartans continued this streak by being victorious and capturing neighboring city-states, garnering more slaves. And they weren't too different from the brotherhood we mentioned earlier that he formed with our SEAL's own platoon. They stood together to not let anything stand in their way of fighting for their country. So what about the weapons he'll be faced with during this battle? He can expect to see an intense spear called a dory. The dory was typically gripped with one hand, either over or under, and the other hand was freed up to be used to hold a shield. Spartans would grip the spear with leather to further solidify their grip on it. The end of the dory was made of bronze or iron welded to be in the shape of a leaf, and its shaft was made of cornel wood, a wood so dense that it sank in water. The end of the dory had a sauroter, a spike that helped the spear stay upright when propped up, or was the alternate end they used when the spearhead broke off for whatever reason. Spartan hoplites also used a shipos, a short sword that was considered their secondary weapon. Its iron blade was typically 12 to 18 inches. The shipos was advantageous to the Spartans because it could be easily thrust through their opponent's shields and armors. The typical spots being aimed at during battle with the shifos was the groin and the throat. The copis, a thick curved iron sword, was another option as a secondary weapon. Although typically used as an axe rather than a sword, its victims suffered from messier wounds as opposed to the cleaner hole made by the weapons we've already gone over. Finally, we can't discuss Spartan weapons without mentioning the shield, which of course could be turned upwards when used during defense, but its multiple other uses include stunning the opponent and knocking them down. Because it was so heavy at 30 pounds, it was used to just club the opponent and they'd be hurt just by the blunt force of the trauma. So while we wanted him to survive this battle, it looks like our SEAL's chances to win are just too slim this time, and he might just kick the bucket. 
In times of crisis, the commander-in-chief mm. has the entire United States oh. military at their disposal. When it comes to dangerous and sensitive missions, there are certain elite soldiers who can get the job done. The elite soldiers we're talking about are the Navy SEALs and the Green Berets. Each is a special forces branch of the military. Let's take a look at the similarities and differences between these two military powerhouses. The name Navy SEAL tells us two things. The first is that this is the special forces branch of the Navy and that they conduct missions on sea, air, and land. This is what the acronym SEAL stands for. These elite soldiers are used in direct raids, reconnaissance missions, and action against terrorist forces. The Navy SEALs can trace their heritage back to World War II. During the war, elite naval soldiers were assigned to naval combat demolition units and underwater demolition teams. The missions they carried out were to disarm mines and recover sunken objects. These dangerous missions required the best soldiers the Navy had to offer. They were nicknamed Frogmen after their green suits and amphibious nature. These Frogmen eventually evolved into what's known today as the Navy SEALs. Due to Cold War tensions in 1961, President John F. Kennedy called for an increase in special forces. The following year, the U.S. Navy created the first two SEAL teams. The soldiers were recruited straight from the underwater demolition units. Navy SEALs continue to carry out important and top priority missions to this day. Green Berets are the special forces unit of the United States Army. Green Berets specialize in counterinsurgency. Like the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets can trace their history back to World War II as well. However, the name Green Beret did not come into use until the 1950s. The idea behind creating Green Beret squads was to create small tactical teams that could sabotage enemy communications and supply lines. The first actual special forces unit in the U.S. was formed in 1952 under the U.S. Army Psychological Warfare Division. Two years later, the Army Special Forces soldiers incorporated their iconic Green Berets into their uniforms to distinguish themselves from other branches of the military. In 1962, the Army Special Forces gained official and exclusive rights to the Berets, thus immortalizing the name Green Berets in history. Navy SEALs and Green Berets both have their own requirements for candidacy. In order to become a Navy SEAL, you must have at least 2040 vision in your best eye and 2070 in your worst eye with no color blindness. This means that some people are disqualified just on eyesight alone. You must have a minimum Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Score of 220 and to be 28 years old or younger. The final requirement is that you need to be a U.S. citizen and eligible for security clearance. You must meet all these requirements before yes. you will even be considered for the training regiment. In order to be considered for the Green Berets, an applicant must be a U.S. citizen and between 20 to 32 years of age by the day they're sent to Infantry uh -huh. One Station Unit training. You must also be an active duty member of the Army or National Guard and qualify for airborne training. To meet strength and endurance requirements for the Green Berets, an applicant must complete a minimum of 40 59 push-ups, 59 sit-ups, run 2 miles in under 15 minutes and 12 seconds, and do 6 pull-ups. How do the training regiments stack up between the Navy SEALs and Green Berets? Training for a Navy SEAL is consistently rated the most difficult training out of any branch of the military. The training for a Navy SEAL is made up of three core pillars. The first is to create men of character, which means to train each soldier to uphold the Navy's core values. The next pillar of training is physical. Navy SEALs must be physically fit and trained to work in every environment, but most especially water. The final pillar of training is technical. The training to become a Navy SEAL requires soldiers to be intelligent and able to quickly learn new tasks. There are two months of preparatory training before a soldier can even begin their Navy SEAL training. This preparatory period includes demanding physical and mental screening tests. Once the preliminary training is over, SEAL candidates enter a six-month basic underwater demolition training program. This is the part of the training that is cited as being the most difficult training in all of the U.S. military. The candidates must undergo constant physical and mental tests. They are also trained in basic water competency skills, underwater combat, weapons and demolitions training, and navigation on dry land. Then there is Hell Week and it lives up to its name. This part of SEAL training is five days or more of candidates being pushed to their breaking point through intense physical and mental exertion around the clock. They are only allowed about four hours of sleep the entire period. It is at this point about 75% of candidates fail or drop out. If a candidate makes it through Hell Week, then they are put through weeks of intermediate training, including small unit tactics, parachuting, and cold weather operations. But nothing is as difficult as Hell Week. If a soldier can make it through all of the rigorous training exercises, 
then they're awarded the trident. This is the official Navy SEAL symbol. Once the soldier receives their trident, they are assigned to a SEAL platoon, where they have several more months of advanced training for specialty skills. It's after this point that soldiers can call themselves a Navy SEAL. Green Berets start out with basic combat training. Candidates who aspire to be Green Berets must also have completed advanced individual training and U.S. Army Airborne School. Soldiers then need to report to Fort Bragg to complete a six-week course in physical fitness and land navigation called the Special Forces Preparation Course. Next, the candidates need to go through the Special Forces Assessment and Selection Training. During this training, soldiers' survival skills are tested and their physical and mental fitness is pushed to its limits. The final phase of the training is the Special Forces Qualification Course. This is a 53-week training course in small unit tactics, combat marksmanship, advanced Special Forces tactics, language and cultural training, and unconventional warfare. Once these 53 weeks are over, the soldier can finally be deployed as a Green Beret. Navy SEALs and Green Berets are both elite Special Forces units. The Navy SEAL training is more difficult to get through, but the Green Berets training is a longer process. There's currently around 2,500 Navy SEALs on active duty. There are about 7,000 Green Berets on active duty. Reports state that the number of Green Berets may be decreasing. The strain of repeated deployments and failure to meet recruiting targets are starting to take its toll on the Green Berets. The amount of soldiers in a squad differs between Navy SEALs and Green Berets as well. SEAL squads consist of approximately 16 men, but may be divided into smaller squads and fire teams as needed. Green Beret squads work as 12 soldier teams known as an A-team. Each member of the team has a specific job within the squad. The two Special Forces branches have specific mission types. However, Green Berets and Navy SEALs do work together from time to time. There have been missions where the two branches are deployed to complete missions together, and other times where a squad is a mix of Navy SEALs and Green Berets. Normally, Navy SEALs are assigned to specific missions based on the skills required. In the case of Navy SEALs, the skill set of the squad drives the decision of where they'll be deployed. Green Berets are assigned to nine different types of missions. These missions are unconventional warfare, foreign internal defense, direct action, counterinsurgency, special reconnaissance, counterterrorism, information operations, counterproliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and security force assistance. The squad is deployed based on the geographic focus of the Green Beret platoon. If the squad has been trained in Middle Eastern cultures, they will most likely be deployed to that region of the world. But in extreme circumstances, Green Berets are sent wherever they're needed most. When it comes down to it, the training necessary to join each elite force is rigorous and difficult to get through. You can be sure that the soldiers from both branches of the military will be skilled and lethal. But what about their weapons? How do Navy SEAL weapons stack up against the weapons of the Green Berets? For handguns, the Navy SEALs use a 9mm Sig Sauer P226, which can have a 20-round clip. The other option Navy SEALs have is the MK-23 Mod Zero 45 caliber offensive handgun, which has a standard 12-round clip. Both handguns are equipped with the suppressor and laser aiming module. These modifications allow for stealthiness and better accuracy. For rifles, Navy SEALs use a plethora of different guns. Most common is the M4A1, which has a 550-yard range and a 30-round magazine. SEALs have also been known to use the AK-47 along with submachine guns, shotguns, and sniper rifles to supplement the firepower in their squad. The standard issue handgun for the Green Beret is the Glock 19. This pistol was selected for its low visibility, which allows it to be concealed easily. This is important as the Green Beret uniform might change to meet mission requirements. The Glock 19 magazine capacity can vary from 6 rounds to 33 and can fire over 100 rounds a minute. The two most used rifles for the Green Berets are the MK-17 SCAR and the M4 Carbine. The SCAR is designed for mid-range engagements and has a standard 20-round magazine. The M4 is used by soldiers who prefer the customizability of the gun and its light weight. Green Berets will choose the right gun for the specific mission they're assigned. Another difference between the Navy SEALs and the Green Berets are the crafts they use from mission to mission. Navy SEALs have a wide variety of vehicles at their disposal for deployment. They use aquatic crafts such as the SEAL delivery vehicle and the combat rubber raiding craft, a 15-foot heavily reinforced inflatable rubber boat. The Navy SEALs also have several other ships and larger craft for deployment and extraction. On the other hand, Green Berets tend to only use one vehicle, the Ground Mobility Vehicle. It's a lightweight all-terrain truck that can be used in a variety of environments and missions, and it would seem that the Ground Mobility Vehicle is versatile enough to complete almost any Green Beret assignment. The fact that the Navy SEALs must work in the water and air as well as on land means they need a more diverse array of delivery vehicles. 
Deployment time varies within each Special Forces branch. SEALs typically operate on 18-month cycles and are deployed for six months at a time. However, some units with special assignments or skills have their own schedules. They may be deployed more frequently but for shorter amounts of time. Green Berets' deployment lengths can vary, but deployment time is normally between 90 days and 15 months. All in all, Navy SEALs and Green Berets are well-trained elite soldiers. They can get deployed anywhere around the world for a variety of missions. Both Navy SEALs and Green Berets have to go through hell and prove they have what it takes through months of training. These soldiers are the best of the best and are given the equipment they need to complete any mission. Sometimes, SEALs and Green Berets work together, and I'd hate to be the mission target for that squad. The year was 1943. The USA had been involved in World War II for a couple of years, and during that summer on the high seas, US destroyers and other Allied ships were involved in a bloody battle with German U-boat submarines. The Battle of the Atlantic would become the longest continuous military campaign of the war, and it would take thousands and thousands of lives belonging to the Allied forces and the German military. Shipyards in Britain, the US, and Canada were more than busy, but it was at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard where something special, something verging on the utterly fantastic, was supposedly taking place. This would become known as the Philadelphia Experiment, and now we're going to tell you how that allegedly went down. As the story goes, at that American shipyard in Philadelphia, a new destroyer was being built and it went by the name of the USS Eldridge. But this was no ordinary destroyer, far from it. It was being equipped with technology no country had or even had heard about. This technology was related to something called electrical field manipulation, and what this did was make the ship invisible to everyone else. This apparently came to fruition on July 22, 1943. We're told on this day in front of government and military officials, the scientists disappeared the ship with crew intact right in front of their eyes. A witness said he heard the generators buzz and then a strange blue light seemed to encapsulate the destroyer, and then, poof, it was gone. To say the least, the onlookers were completely baffled. To baffle them even more, their reports that the Eldridge appeared somewhere else at another shipyard in another part of the US and then reappeared back in Philadelphia. That's one story anyhow, because another story says those scientists didn't introduce teleportation until later that year in October. Some accounts even say that when the ship came back there were sailors on board, but some of them had been fused to various parts of the steel. Some of these people were apparently mangled and broken, which adds some amount of horror to the tale. Apparently, when the ship was teleported in the second experiment and just appeared in the water near the Philadelphia shipyard, someone saw it and he was aboard another ship, the SS Andrew First. Seth. It sounds like an outlandish tale, but a lot of people believe it's true. Now we must try and separate fact from fiction. So we'll introduce an astronomer and science fiction writer named Morris K. Jessup. Some reports said he'd been in touch with an anonymous person who had been on the Andrew Furseth, although later accounts say the writer was told about the experiments by a guy named Carl Meredith Allen. We can't tell you much about him, but he's been called a UFO conspiracy theorist and a publicity seeker. You can tell us if that's true at the end of the show. Jessup lived an embattled life. He was an educated man who became an astronomer, but his real love was writing books. He wrote some books on UFOs in the 1950s, notably his The Case for the UFO in 1955. This book did okay, and he believed he could make a living from writing. His second book didn't do well though, and subsequently his manuscripts that followed were rebuffed by his publisher. To make matters worse, his wife left him in 1958. A year later, he was depressed and despondent, although as the tale goes, he called one of his friends to tell her that he had something important to say regarding the Philadelphia experiment. A day later, he was found dead. His body was found inside a car, a hose had been connected to the window from the exhaust pipe, and the engine had been turned on. He had apparently taken his own life and died after inhaling the fumes. This has of course led conspiracy theorists to say that he was killed because he knew too much about the secret experiments conducted by the US military, although his friends later came out and said he had talked about killing himself for weeks, even months. That's the sad story of Morris Jessup. Now back to this guy named Carl Meredith Allen, the person who first said he had seen the experiments with his own eyes. He wrote about 50 letters to Jessup relating what he had seen, but at the time he used the name Carlos Miguel Allende. Sometimes he'd say he'd been taught by the great Albert Einstein, and he claimed to understand something called unified field theory. This was a theory introduced by Einstein, and it's not easy to explain in a few words. The dictionary definition is this, a theory that describes two or more of the four 
interactions, electromagnetic, gravitational, weak, and strong, previously described by separate theories. Or as Live Science put it, a field theory refers generally to why physical phenomena happen and why these phenomena interact with nature. Anyway, we are guessing Carlos Miguel Allende didn't understand it and he certainly had no proof of it being anything but a theory. To this day, it's never been proven. But Allende wrote to Jessup saying he was sure the theory was possible because he'd seen a ship disappear and that was proof. The thing was, he was the only person at the time who said he'd seen this happen. We should add that some people say it was this delusional man that partly drove Jessup to hooking up his car with the noxious hose. Jessup did at least try to investigate the claim, but there was just no evidence. Allende kept pestering him, saying that it was true, and this frustrated Jessup. In 1957, the Navy's Office of Naval Research even approached Jessup and told him they had received something strange in the post. The package contained one of Jessup's UFO books, but inside were scribbled notes describing extraterrestrial technology and ramblings about unified field theory. Yeah, Allende had done that, although it was supposed to look like the notes had been made by three people or two people plus an alien. It gets stranger, though, because the Office of Naval Research then actually published 127 copies of this book with the added parts. This stress, along with his wife leaving him and his career on the line, no doubt was too much for Jessup. As for Allende, he lived to a ripe old age and died in 1994. During his lifetime, Allende would confess that the whole thing was a hoax, but then later he would change his mind and say it was fact. This is why some people have said he was a delusional publicity seeker, but to those people that believed in UFOs and that the USA has always been doing out of this world stuff at its various black sites, what Allende said was gasoline on a fire. It doesn't help matters that anyone who wants to can see the semen certificate of Carl Meredith Allen. We've seen it. So if any part of this story is true, it's the fact that he was a semen. Then things got even weirder in the 1980s. That's because someone decided to make a movie called The Philadelphia Experiment. Now we all know that we shouldn't believe everything we've seen on the big screen, but for one man watching this film brought back some memories. His name was Al Bilek, and while the film came out in 1984, he watched it four years later. He claimed to have watched the movie, and after that, his repressed memories about the actual Philadelphia experiment came back to him. He said he'd also seen the ship teletransport. He also claimed to have traveled into the future and seen the mid-21st century. He said he'd been part of something called the Montauk Project and among other weird things it was concerned with time travel. According to Bilek, he'd been on board the USS Eldridge when it disappeared. He claimed to have been in the body of another man and been with that man's brother. He said that when the ship disappeared they both decided to jump overboard, but instead of hitting water they drifted through clouds until they passed out. When they woke up they were in a hospital somewhere. They were covered in radiation burns, but what really got their attention was the fact that they were in the year 2137. This all came back to him after seeing that movie. There was more, too, that came back. For instance, he said he'd visited the 28th century. He said cities were then governed by computer systems. At that time, the world was populated by only 300 million people. He made more outrageous claims, such as visiting Mars or describing one of his sojourns in the year of 6037. There was nothing to back up any of this, of course. In 1994, a French astrophysicist and ufologist Jacques F. Valli wrote a piece called Anatomy of a Hoax, the Philadelphia Experiment 50 years later. He asked people to read it and come forward if they knew anything about this alleged experiment. One person did, and his name was Edward Dudgeon. He had served in the U.S. Navy during the Second World War. Dudgeon said that during the 1940s the USA did actually try in some ways to make ships invisible, but it's not what you might think. What they tried to do was wrap electrical cable around the hulls of ships to try to make the ships not visible to underwater mines and magnetic torpedoes. This is hardly paranormal stuff. The Germans had been planting such mines and using magnetic weapons. Those mines were supposed to connect to any passing ships, so the Americans attempted to make that impossible. He said that this process was called degaussing, and that he added at the time that there was this talk of being something that made ships invisible. You could call what happened next the result of Chinese whispers. People talked about invisible ships, and it seems some of them took this literally, not just relating to ships being able to evade magnetic weapons. Furthermore, in 1999, the Philadelphia Inquirer ran a piece about sailors who had served on the USS Eldridge. They said at the time, when it was supposed to have disappeared in Philadelphia, it was actually in Brooklyn. The ship's logs also said that this was a fact. 
All the sailors who'd been aboard the ship agreed, and so it seems Dudgeon's account of why the hoax manifested is quite credible. Nonetheless, the conspiracy theorists just say that this is the military covering up what really happened. They'll tell you that the sailors had been forced to say that, and indeed, someone somewhere can make great hunks of metal just disappear. It's just a pity no one in this world has seen that happen since. Our conclusion is that the Philadelphia experiment is about as plausible as the existence of UFOs or that mythical beast in Scotland, the Loch Ness Monster. We believe that Allende likely had mental problems and Jessup was just unfortunate to get caught up in the mess. As for the time-traveling Bilek who'd broken bread with folks in the year of 6037, we dare to say that we think that man was out of his mind. This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at www.dashlane.com slash infographics. And never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. It's the height of the Cold War and 300 meters beneath the surface of the stormy North Atlantic, a Soviet submarine steams past the Icelandic coast. The Soviet captain looks to his crew. Everyone is holding their breath, waiting to find out if they've slipped past the formidable NATO anti-submarine picket line that stretches from Iceland to mainland Europe. After several tense minutes of silence, the crew relaxes. Sonar can hear NATO patrol ships far away, but not a single one of them has changed course. They haven't been detected. Ordering his men to hold bearing, the captain plots a course a few hundred miles from the American coastline, where his nuclear ballistic missile submarine will loiter undetected, ready to deliver a devastating surprise nuclear attack in case of war. This is how the balance of power between the two great superpowers is kept. Neither side is able to completely eliminate the other's nuclear arsenal completely without being destroyed in kind. Settling in for a long three-month patrol, the Soviet crew breathes a sigh of relief, knowing they successfully fooled NATO's anti-submarine patrols. Yet unknown to the Soviet sub, a predator stalks the deep cold of the Atlantic, just a few hundred meters behind them. A 370-foot beast made of high-tech steel and aluminum, manned by the US Navy's finest soldiers. The Russians are good submariners, but their subs lack sophistication, and unbeknownst to them, a powerful American underwater weapon can detect them from clear across the Atlantic, zeroing in the US Navy's hunter-killer subs onto their location. For decades, Soviet nuclear attack submarines believe that they're prowling the oceans of the world undetected, completely unaware of the hidden killers always following their every move. If a nuclear war ever broke out, the Soviet ballistic missile submarine fleet would never get a chance to join the war. Eliminated in minutes by the hidden assassins keyed onto their locations by an incredible piece of American technology, the Sound Surveillance System, or SOSIS. Very rudimentary passive and active sonar systems existed as far back as World War I, but these early systems could only manage detection at distances of a few thousand yards, and even then only under the most favorable conditions. During World War II, sonar technology barely moved past these rudimentary systems, and much anti-submarine surveillance was based on visually identifying the vessels by air as they loitered near the surface to recharge their batteries or bring up their periscopes to target ships. During the 1920s, though, the development of the sonic depth finder was an important first step in developing more advanced and capable sonar systems. Although the various elements of a modern sonar system would not achieve technological maturity or be truly understood until halfway through the Second World War. In 1937, Lay University scientist Maurice Ewing made a critical discovery which would catapult American sonar technology far ahead of its competitors. While doing seismic refraction experiments in water three miles deep in the North Atlantic, Ewing used explosive charges placed at different depths to generate sound waves. As Ewing listened to the echoes of the explosions, he discovered that sound signals at very low frequencies could travel great distances with minimal loss, and he postulated that in certain conditions, so-called deep sound channels could exist which would propagate an acoustic signal for hundreds or even thousands of miles. At the same time, the invention and refinement of the Bathy Thermograph by scientists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution made possible for the first time the continuous measurement of ocean temperature at various depths, and more importantly how fast the speed of sound varies at different distances below the waves. A growing understanding of how underwater sounds are refracted or bent by variations in the sound's velocity caused by different temperatures and depths helped support Ewing's hypothesis that underwater channels could indeed propagate acoustic signals for as much as thousands of miles. Wasting no time, the Navy immediately authorized a slew of tests for developing these deep sound channels 
for military use, although at first they would only be used for communications. During the spring of 1944, Ewing supervised a test using the USS Buckley, which steamed away from a receiving ship, dropping explosive charges set to blow at various depths. By determining the pattern of explosions and the depths they occurred at, the Navy hoped to build a system of communication that was impossible to jam, and only required a receiving ship to have nothing more than a basic hydrophone. The explosions from the Buckley were clearly discernible until at last the Buckley had to call off the test after reaching a distance of 900 miles and still being clearly heard by the receiving ship. The test was a huge success, and a system for helping locate and rescue downed pilots was immediately developed. Named so far for sound fixing and ranging, the rescue system consisted of nothing more than a downed pilot dropping a small explosive charge down to the depths of the deep sound channel, where an underwater system of hydrophones would pick up the explosions and triangulate the pilot's exact location. Too late in the war to be of great effect, the rescue signaling system was nevertheless a huge success, but some minds in the US military slowly began to see an altogether different potential to this quirk of underwater acoustics. After World War II's end, the US Navy continued to establish major SOFAR networks in both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, investing in the future security of its downed pilots in case of another major war. Yet as the first chills of the Cold War began to grip the world, the growing threat of a Soviet submarine fleet based on capture German designs urged Navy leadership to develop a more formidable anti-submarine warfare capability based on the detection of underwater sound. By the early 1950s, the US government believed that Soviet submarines posed the greatest threat to American security over any other Soviet weapon, and thus established Project Hartwell. For six months, the best and brightest minds of the American Navy and civilian scientists alike drew together to discuss how to counter the Soviet submarine threat. Long-range submarine detection was premier in the list of topics discussed during Project Hartwell, and a focus of its efforts. The physicist Frederick Hunt electrified the project heads with a stunning and very very convincing idea. Why not use SOFAR to detect Soviet subs? He showed Project Hartwell's leadership that higher frequency sounds made by Soviet subs could be easily detected at ranges of a few hundred miles. But frequencies below 500 Hz would easily penetrate through the various layers of the oceans to reach the deep sound channel from virtually any depth and thus make detection of a noisy Soviet sub possible at ranges of thousands of miles. The US Navy immediately started several highly secret research programs to better understand long-range sound transmission through the ocean. They even partnered with AT&T to begin building underwater listening stations. This budding secret surveillance network was classified with the acronym SOSUS, standing for Sound Surveillance System, and received a top secret classification. In January 1952, the first prototype SOSUS installation was deployed by a British cable layer, and after a series of successful detection trials with US submarines, the Navy approved the installation of more arrays along the entire American East Coast. Two years later, a system would extend to the West Coast and to Hawaii as well, ensuring that no hostile sub could approach the US mainland without being detected. The early SOSIS arrays were fixed directly to the seafloor at specific locations that could access the deep sound channel and oriented at right angles to the expected approach axis of a hostile submarine. The outputs of each hydrophone was transmitted to shore processing stations through multicolor armored cables. At these shore-based processing stations, the incoming data was analyzed and observers would look for the distant frequencies given off by rotating machinery. Hundreds of printers at these facilities would output infographs 24 hours a day, constantly monitoring the entire ocean for Soviet signals. Observers would look for distinctive submarine signatures printed on the graphs, and if simultaneous contacts were made with multiple arrays, then a target could be verified and its position triangulated. Moments later, a US sub or surface boat would then be dispatched. SOSIS had originally been designed to detect air-breathing Soviet diesel submarines, which would have to surface to snorkel depths to run their diesel engines and recharge their batteries. However, the system's ability to cover a wide range of frequencies at nearly any depth would prove even more effective at tracking deep-diving Soviet nuclear-powered submarines. With the first SOSIS contact on a Soviet nuclear boat west of Norway established in 1962, SOSIS would go on to play a major role during the Cuban Missile Crisis when it detected three Soviet submarines leaving Russian waters heading for Cuba. In 1968, SOSIS made its first detections of Soviet Charlie and Victor-class submarines. 
proving its worth even against upgraded Soviet designs. It even allowed for the discovery and secret retrieval years later of a Soviet Golf-class submarine that had sunk north of Hawaii. The US Navy had a silver bullet in its arsenal, and with it the ability to completely shut down the threat of Soviet submarines. Yet the secret of SOSIS wouldn't last. In late 1967, US Navy Chief Warrant Officer John Anthony Walker strolled into the Soviet Embassy in Washington and sold a top-secret radio cipher card for a few thousand dollars. His treachery directly led to the North Korean attack on the USS Pueblo while in international waters, an act which was later revealed to have been coordinated by the Soviets, who wanted access to the encryption devices stored aboard so that they could make full use of John Walker's leaked intelligence. Aboard the Pueblo, though, the Soviets discovered some details about SOSAS, and through subsequent spying soon discovered the fact that their submarines had been tracked almost effortlessly for two decades. Immediately after the John Walker betrayal, Soviet submarine designs became much quieter and thus harder to detect. SOSAS continued to operate, however, until the end of the Cold War, and in 1993, with the threat of Soviet submarines nothing more than a memory, the system was turned over to civilian researchers who adopted it for studying whale migrations and communication. In 1996, SOSAS's big brother, the Advanced Deployable System, became operational, as the need to monitor the world's oceans for new threats once more became vitally important. The United States has a problem. The Chinese Navy has officially become the world's largest navy. Thankfully, the capabilities of the Chinese Navy are decades behind that of the American Navy, but in any confrontation with China, the US Navy will at best only be able to call upon 60% of its fleet, thanks to naval commitments elsewhere in the world. When forced to face off against just over half of the US fleet, the Chinese Navy's chances for victory in any Pacific conflict quickly escalate. For now, though, the US Navy doesn't need to worry. China is still not a true blue water navy that's capable of operating for extended periods of time far away from its own shores, although it has sent task forces to the Horn of Africa to aid in anti piracy efforts. Overall, on a ship to ship basis, the Chinese Navy's technology ranges from a decade to four decades behind the United States, especially amongst its very noisy submarine forces. Yet the situation is quickly changing. China has in recent years funded a major investment in its naval forces, which has has resulted in a frenzy of shipbuilding. Currently, China outbuilds the United States when it comes to ships. Though again, it's important to remember that the capabilities of each ship so far fails to match up to those of American ships. Also, this is still the initial surge phase of China's new modern navy. After reaching a predetermined target number of ships, the shipbuilding frenzy will slow to a rate similar to the US's. China's growing naval might is worrying not just the United States, but many of China's own neighbors who have routinely been bullied by China's growing might. Japan, the Philippines, and Vietnam, to name a few, all have serious disputes with China, which has on numerous times claimed territory rightfully within their territorial waters for itself. China's frenzy of island building in the South China Sea has also sparked international concerns, and while President Obama's shifting of naval power to the Pacific quickly halted the island expansions, China has so far refused to vacate the five islands it has built. This is in spite of a ruling by The Hague which dismissed China's fanciful claims to the region. Instead, China has fortified its South China Sea holdings, adding radars, flight lines for combat planes, and missile defense systems. The message is clear, China is not budging. While the US is not seeking a military confrontation with China, its commitments to defend many of the nations that China is currently bullying or intimidating may force its hand. In that case, the US may find itself with its hands full dealing with Chinese naval and ballistic missile power, unless radical reforms of the American Navy take place. The greatest threat to American naval forces in the Pacific is China's staggeringly large stockpile of anti-ship ballistic missiles. These giant missiles can be fired from the heart of China and guided to their target as far out in the Pacific as Guam by a system of space and airborne radar and targeting assets. With thousands of these missiles, the US fleet appears to be in serious jeopardy. To counter the ballistic missile threat from China, the US Navy has adopted a doctrine of dispersed operations, while in the past battle groups would be centered around an aircraft carrier to fight relatively close together. The new doctrine has led the Navy to widely disperse its battle groups so as to make each individual ship harder to hit. New investments in anti-ballistic missile systems have also added robust capabilities to American fleets, and a new generation of anti-missile missiles have performed very well in testing. Yet a major problem for the US Navy is the sheer number of ballistic and conventional missiles China could throw at American ships. 
While it's highly unlikely that China would be able to achieve air superiority against the US Navy, new extremely long-range anti-ship missiles would see China fighters able to use their weapons against American ships from hundreds of miles away and never even get close to American interceptors meant to protect their ships from this threat. Then there's the threat posed by Chinese submarines, which could fire off anti-ship missiles while lurking under the waves. They would need to be closer to their American targets than Chinese jets, but would still be able to operate far outside of the traditional security envelope established around American battle groups. One solution to these twin problems is to simply push out the radius of the security envelope around a battle group. Unmanned refueling tankers are already being deployed amongst American fleets, and this will allow a carrier's combat air patrol to operate much further away than normal, which will let them intercept Chinese aircraft before getting close enough to fire. To counter the submarine threat, the US Navy under its Ghost Fleet Overlord program has been testing autonomous ships that can assist manned ships in combat. One of these ships is an anti-submarine warfare platform which would patrol the waters around a battle group completely on its own, searching for Chinese subs and engaging any discovered. Another key to defending American ships in the Pacific is a heavy investment into technologies and tools to disrupt China's kill chains, or a chain of assets required to successfully launch a ballistic missile and accurately guide it to its target a thousand miles away. This includes space-based and airborne surveillance and radar platforms, as well as communication nodes, and while details remain classified, the US so far remains confident that it can disrupt China's kill chain capabilities enough to protect most of its ships. For their part, the Chinese have never demonstrated they have the sophistication to implement and protect a kill chain system that can successfully target and destroy a ship far out at sea. New plans are calling for a heavy investment by the US in anti-ballistic missile systems, such as directed energy weapons and kinetic interceptors such as railguns. Currently, one of the biggest problems with protecting American fleets is not an inability to accurately target and destroy incoming missiles, but simply that China would rely on overwhelming barrages meant to force US ships to expend all the missiles in their batteries trying to protect themselves. Once each ship's battery is depleted, it is for all intents and purposes defenseless against incoming missiles, especially of the ballistic variety. A directed energy weapon would have no magazine size limits, as it would fire off electrical power generated by the ship. It could fire for as long as the ships generate electricity and intercept incoming missiles at the speed of light, making it incredibly accurate. High-energy lasers could burn out missile warheads and guidance electronics, causing them to prematurely detonate or simply fly out of control. Kinetic railgun interceptors would still need a magazine of projectiles, but these projectiles are both much cheaper to produce than a modern missile and can be made much, much smaller. A single railgun battery could hold hundreds of rounds for a fraction of the cost of a traditional vertical launch cell on a big warship. But even those innovations aren't enough to successfully defeat China at sea, because the fact remains that China has invested extremely heavily in both anti-ship ballistic and traditional missiles. To make matters worse, the US Navy's current ship designs are only making China's job of destroying them easier. For decades, US ships were built around extremely powerful suites of radar and other sensors, which gave them incredible situational awareness and command of their battle space, but in a modern war also make them incredibly easy targets to find for any sophisticated foe, such as China. In essence, US ships and their sensor systems put out so much electronic noise that finding them out at sea would be easy for China, as it would be for you to find a screaming person in a pitch black room. High energy sensor systems are an absolute necessity for any naval force, so simply doing away with them is not realistic. Instead, the Navy needs to seriously rethink its current force structure. At the moment, the US Navy is very destroyer and cruiser heavy. It's the biggest, meanest guy on the block and packs the strongest right hook in the world. To defeat China and not suffer catastrophic losses in doing so, the American Navy needs to go on a serious diet and slim down. Rather than relying on traditional concentrations of big destroyers and guided missile cruisers, the US Navy needs to slash funding for those large ships and invest in a force of mid-range ships about half the size of a modern destroyer. These smaller ships would carry less ordnance, but would be cheaper to build, maintain and operate, and could be fielded in large numbers versus smaller numbers of bigger ships. These medium-sized ships would be widely dispersed across a battle space, and thanks to their sheer numbers and smaller profiles, enough of them could get close enough to Chinese forces with an acceptable degree of risk that they could take advantage of passive sensors to track and target Chinese ships and shore targets. Passive sensor systems put out much less energy than active systems, and thus a larger network of smaller ships could relay targeting data back to the main battle group while remaining relatively undetected. America's big guns could safely remain undetected at sea and still be able to service targets accurately. New studies call for these smaller ships to be completely unmanned or at least optionally manned with crews no greater than 24. 
In fact, the US Navy is looking to adopt unmanned ships in a big way, literally, and the service is right now testing two large unmanned ships. Under program Ghost Fleet Overlord, the US Navy intends to build several large unmanned vessels or LOVES to support its traditional manned forces. The goal of these LOVES will be to offset the risk of battlegroups being overwhelmed by saturation strikes and expending all of their missile batteries in self-defense. In essence, each LOVE will be nothing more than a seaborne missile battery, housing hundreds of missiles, which could either be fired remotely at targets or used to resupply battlegroups at sea. Nicknamed Arsenal Ships, the concept dates back to the 1980s, and each individual ship could carry about half the firepower of an entire battle group. That's a hell of a lot of punch in just one ship, but many experts fear that that's exactly the problem. These big robotic missile ships will still rely on extremely powerful active sensor systems that will be easy for Chinese forces to spot and target. Arsenal ships also have one other major downside. They serve no purpose outside of an actual war. Unlike traditional manned ships, arsenal ships could not be deployed on training missions, relationship building missions with a friendly country, or counterterrorism missions. They would have only a single use, in only a single scenario, giving the Navy a lot less bang for its buck dollar for dollar. Instead, experts are calling for the Navy to switch from large robotic arsenal ships to the fleet of smaller unmanned or optionally manned ships we discussed earlier. Not only will this give the Navy a much greater survivability against Chinese missile forces, but the ships could still carry out a range of peacetime missions as well. In fact, a recent study showed that for the same price, the US Navy could actually get 1.4 times the missile tubes going with a fleet of smaller ships than the current plan to purchase lower numbers of big robot arsenal ships. In the end, hopefully the Navy never needs to implement any of its plans to defeat China at sea, as nobody wants to see a confrontation between the two nations. Yet, for the US and many of the South Pacific nations that have found themselves bullied by China in the last decade and a half, it's a comforting thought to know the US Navy is always preparing for that unfortunate happenstance. They have a 92% washout rate. Time and again, their training has been described as the most mentally and physically tough of any special forces outfit in the world. Those who don't choose to quit have a better than even chance of suffering a serious injury, with one of the highest training fatality rates among special forces units on Earth. Some will even die. And if you want to be a US Navy SEAL, then you too will have to pass through the dreaded Hell Week. It starts with a bang. A lot of bangs, actually. One minute you're comfortably asleep in your bunk, if maybe a little drafty seeing as you're sleeping inside a tent by the ocean. And the next, the world has exploded into a cacophony of gunfire and explosions. Hope you had some nice dreams there, sweet pea, because you just woken up to a world of hurt. Instructors prowl the tents, barking orders and ripping students out of their cots. All the while, other instructors move through the camp firing off rifles and machine guns loaded with blanks. Others toss smoke and concussion grenades everywhere they please. You better be able to find your swim buddy in the chaos as instructors shout orders through the chaos of gunfire and explosions, because you do not want to be caught without your swim buddy. Then it's time to get your ass in the water. Hell Week is going to be long, cold, and extremely sandy, and it all starts on minute one of night one. You'll be running into the freezing cold Pacific surf and locking arms with the rest of the students, letting the pounding Pacific waves slam into you over and over again, rapidly dropping your internal body temperature. You may have grown up the biggest, baddest guy on your block. Maybe you can bench press 300 pounds. Maybe you're an MMA champ. Literally none of that matters to the United States Navy. Thugs are a dime a dozen and of no use to the professional United States military. What interests the US Navy is men who are physically and mentally tough, and it all starts with the ice-cold Pacific Ocean washing over you at 2 in the morning. It's only been minutes since Hell Week began and already students are calling it quits. The freezing waters of the Pacific leach body heat away, dropping core temperature to dangerously low levels. Some of the students can't help it, each human body is different, and theirs simply can't handle the cold and begins to shut down. Others don't have the mental toughness to shrug off the effects of hypothermia. Good, the United States Navy doesn't want them anyway. Quitting is encouraged, you're reminded of that on a nearly minute-by-minute -minute basis, as instructors with bullhorns give voice to your innermost thoughts. It's too cold. If you stay in this water, you might die. Wouldn't it feel better to be in a nice warm bed right now, like the rest of the world? There's coffee and donuts, you know, just over there, past a lonely silver bell. All you have to do is walk up to it and ring it once, signifying you're done. Then you get a nice, fat, juicy donut and some piping hot coffee to enjoy in front of your former classmates. People are doing it even now, and you can see the steaming fog of the coffee from your vantage point in the surf zone right before another ice-cold wave slams into and over you, drowning you for just a moment. 
Now that you're good and soaked, with sand washed into every crevice of your body, it's time to get that body temperature up with some good old-fashioned PT. Hope you like push-ups, because you're going to be doing hundreds of them. But the United States Navy isn't heartless, and it doesn't want you to get bored. So they've even given you the privilege of alternating your hundreds of push-ups with hundreds of flutter kicks. It's the most exhausting workout of your life. But again, the Navy has you covered and gives you plenty of breaks. Just long enough for you to run, not jog, down to the surf link arms, and get smashed by the freezing cold waves all over again. If you had a watch, which you don't, you'd know that only one hour has passed since Hell Week has began and already a tenth of your class has called it quits. All your push-ups and flutter kicks are boring the instructors, so it's time to switch it up. Now you're gonna low crawl 200 meters on hard pavement to get to the next evolution area, and your ass better not rise more than an inch off the ground as you move. In combat, you'll get killed. Here, it'll move you straight back to the starting area where you'll begin your low crawl all over again. By now, you've covered every square inch of your body in coarse sand, and you're dragging your worthless hide across hard pavement, digging that sand into your soft flesh. That's not road burn, student. That's the American homeland giving you a loving kiss. You can't so much raise your head until you can physically reach out and touch an instructor's boot. Then, well, did I mention that the instructors were bored? It's time to entertain them. You probably liked singing in the shower as a civilian. Well, the United States Navy would love to hear you sing, and they've provided the biggest shower in the world to be your stage, the Pacific Ocean. That's right, it's time to hit the surf zone again, lock arms, and start belting out tunes on request. The instructors love the classics. America, my country tis of thee, and of course, anchors away, the Navy's own fight song, and they'll gladly accept some top 40 hits or even a few holiday jingles. So you better know more than a few songs by heart because you'll be singing them for the next several hours. Alright, you made it to dawn. Congratulations! Other special forces programs around the world will starve their recruits in order to test their mental toughness. The United States Navy takes the opposite approach, and you'll not only eat often but you'll eat a lot, and most of it will be piping hot. But only because the Navy has to feed you like this. You may be able to slog through other special forces training on one protein bar every two days, but Navy SEAL training will absolutely kill you if you don't eat hot food often. You're burning a whopping 8,000 calories a day, and the warm food will make sure that your core body temperature doesn't dip so low that you die from hypothermia. If you've made it to Hell Week, you've definitely done long PT before, but you've never quite done it like this. You and several of your fellow students will be doing log PT for hours. Give your log a name. Get close to your log. Get to know its likes and dislikes, its hopes and dreams for the future. Because you and your team are going to be doing log PT for days. You'll carry your log. You'll push your log. You'll pull your log. You'll jog with your log. And you'll take nice rest breaks holding your log close as the Pacific Ocean's freezing cold waves slam into you over and over again in the surf zone. But the US Navy doesn't tolerate jealousy and other pettiness in its ranks. And all that time you've spent with your log has kept you away from your inflatable rubber boat. So you'll be spending plenty of time with it too. You'll be carrying your boat over your head for hours on end, to the point that friction will actually cause you to lose hair in patches on your head. Hopefully it'll regrow. If not, well, you're not here to look pretty and win beauty contests. You're here to help the United States Navy enforce a free and open world order on the high seas. It doesn't really matter where you run under the boat, go into the middle, and the 200-300 pound boat will be constantly pressing down on you. Go to the front or the back and instead it'll be smacking you in the head as you run, possibly even giving you a concussion if someone on your team isn't pulling their weight. You get exactly four hours of guaranteed sleep during all of Hell Week. Because unfortunately, your mind is weak, and the United States Navy has not yet figured out how to operate sailors on an entire week with no sleep. But don't worry, it's a weakness they're working on. If you're smart though, you'll be catching a few blinks of shut-eye literally anywhere you can get it. Finish an evolution before the other teams, your reward is a few minutes of sleep. If the instructors are feeling egregiously generous, you might even get to rest by the fire so you can warm up. Even if you're not smart enough to catch sleep when you can, probably because you're from Arkansas, your brain will try and force it on you. It's your job not to let it do that, because the best way to repeat a training evolution is to fall asleep in the middle of one. By about the third day though, your pathetically weak human brain will start to get a bit buggy, and it's your job to push through the hallucinations of cartoon characters rowing the boat next to you to finish the evolution at hand. That's right, you don't have to carry the boat all the time, that'd be silly. Boats are meant to be on the water after all. So in order to reward your progress through Hell Week, the United States Navy gives you plenty of opportunities for a nice, relaxing cruise through stormy Pacific waves. Of course, you'll be paddling the boat yourself, and you'll be paddling on absolutely zero sleep and waves over six feet high for miles and miles at a time. 
Don't get swept out of the boat and drown, though. That would be incredibly inconvenient for the Navy. And honestly, just plain selfish of you. Hope you like whistles, because you're going to be hearing plenty of them throughout Hell Week. Each instructor carries a whistle, and it doesn't matter what you're doing or what you're carrying, the moment you hear that whistle, you better act. One whistle means drop, flat on your face as incoming rounds are on the way. Two whistles mean stop whatever you're doing and low crawl to the instructor through sand, mud, or hard cement. You hear the whistle blow twice, you move, no questions asked. And you don't stand up again until you hear the three whistle all clear sign. By now you haven't slept or showered in days, and even before getting to Hell Week, you were probably concerned with personal hygiene. But the Navy's got your back, because guess what, it's time for more surf therapy. Lock arms and lay in that surf. Let Mother America hold you close with her barely above freezing watery embrace, over and over again for hours, until your teeth are clattering so hard you might actually need dental work after training, like many Hell Week graduates. Or you might not even notice, after all, you've been shivering this entire time as your body desperately tries to keep its temperature up so it doesn't die. And make no mistake, this training will kill you. That's why you get plenty of meals, and most of them piping hot. It's a matter of necessity. Because in order to prove that you can join the ranks of the most elite warriors the planet has ever seen, the Navy will put you through a week purposefully designed to bring you to the brink of constant death by hypothermia. It's not the strongest or the fastest or the best sharpshooters who make it through Hell Week. It's the most mentally fit. The most die-hard sailors who refuse to quit even when their body is on the verge of mechanical shutdown. Then and only then can you even begin to officially start your training as a Navy SEAL. That's right, everything you've endured until now hasn't even been a part of your official training. Hell Week actually takes place shortly after you're accepted into SEAL training. It's all been one big test until now, with Hell Week the final exam. So the United States Navy can see if you're even worth the incredible investment in time and resources it'll take to train you as a SEAL. Even after this, there'll be plenty of opportunities for you to fail. You might have made it through Hell Week, and you should absolutely be proud of that sailor. But that doesn't mean you're anywhere close to getting your coveted Trident pin. You still have months of training ahead of you, along with the dreaded pool competency test, and plenty of opportunities to get washed out of the program. Then, even if you successfully complete all of the training, your instructors may simply reject you at the end of training. The SEAL community is so small that the odds of a new recruit ending up on a real-world mission with one of their instructors are high, and no instructor will accept a candidate they wouldn't gladly fight alongside with, even if they make it all the way to their final day of training without washing out. In the early 2000s, American fighter jets flying off the coast of California encountered something strange. A small, pill-shaped object was observed to be close to the ocean's surface, possibly rising up out of the water and flying high up into the sky. Giving chase, the F-14 pilots were completely blown away by the strange craft's incredible speeds. Ever since the release of this and other videos captured by American fighter pilots of strange UFOs, speculation has swirled around their true identity. The flight characteristics of the craft in these videos are truly incredible, and if radar reports are to be believed, their acceleration abilities puts them light years ahead of any earthly military tech. However, in 2019, investigative journalists discovered patents filed by the United States Navy, and one of those included a craft capable of recreating the same feats witnesses have been reporting for years. Dubbed the UFO patents for the incredibly advanced nature of the technology they claim to make possible, this series of patents run the gamut from room temperature superconductors to an aircraft capable of traveling through the ocean, the air, and space in the same flight, and even more far-fetched truly science fiction ideas like an electromagnetic field generator that could be used as a force field. If these ideas sound completely far-fetched and out in left field, you're not alone, with the US Patent Office initially refusing to file these patents until the United States Navy stepped in and forced the issue. Crazy patent ideas are nothing new. Everything from perpetual motion machines to wireless transmission of energy devices have been patented from time to time, and not one of them have ever achieved what they claim to be capable of. However, none of these patents had the backing of the United States Navy, and none of them came from top scientists working on some of the Navy's most sensitive research and development programs. The man behind these revolutionary patents is a Dr. Salvatore Cesar Pais, and unlike most garage wannabe ricks, this doctor has some serious credentials. He's worked at the Naval Air Warfare Center for years, developing aerospace technologies to be used both on jet fighters and intercontinental ballistic missiles. Today, Dr. Pais works for the U.S. Navy Strategic Systems Programs, which is responsible for the U.S. Navy's nuclear missiles and ballistic missile submarines that carry them. However, this office also investigates a wide range of global strike technologies, 
including a hypersonic weapon now in development that could strike any target in the world within an hour. Not much else is known about Dr. Pice, who has declined interviews on his patents. Other scientists have reviewed the filed patents and claim they violate the laws of physics and call them absurd. Yet that doesn't change the fact that the US Navy has so far stuck to its guns in support of these patents. And what's more, leaked internal emails show that at least one of these revolutionary ideas was already prototyped and tested successfully. First though, let's go over all of Dr. Pius's patents. By far, the most eye-catching patent is for a craft that, if it performs as stated, would very closely mirror the flight characteristics often observed from UFOs by eyewitnesses. Named the hybrid underwater aerospace craft, this vehicle comes equipped with an inertial mass reduction device, which we suppose is what would allow the craft to perform the incredible feats of acceleration and maneuverability Dr. Pies claims it's capable of, able to launch from land or from underwater, fly into the ocean, back out, and up into space. This man-made UFO would not just revolutionize air warfare, it would instantly make every other nation's fighter and bomber fleets obsolete. By generating a quantum vacuum state around itself, the craft repels air and water molecules, essentially completely ignoring the effects of friction. As an added benefit, the craft would be almost undetectable, or at least fly too fast to make detection completely meaningless. Another of Dr. Pius's patents include room temperature superconductors, which in and of themselves would be a revolutionary scientific leap for mankind. Current superconductors must operate at extremely low temperatures, greatly losing efficiency as they warm up. This has prevented their use in anything but extremely niche and very expensive technologies. Room temperature superconductors promise to change all that. Able to transmit electricity without resistance, superconductors would create an energy revolution, dramatically lowering the price of electricity. These superconductors would make incredible breakthroughs in maglev mass transit technology and magnetic resonance imaging, among a host of other revolutionary effects on human society. Interestingly, Dr. Pius's all-American UFO depends on room temperature superconductors to operate. Dr. Pius's third patent is for a high-frequency gravity wave generator, a device which, if possible, seems to indicate Pius and the US Navy know more about the fundamental nature of gravity than the global physics community. Gravity waves pass through us from time to time, typically as a result of two massive stars crashing into each other millions of light years away. These gravity waves could be considered very low frequency though, and what Dr. Pius's patent proposes is the generation of very high frequency gravity waves, which can have a wide range of applications. As gravity waves propagate, they compress matter in front of them and expand it behind them in the same way a surf wave does to water. The waves that occasionally wash over our planet from far away in space are so low frequency that even just detecting them requires one of the most sensitive instruments mankind has ever built. Yet if you were to generate gravity waves of a high enough frequency, you could potentially wreak havoc on anything you aimed your gravity wave gun at, destroying even the most well-protected and armored installation. In Dr. Pies' patent, though, he claims that he can use this high-frequency gravity wave generator to facilitate superconductivity, and perhaps this is the secret behind his room temperature superconductors. As if the previous three patents weren't outlandish enough, Dr. Pius's third patent could literally save the Earth, or destroy it. His electromagnetic field generator is claimed to be able to deflect or destroy an asteroid over the 100-meter size limit that current asteroid deflection methods are thought to be able to protect the Earth from. By generating an extremely powerful electromagnetic field that can interact with an object at the quantum level, Dr. Pius's asteroid destroyer could obliterate an incoming asteroid or as his patent very ominously describes, the present invention may also deflect or destroy any other type of object. However, Dr. Pius's asteroid death ray is more than an offensive weapon, as he claims that this device can also be used as an impenetrable shield, capable of protecting facilities, vehicles, individuals, or even spacecraft from everything from ballistic missiles to coronal mass ejections. Dr. Pius's patents seem to indicate truly revolutionary technologies that would fundamentally change the human race, or at least America. However, many physicists note that these patents seem to completely violate the laws of physics as known, and don't lend these outlandish inventions any real credence. Despite this, Dr. Pius continues to receive the full support of the United States Navy, and as we mentioned before, leaked internal emails seem to indicate that at least one of these devices was successfully prototyped. Perhaps it's a shell game put on by the US military to throw potential adversaries like Russia and China off the trail of real technological breakthroughs. Or perhaps the United States military is about to completely revolutionize the state of mankind's technology. Only time will tell. 
the United States Navy, and the United States Coast Guard. For anyone not in the know, they might be curious as to what the real difference is between the two services. After all, they both pretty much just operate out at sea, and they both use military caliber vessels. So what's the real difference between the two? And why do we even need a Coast Guard? Why doesn't the Navy just do both jobs itself? In 1790, the United States was facing a dire naval situation. Its shores were being regularly ravaged by pirate vessels, many of which were sponsored by Britain. In an attempt to protect its increasingly important overseas trade, the United States Congress authorized a proposal by the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, to build a fleet of ten cutters. This date, August 4, 1790, is officially recognized as the birthday of the United States Coast Guard, and within three years the nascent Coast Guard, then known as the Revenue Cutter Service, had seen its first anti-piracy action. When war broke out with France in 1798, revenue cutters made up about one-third of the total U.S. fleet, though incredibly, they ended up seizing 18 out of 20 vessels captured by the U.S. ships during the war. During the subsequent War of 1812, revenue cutters clashed with British vessels, and in one engagement the crew of an ambushed American cutter fought so ferociously that the British captain of the attacking vessel returned the revenue cutter's sword to her captain in tribute to the skill of his fighting men. It wouldn't be until 1915 that the U.S. Coast Guard got its official namesake, when the Life Saving Service, a system of patrol ships dispatched to rescue sailors in distress, and the Revenue Cutter Service were merged together into one service. On the 6th of April 1917, the U.S. declared war on Germany, and the Navy broadcasted Plan 1 Acknowledge to all Coast Guard bases and stations, officially transferring control of all U.S. Coast Guard assets to the U.S. Navy for the duration of the war. In support of the war, six Coast Guard cutters were dispatched to Europe for convoy escort duties, while smaller vessels patrolled the waters off the American coast in search for German subs. This would be mirrored two decades later, when the U.S. Navy once more assumed control over the Coast Guard and its vessels. In both wars, Coast Guard ships defended convoys from German subs and suffered losses of ships and sailors in attacks. The U.S. Navy was officially established on October 13, 1775. Despite being outgunned by the mighty British Royal Navy, America has historically had a rich naval tradition, given the vast amount of trade it engages in with overseas powers. This meant that the rebel colonies had a rich pool of experienced sailors, captains, and shipbuilders, and in little time the first vessels of the Continental Navy were putting out to sea. Despite being overwhelmingly outgunned by superior British vessels, American captains nevertheless managed to secure several strategic wins, or turn British victories into Pyrrhic victories with little true value. After winning the Revolutionary War, the United States disbanded its navy as it could not afford to keep it financed. Without the funds to pay tribute to the Barbary states, the nations that made up the north coast of Africa, American ships were plundered by Barbary pirates. The situation only grew worse when in 1793 a truce was negotiated between Portugal and Algiers, which ended Portugal's blockade of the Strait of Gibraltar and allowed the Barbary pirates to escape the Mediterranean. As a result, 11 American vessels and their crews were captured and sold into slavery. This led the U.S. Congress to approve the Naval Act of 1794, which authorized the building of six frigates. In 1798, when war was declared on France, the U.S. Navy was officially re-established. After fending off French vessels during the war, the Barbary pirate states declared open war on the U.S. in 1801, when the U.S. refused to pay tribute. This led the U.S. Navy to conduct the first foreign conquest of an enemy state, battling Barbary ships in Tripoli and landing a contingent of American Marines to capture the city of Derna. During the War of 1812 against the British, the U.S. Navy found itself greatly outgunned and outnumbered by the Royal Navy. As a result, most of her best ships were blockaded in port, and many were captured by ground assaults and burned at the docks. Despite this, the U.S. Navy managed to capture several British ships, and even had a brief but highly successful campaign against British merchant ships in the Pacific. Key victories in the Great Lakes by the U.S. Navy denied the British several key strategic concessions during the negotiations for peace, and these victories ensured that the U.S. Navy would remain fully funded even after the war was over. At last, the United States would have a respectable and full-time navy. During the American Civil War, the Union Navy completely dominated the Confederate Navy, and the blockade of southern ports proved devastating to the Confederacy, hasting along the end of the war. It would be this war, however, when the world would witness the effects of battle between two ironclads, new ships that were fully armored with metal plating for the first time. On March 9, 1862, the whole world acknowledged that wooden ships were officially obsolete. 
as Union and Confederate ironclads attacked each other while tearing through the wooden hulled ships of both sides. The US Navy would sadly decline until just prior to World War I, when it became the second most powerful navy in the world after the Royal Navy. With World War II though, the US surpassed the Royal Navy and officially became the most powerful navy on Earth. Today, the American Navy remains head and shoulders ahead of its nearest competitors and is matched by no other navy anywhere. So now that we know about the two services, just what is the difference between the two, really? Well, essentially both services have a similar but distinct job. The US Coast Guard is America's primary enforcer of maritime law, a task that the US Navy may occasionally assist with but does not actively partake in. The Coast Guard's civil duties are multiple and they're responsible for their age-old tradition of maintaining lighthouses, buoys, and other navigational aids for civilian traffic, although admittedly the only lighthouses in official operation today are automated. The Coast Guard routinely monitors ship traffic to ensure that all vessels of all sizes are obeying proper maritime rules and regulations. They also help keep traffic manageable at some of the world's busiest ports, as well as combat smuggling and illegal immigration by searching for stowaways or responding to a ship who's discovered them hidden on board. Famously, the US Coast Guard is the primary deterrent to drug smuggling on the ocean and operates a fleet of about 200 cutters and smaller patrol craft to chase down suspected smugglers. Recently a video of Coast Guard officers stopping a drug smuggling submarine has gone viral, and this is the job the Coasties do every day. The Coast Guard, however, is also responsible for responding to disasters at sea. When your ship is going down in rough waters and you desperately need help, it's the Coast Guard who will come to rescue the day. No matter what nationality you are, as long as you're in American waters you have a guardian angel on your side, and that's a Coast Guard helicopter carrying rescue divers who have one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. However, in wartime the Coast Guard can also be called upon to supplement the abilities of the US Navy. While today its national security cutters aren't equipped with the heavy long-range firepower needed to take on most military vessels, they still pack a formidable wallop with a 57mm gun, a 20mm phalanx Sea Whiz for close-range defense against drones, small boats and anti-ship missiles, and four 50 caliber machine guns, and four 762 caliber machine guns. The real strength of each cutter though is the robust suite of communications and intelligence sensors, which allow a ship to act as eyes and ears for Navy ships anywhere within their theater of operations. A national security cutter may lack the heavy firepower to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a modern warship, but it has everything it needs to target an enemy vessel and call in a strike from a friendly naval vessel. In essence, the US Coast Guard is responsible for the coasts and various waterways of the United States. In a war, they can supplement the US Navy and ensure that any enemy combatant entering or even approaching American territorial waters or those of Canada or Mexico is quickly engaged by nearby Navy vessels or land-based air power. The US Navy's core mission is pretty much the exact opposite of the Coast Guard, and their primary wartime objective is to ensure that no enemy force ever sets foot on American soil. To achieve this it operates the largest fleet of surface and subsurface vessels anywhere in the world, and the US Navy on its own is more powerful than its next dozen competitors put together. A nation with a rich maritime tradition, the US has long put an emphasis on a strong navy, and it now sees the navy as the primary peacekeeping tool in its toolbox. The US Navy's real mission however is to ensure global stability and flow of free trade figuring that as long as the world was busy trading with itself, it wouldn't want to go to war and disrupt lucrative trade with its neighbors. To this end, the American Navy has a global presence to help reassure weaker powers that their merchant vessels won't be harassed, whether by pirates or hostile foreign nations. Where once tribute was demanded of seagoing vessels by various rogue or national states, today the world enjoys global free trade thanks to the US Navy and its NATO allies. To achieve its objectives, the US Navy operates the largest force of aircraft carriers in the world, totaling at 10 Nimitz-class carriers and one of the brand new Gerald R. Ford class. The naval air power of the American Navy combined with that of the US Marine Corps makes it the second largest air force in the world. These aircraft carriers are themselves supplemented by nine amphibious assault ships, formerly known as amphibious assault carriers. These were typically helicopter carriers equipped with amphibious landing craft but now sport vertical takeoff or short takeoff and landing aircraft. 
10 amphibious transport docks can land hundreds of American troops at any time anywhere in the world within days of hostilities breaking out. And a further two are under construction as tensions with China in the South Pacific rise. A further 12 dock landing ship supplements America's already prodigious amphibious forces. And given that the US has total dominance in its own global hemisphere, it only makes sense that it places so much emphasis on having a navy capable of conducting expeditionary amphibious landings. If you've seen our video on the United States versus the world, then you already know that it's exactly this lack of transport capability that would allow the US Navy to fight the world's navies to a standstill and make an invasion of the Americas impossible. To knock enemy ships out of the water though, the US Navy has a fleet of 22 Ticonderoga class guided missile cruisers, each armed with dozens of various types of missiles, ranging from fleet air defense to anti-ship and even dual purpose. The backbone of the Navy's surface power however comes from its fleet of 67 Arleigh Burke class destroyers and two Zumwalt stealth destroyers currently deployed. These ships do exactly as their name implies and are the heaviest surface combatants since the retirement of battleships by the world's navies. Prowling under the waves all around the world is the deadliest submarine fleet in the world. With 35 Los Angeles attack subs, 3 Seawolf class subs, 15 Virginia class subs, and 14 Ohio class subs. While its anti-submarine capabilities severely atrophied after the end of the Cold War, the US still fields the most advanced subs in the world, and are considered just as stealthy as new diesel electric subs being fielded today by smaller navies. Unlike diesel electric subs though, nuclear submarines offer a far greater endurance and allow the US Navy to engage enemies far from home and threaten hostile fleets in their own territorial waters. The US Coast Guard and the US US Navy could be seen as two branches on the same tree, but have markedly different mission sets. While both in peacetime and war, the services lend aid to each other and support each other's missions, ultimately the US Navy is considered the bigger cousin, and it's likely that in another major conflict the Coast Guard would once more fall under the Navy's jurisdiction. This video was made possible by Wix. If you are ready to create a website, head over to wix.com slash go slash infographics to try out one of their premium plans right now. Since the end of World War II, the US and Britain have been close allies, supporting each other through countless minor and major conflicts. But how do the navies of these two nations compare? That's what we'll find out in this episode of the Infographic Show, US Navy versus British Royal Navy. At the height of its power, Great Britain ruled over an empire so large that it was famously said the sun never set on it. Through a powerful navy, this small island nation exerted its influence across the globe, remaining on top of the world order for hundreds of years. The US, by comparison, has historically fielded a much smaller navy, though its stunning victories have become maritime legend. After World War II, with the decline of the old powers, the US invested heavily in its navy and quickly became the premier naval power of the modern age. So how do the two navies stack up against each other today? After the grueling wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, both nations are facing problems in the manpower department. For the Royal Navy though, this has meant the mothballing of two of its most powerful ships due to a lack of qualified personnel. Though its 2020 plans call for a force of 82,000 sailors, it's highly unlikely Britain will achieve this goal as it currently only holds 32,000 seamen on active duty with 3,000 in reserve. By comparison, the US Navy fields a force of over 319,000 active duty personnel with almost 100,000 in their reserves. However, though the US has not suffered from a loss of ships due to a lack of personnel, its sailors, many of whom have been on rotating six-month deployments for over a decade, are facing historic rates of low morale and deployment fatigue. While the Royal Navy has new ships in construction, it has also faced severe cutbacks to its budget, which has reduced the number of total ships in its inventory to 73, of which only 30 are combat ships, with the rest being support or patrol craft. The US, meanwhile, has increased the budget of its navy, and not only has a new generation of ships coming online, but it's actively increasing the size of its inventory. As it stands, the American navy fields a force of 284 ships, of which 160 are combat ships, though new budgets call for a total force of 308 total hulls by the mid-2020s. As the vanguards of any modern navy, the aircraft carrier is arguably the single most important ship in any fleet. The US currently operates 10 Nimitz-class supercarriers, with two of its next-generation Ford-class supercarriers coming online soon, and six more in acquisitions. US Nimitz supercarriers are the largest warships ever built, at a length of 1,092 feet and a total displacement of over 100,000 long tons. Each supercarrier hosts an air wing of 90 aircraft, though unlike any other navy, American carrier air wings comprise a total strike package of fighter, strike aircraft, 
early warning, electronic warfare, and airborne refueling aircraft, making each supercarrier a mini air force onto its own. Through its carrier air wings alone, the US maintains a force of 900 total aircraft. The British Royal Navy fields only a single aircraft carrier, the HMS Queen Elizabeth, though a second Queen Elizabeth class carrier is currently under construction and expected to be operational in 2020. As the largest ship ever built for the Royal Navy, the Queen Elizabeth comes up shy of its American cousins at 920 feet and a displacement of 64,000 long tons. It is equipped with 40 total aircraft to include dual-purpose fighter strike aircraft and airborne refueling. However, due to a lack of arresting gear and catapult launch systems, the Queen Elizabeth can only launch Stovall, or short takeoff and vertical landing aircraft, which places a severe restriction on the size of a weapons package each plane can be equipped with versus an American plane. As the second most important element of a modern Navy, submarines make up a sizable portion of a naval complement. The Royal Navy currently fields 10 total subs, with 6 guided missile submarines and 4 nuclear ballistic missile submarines. Of its attack subs, 3 are of its new, modern, astute class, and 3 of the older, though still formidable, Trafalgar class. The United States, by comparison, deploys a total of 66 submarines, of which 52 are nuclear-powered attack subs and 14 are nuclear ballistic missile submarines. Of its attack subs, 34 are of the aging Cold War-era Los Angeles class, which, along with the three Seawolf class still in service, are being replaced by the next-generation Virginia class, of which 15 are already in service. Destroyers make up the bulk of a Navy's surface warfare component, with the flexibility to provide both fleet defensive and offensive capabilities. The US currently has 67 destroyers, of which 65 are of the Arleigh Burke class, the first ship designed around the formidable Aegis combat system. In service since 1988, the US Navy plans a future purchase of 24 more ships upgraded to the Type 3 variant. This leaves it with two of three planned Zumwalt class destroyers, with any future purchases cancelled. Though currently the stealthiest surface ship in the world, the Zumwalt class has been plagued with cost overruns and a lack of mission focus. This lack of focus, combined with the cancellation of specialized ammunition for its main cannon, which would have cost a whopping $800,000 a shell, has prompted America's Congress to cancel development of more ships, though the high-tech lessons learned have already been incorporated into future ship designs. The Royal Navy currently operates only six destroyers of the Daring class. Replacing the Sheffield class, the Darings are primarily focused on anti-aircraft and anti-missile roles, leaving them with a lack of anti-ship or land strike capability versus the American Arleigh Burks. However, their focus on anti-air and anti-missile missions has many defense industry experts on both sides of the Atlantic considering them the best air defense ships in the world. Unfortunately, the future of Britain's destroyer fleet is in serious question, as originally 12 Daring class destroyers were planned for procurement, only to have the number drop to 8, and then to finally only the 6 currently in service. The designation of cruiser, or frigate, has varied in meaning over time and across navies. It was originally the designation for scout and patrol ships during the Age of Sail, and today it fits a niche that blurs the lines between different classes of ships. Modern cruisers sit somewhere between the roles that World War II destroyers offered as anti-aircraft and anti-submarine support, and a battleship's capabilities to hit surface ships and land targets. Of the cruiser designation, the Royal Navy currently operates 13 ships of the Type 23 or Duke class. Originally designed to counter Russian subs in the North Atlantic, the Type 23 still remains primarily an anti-submarine ship, though it has shown great versatility in air defense and land attack roles over the last three decades. Equipped with only eight American-made Harpoon anti-ship missiles though, Type 23 ships remain dependent on other escorts for protection from enemy surface ships. The Americans, meanwhile, operate 22 Ticonderoga-class cruisers. At a displacement of 9,600 long tons, the Ticonderogas are twice the size of their British counterparts, though this is due to their multi-role design. Equipped with Tomahawk cruise missiles, a Ticonderoga can strike targets on land or other ships while simultaneously defending against incoming air or missile threats with its SM-2 and longer range and more advanced SM-6 missiles. Unlike the Royal Navy's Daring class, the American Ticonderogas are also equipped with the RIM-161 Standard Missile 3, a high-speed and long-range missile developed exclusively to destroy incoming ballistic missiles, though in the mid-2000s, the US Navy demonstrated an ability to destroy enemy satellites with it as well. With over three times the number of ships and personnel, the US Navy is significantly larger than the British Royal Navy. On the whole, American ships are better equipped to handle a variety of threats, making a single American ship more threatening to a potential adversary than its British counterpart. 
Yet British naval planning has for decades been focused on augmenting the capabilities of their close American allies, not countering them. American and British forces have for a long time trained and operated together, yet it is their navies which are more intimately linked than any other branch of the armed forces. With its commitments to deterring aggression in the North Atlantic from a resurgent Russia, and Chinese military expansionism in the South China Sea, the US Navy may be the most formidable force on the high seas, but it would find itself hard-pressed to conduct its global mission of keeping the high seas free and open to all without its partnerships with close allies such as the British Royal Navy. Imagine you've enlisted in the US Navy and are stationed at a classified naval base. You're patrolling the docks when suddenly you see something jump out of the water. You can't quite make out what the animal is, but it looked like a big fish. You squint through the sunlight reflecting off the water, and all of a sudden an enemy diver is thrown out of the water and onto the dock. You look wide-eyed and confused at the enemy laying there at your feet. How did he get here, you wonder? Then you peer over the edge of the dock and see a dolphin swimming around in the water. Your commanding officer comes out from the base smiling and stands next to you. I'd like to introduce you to your new partner, he says, pointing to the dolphin. My new partner? You say, looking a little shocked. Your CO informs you that your new assignment is to protect the naval base at all costs. The only possible way to do this is to work closely with your new dolphin partner. The dolphin makes a series of clicking noises and does a backflip. Your commanding officer puts his hand on your shoulder and says, I think he likes you. This is going to be interesting, you respond. What do I call him? The CO looks at you straight in the eyes and with a smirk says, The dolphin's call sign is Big Tuna. You and Big Tuna go through training together. The dolphin receives meals of fresh herring and mackerel several times a day. You are stuck with standard issue rations. Sometimes you think Big Tuna eats better than you, but if you try to steal his fish, he sprays you with water and creates sounds very similar to laughter. He is too smart for his own good, but you guys bond and form a close relationship. You teach Big Tuna different commands and signals using whistles and hand gestures. His dolphin ears are fine-tuned to hear and locate sounds underwater, so communication is almost always possible no matter how deep he goes. Through positive reinforcement and fishy rewards, your dolphin partner learns enough commands to practically have a full-blown conversation. He always knows exactly what to do on a mission. Big Tuna and you become inseparable. You are the most valuable assets of the secret naval base. You've been training hard and waiting to be assigned your first off-base mission. Big Tuna has been trained well, and his echolocation makes him a vital asset to the team. He can locate objects underwater with ease and identify all types of objects. He can even distinguish between different types of metal. Then it happens, you and Big Tuna receive your first assignment. The Navy suspects that there are underwater mines just outside of the base perimeter. It's your responsibility to help Big Tuna locate and deactivate the underwater mines. Marine biologists that work closely with the Navy have reported that dolphins are much more effective at locating mines than any machine. They can use their echolocation to locate and identify mines without ever coming into contact with them. Your squad takes a boat to the suspected mine location. Big Tuna swims alongside the vessel until you reach the danger zone. You give Big Tuna the signal to locate a metal spherical object and he dives underwater to use his echolocation to pinpoint his target. A few minutes go by and your partner resurfaces. He makes clicking noises signaling he has located a mine. Good job, Big Tuna, you say. You hand him a small explosive to attach to the mine. He swims to the target with the disarmament explosive in his mouth. Then carefully, your dolphin partner attaches the explosive to the mine. Big Tuna swims back up to the boat. You signal him to jump in. After he's secured in the boat, you zoom away. Once at a safe distance, you detonate the small explosive, thus neutralizing the mine. Mission accomplished. You get a couple days R&R with Big Tuna, but then the Big Brass sends orders down the pipeline. Your next mission is to salvage and recover a lost experimental submarine. The Navy has lost contact with the prototype about 25 clicks from the base. You learned in basic training that a click is one kilometer. Not too far, but far enough that Big Tuna will have to ride in the boat with you, until you reach the last known location of the lost submersible. You load Big Tuna into the saltwater-filled tank on the boat. He gets secured into a harness to ensure he's comfortable, and any jolting of the boat doesn't cause him to crash into the sides of the tank. You reach the target location, and your dolphin partner is released into the open waters of the ocean. Big Tuna looks at you for instructions, and you give the commands for search and rescue using hand gestures. The dolphin shakes his head up and down to show that he understands, and then dives in. After 8 minutes, you get a little worried that Big Tuna hasn't resurfaced yet. Dolphins on average can only hold their breath for 10 minutes, but that's pushing it. Then your partner pops his head out of the water. He clicks and jumps, signaling that he's located the lost submersible and to follow him. You steer the boat toward where Big Tuna is headed. You reach the location and attach a harness with a camera mounted on it to your partner. 
Big Tuna dives down into the murky depths. You watch the camera feed on the monitors aboard the boat. The picture fades, but the light on the camera eventually kicks in. When the image focuses, you can see the lost submersible on the screen. Big Tuna has done it again. The submersible is recovered, and you return to base for a cold beer and some fresh sushi. The beer is for you, and the sushi for the dolphin. Your missions have been so successful with your partner that you're both promoted. You've made it to the big leagues. You now lead the team responsible for patrolling and defending the harbor from enemy spies and saboteurs. You knew that your missions were going well, but not this well. You've heard of elite teams of dolphins who protect naval installations along the coast of California, but those are the best of the best. You can't believe that you and Big Tuna have accomplished so much in such a short time. You remember hearing a story from a friend in San Diego about a training exercise that pitted a Navy SEAL against one of the trained dolphins. The soldier was tasked with attempting to infiltrate a harbor with a fake mine. The elite soldier was the best the Navy had to offer. Everyone was sure he would sneak by the dolphin. But on all five attempts to infiltrate the harbor and plant the fake mine, the dolphin stopped him. Seals are no match for dolphins. The base you're protecting is a big deal. It's a matter of national security that no enemies gain access to its secrets. You and Big Tuna are vigilant, but you know an attempt to infiltrate the base is imminent. The first time you catch someone trying to gain access to the base, you handle it in a discreet manner. Big Tuna has sighted the target, but does not engage. Instead, he keeps his distance, but tracks the enemy. The diver swims closer to the base, and that's when the dolphin signals it's time for action. He heads back to the boat where you've been waiting and informs you through clicks and body movements that it's time to attack. Big Tuna leads the armored patrol boat to the enemy location, and once the signal's given, the dolphin swims away to safety. The Navy boat drops depth charges and grenades into the water surrounding the spy. Explosions erupt from the depths, and water sprays into the air. After the water settled, Big Tuna is sent back in for reconnaissance. He resurfaces and gives you the signal, target destroyed. It wasn't long before the enemy attempts to infiltrate the harbor of the top secret base again. This time, you and your dolphin compatriot want to send a clear message. No one messes with your base. The enemy has sent a squad of three highly skilled divers to try and sneak into the base. Big Tuna quickly identifies all of the incoming targets with his echolocation. The clicks and high-pitched noises travel through the water at the speed of sound. When they come in contact with the enemy divers, the sound waves bounce back and return to the dolphin's highly sensitive ears. Using echolocation allows Big Tuna to identify the exact size, shape, and distance of the enemy divers. Your dolphin partner signals there are enemies in the vicinity. You prepare to engage, but before you can move, Big Tuna signals that he'll handle this one on his own. You're hesitant, but you trust your partner. You've heard some accounts of dolphins immobilizing divers in training missions using their rostrum, sometimes called a nose or a snout. Big Tuna dives deep and swims toward his targets. The unknowing enemies are taken by surprise. The dolphin rams his rostrum into the first diver's abdomen. The breath is knocked out of him and he floats to the surface. You intercept the enemy with your boat and lock him up. Big Tuna circles back and targets the respirator of the second diver. He uses his tail to knock the diver off balance, then grabs the tube that connects the breathing apparatus to the air tank. He pulls the device apart. The second enemy diver frantically swims to the surface while you're waiting for him. His head pops out of the water and he gasps for air. When he calms down, you capture him and lock him up with his comrade. Two down, one to go. Big Tuna circles around for the final target. He grabs the final enemy diver by the dive fin that carries him through the water, and he pulls the enemy diver to the surface right in front of your boat. You signal for Big Tuna to let go. He follows your orders immediately, and the enemy is hoisted onto the boat with the other conspirators. All enemies are brought back to the base for interrogation. Your team has been so successful that you're given a special mission. You're to escort a special envoy on a diplomatic mission. A lot of enemy powers want to see the mission fail, so that it's imperative that your boat is well protected. Big Tuna swims alongside the boat, making sure that the surrounding area is clear of enemies. The camera mounted on his vest relays video to the onboard command center. While aboard the envoy, your commanding officer informs you that this isn't the first time dolphins have escorted ships through dangerous waters. Dolphins were used during the tanker war in the Iran-Iraq war, where oil tankers were targeted by enemy opposition. Dolphins were deployed during the war to protect the ships in harbors and along dangerous routes. Dolphins have traveled the world to ensure the safety of military assets. Dolphins like Big Tuna even helped provide security for the Republican National Convention in 1996. The convention took place at the San Diego Convention Center right on the Pacific Ocean. The precautions were in response to the bombing at the Summer Olympics in Atlanta in 1996. The US military was leaving nothing to chance. 
and the Navy Dolphins were the best ocean security guards possible. There have been rumors floating around among your friends that dolphins are dangerous and used to kill divers who wandered too close to naval base. You explain this is all simply not true. But what about the dolphins with lasers attached to their heads, a friend asks. You reassure them that there has never been any laser death rays attached to dolphins. How about the accounts of nuclear devices being attached to dolphins and then detonated when they reach their target, asks another friend. Again, there's no evidence for this claim. You ask the friend, wouldn't you have heard about the nuclear explosion if that were the case? Well, surely you've heard the reports of dolphins being outfitted with compressed gas needles that they jam into an enemy soldier's body. This would create an air bubble in the victim's veins or arteries, and that would be carried to vital organs and would kill the diver almost immediately. You tell this person that there is no evidence that dolphins were ever fitted with such a device, nor would they need to be when they could just drag the enemy diver to the surface to be captured and questioned by the US Navy. You and Big Tuna carry out many missions during your time together. You've disarmed underwater mines, located and rescued lost equipment, protected your base from enemy divers, and escorted ships through dangerous waters. Your career together has been successful and rewarding. It's no wonder that once the Navy started using dolphins in the 1960s, they never stopped. Dolphins are intelligent, extremely fast, and can use their echolocation to identify objects from great distances with precision. They also form bonds with their trainers, which is why when you and Big Tuna retired, you bought a place on the coast of Florida where you and your partner can spend your days relaxing and swimming around the warm Atlantic waters. Trapped at the bottom of the Barents Sea, distraught Russian Navy personnel are in a fight to survive as one catastrophe follows another on board their embattled submarine. Each of those men is faced with unimaginable terror. As time passes, the highest echelons of Russian officialdom will lie through their teeth and exhibit startling ineptitude. This will become one of the hardest periods in Vladimir Putin's entire life, and that's saying something. The story begins on August 10, 2000, when the Russian nuclear submarine K-141 Kursk was engaged in naval exercises in the Barents Sea. The Kursk belonged to the Oscar II-class submarine commissioned during the height of the Cold War, designed to take out large enemy ships or aircraft carriers. The Oscar II was powered by an OK-650 nuclear reactor, giving it 97,990 shipboard horsepower and a speed of up to 33 knots when fully submerged. On board, each sub carried 24 P-700 granite missiles, which NATO had given the name SSN-19 Shipwreck. Shipwreck, indeed. These things were 33 feet long, weighing 15,400 pounds, capable of Mach 1.6 speeds, with a range of 388 miles. They could carry conventional high-explosive warheads, but also a 500 kiloton warhead, enough to turn any American ship to dust. These subs were a grand achievement for the Soviets and a major threat to the US Navy. The Kursk was first launched post-Cold War in 1994, but due to a lack of funds for fuel, it rarely saw any action, despite it being one of Russia's most outstanding military machines. The Kursk was so big, as long as two jumbo jets, that there were staterooms for each senior officer. The crew, who back then were paid peanuts if they were paid at all, could enjoy a gymnasium. Although unlike the giant Typhoon class, there was no sauna or solarium for those long deployments beneath the sea. Still, the Kursk was a massive piece of machinery, complete with ten separate compartments that could be separated in case something awful should happen. Like the Titanic, the Kursk was called unsinkable, but also, like the Titanic, it definitely was sinkable. In 1999, it was deployed in the Mediterranean Sea with the task of monitoring the United States Sixth Fleet that was responding to the crisis in Kosovo at the time. But for the most part, the Kursk remained unemployed, which meant time gathering dust and crews unable to gain experience on it. In 2000, the Kursk was once again asked to perform. That was after a decade out of action, not counting that short Kosovo deployment. It was time to take part in a large-scale naval exercise, which the Russians named the Summer X Exercise the biggest naval exercise for many years, costing millions of dollars. It would include 30 Russian ships, including the aircraft carrier Admiral Kuznetsov and the battlecruiser Pyotr Velikitya. Unknown to the Russians, monitoring the exercise were two American submarines, the SS Toledo and the SS Memphis, along with US surface ships and US and Norwegian aircraft monitoring from the skies. The crew on the Kursk was said to be the best in Russia's northern fleet manning a submarine that was fully armed with granite missiles and torpedoes and was to make a simulated attack on the Kuznetsov. There were no nuclear weapons on board, however. The Kursk's personnel consisted of Captain First Rank Genady Pili Chen, along with 111 crew members. 
five officers of the 7th SSGN Division Headquarters, and two designers. The first day, the 10th, went fine. The Kursk launched a granite missile armed with a dummy warhead. The mission was a success. On the 12th, the plan was to launch more dummy torpedoes, but this time at the Vilekia. At about 8.51 am, from the flagship Peter the Great, Fleet Admiral Vlicheslav Popov, commander of the Northern Fleet, radioed the Kursk to fire the torpedo. The last word Popov said was, good. The launch was good to go. That was the last time the Kursk radioed anyone, although it wouldn't be the last communication from the Kursk. At 11.28 am, there was an explosion. The USS Memphis, still monitoring the exercise, picked up the explosion, which was soon followed by a second larger explosion. The explosions rocked the entire exercise area, especially the second one. Our Norwegian seismic monitoring station recorded both. The Piero Vilekia, the 28,000-ton battlecruiser, shook at its rudder. That second explosion had measured a 4.2 on the Richter scale, so it was in fact recorded all over Europe. It was about 250 times more powerful than the initial explosion, powerful enough that seismic stations in Canada and Alaska also recorded the shockwave. The Russian submarine, the Karelia, was also monitoring the exercise and felt the shockwaves. It was obvious to the Americans and the Norwegians that something serious had happened, but for the moment the Russians weren't overly concerned. The shockwaves were reported to top military brass, but at first these reports were ignored. There was radio silence, but Popov, who was accustomed to breakdowns of communications equipment, wasn't worried just yet. As time passed and radio silence remained, his concern grew. The Northern Fleet Headquarters sent another radio message to Kursk, report your coordinates and operations. No answer. The Russians then dispatched a helicopter to see if the submarine had arisen to the surface, but reported back negative. At 6.30 pm, the Russians set up a search and rescue post. Soon after, two IL-38 searching aircraft were also dispatched, returning sometime later to the airfield, having not seen anything. The Russians still had no idea what had happened, but they were now more than a bit concerned. Captain Alexander Teslenko, who was in charge of Russia's search and rescue mission, ordered the Mikhail Rudnitsky to be dispatched to look for the Kursk. This was a 20-year-old lumber carrier that had been converted for submersible rescue operations. The Rudnitsky was equipped with two AS-32 and AS-34 Priz class deep submergence rescue vehicles. The ship was also carrying a diving bell, lifting cranes, and gear for underwater rescues. But importantly, it wasn't equipped with specialized stabilizers that could keep it in position in stormy weather. As luck would have it, the weather was about to make a turn for the worst, and the Rudnitsky was not up for the job. We can call this mistake number one, although in all honesty mistakes had been made long before the Kursk was put out to sea. The Russians actually had two India-class rescue submarines, and each of those had small rescue submarines capable of reaching a depth of 2,275 feet. But back in 1995, these were put out of action. They were waiting for repairs in St. Petersburg at the time of the disaster. This was post-Cold War, when Russia's finances were extremely tight. It wasn't until 10.30 p.m that the Northern Fleet declared an emergency. It was only then that the naval exercise was properly shut down. Around 20 ships belonging to the Northern Fleet, including about 3,000 sailors, were tasked with search efforts. All of this was fastidiously recorded. One log tells us, 7 p.m., 0.8 kilograms of delicacy canned food, cod liver in its own juice, was issued to the officer's war room. Rescuers started watching artistic videos. It was only the next morning at about 7 am that Popov had told the Kremlin that they had a possible catastrophe on their hands. The vessel had been found on the seabed, but it wasn't certain if the men were alive in it. The Minister of Defense Igor Sergeyev told Vladimir Putin that Sunday morning, but informed the new boss that he shouldn't go to the disaster site. This is where things got strange. The Russian Navy commander Admiral Vladimir Kuryodev said at one point that there had been signs of a big and serious collision. Kuryodev later admitted the chances for a positive outcome are not very high. But collided with what exactly? The US Department of Defense, which as you know had been monitoring the exercise, stated that there was no indication that a US vessel was involved in the accident. The US believed there had been an explosion, but it couldn't be ascertained what had caused it. Even though the Russians knew this was now potentially a large-scale catastrophe, Popov spoke to the public that Sunday and called the mission a resounding success. He almost certainly knew at the time that something resoundingly cataclysmic had happened. In reports that followed, the public heard that there had been some minor technical difficulties, but everyone on board is alive. No one knew that, however. 
Like Chernobyl many years earlier, the Russian bigwigs were keeping this under wraps for as long as possible. It was only on Monday that the Russians publicly admitted that the Kursk was in serious trouble, but even then, the families of the men on the ship were not told anything that resembled the truth. They were also told that the accident happened on Sunday when it happened on Saturday. Attempts to reach the sub were aborted many times. At this point, the Americans as well as France, Germany, Israel, Italy, Norway, and Britain all believed something grave had happened. When they contacted the Russians, they were told the rescue was going fine. Russia refused any assistance. The Russian public certainly didn't want to hear about this, as 118 fine young men were potentially sitting on the seabed 354 feet down. The weather got even worse, so the search was hampered by poor visibility. There was still some hope, although by now the wives and relatives of the men were hearing horrible rumors. They weren't getting the truth from the government or the navy, but word was getting around that their loved ones on that sub were never coming back. The news was getting out to Russian journalists, who were using every trick in the book to get their story, bribing officials and even pretending to be part of a rescue team. The families kept being told that all attempts to save the men were being made, but what they weren't being informed about is that many attempts to get the sub were being botched. The equipment wasn't good enough for the job. The bad weather was also playing a big part in making things much harder. At times, the diving bell was thrown around by powerful undersea currents. Things went from bad to worse. One time, one of the rescue vehicles was broken when it was being loaded back into the ship. It was a nightmare scenario for all involved. On further attempts, even when they could get to the sub, they couldn't attach the diving bell. Time was running out. It was estimated that the men on the submarine could possibly have enough air until the 18th. That's what the families heard, but later they were told differently, that the men could survive longer. It was on the 18th that the British and Norwegians were finally allowed to join the search. The family still had no idea what was going on. Sometimes reports stated that the crew was sending SOS messages by tapping on the sub. Hearing the little taps of SOS messages were coming from the Kursk was about the best news relatives had in days. But were those knocking sounds men or something hitting the sub from the outside? On the 19th, the Norwegian ship named the Normand Pioneer arrived on the scene carrying the British rescue submarine LR-5. Both the Norwegians and the British complained that the Russians were making their job harder. Vice Admiral E. Skorgen of the Norwegian Navy told a newspaper, from time to time the information given to the Norwegian side was so inauthentic that it threatened the safety of the divers. At one point, the Russians discharged the Brits from the operation altogether, which Paddy Heron of the British team said was repugnant. The Russians were still embracing the secrecy of the Cold War in the year 2000, yet the relatives of the crew heard nothing of this. The Russians said the Brits and Norwegians were making the job impossible. The mood changed on Monday, August 21st at 7.45 a.m. when a Norwegian rescuer opened the upper door of an emergency hatch. He saw no people in the airlock. At 1 p.m., the hatch of the airlock was opened. The sub was completely flooded, and when the divers opened one of the compartments, they found dead bodies scattered everywhere. There were no signs of life anywhere they looked as they checked other compartments. Admiral Popov and Vice Admiral Skorgen had to accept the truth. Everyone was dead. At 9 p.m. that night, the military council of the Northern Fleet officially reported the loss of all the crew. The families were informed. Wives and children wept, but many were angered on how this whole operation had gone down. What they'd been told didn't make sense. Popov appeared on Russian TV and took off his cap, telling the cameras, forgive me for not saving your sailors. It still wasn't exactly certain who had died on the sub. Not all the names had been announced, although sneaky journalists bribed officials again and soon the names appeared on TV. The Russian Federation asked Norway for further help with the removal of the sailors' bodies. The bodies of the dead were to be removed through eight special holes that were made in the hull. Norway's Stolt offshore company signed a contract for between five to seven million dollars, because this was not going to be an easy operation. While they were in mourning, the relatives of the deceased heard more lies. Most of them were soon taken by the passenger ship Klavdia Yelenskaya to the scene of the incident and informed that absolutely all of the information and the condition of the site was made available to foreign specialists. That wasn't true in the least. The question was, had those foreigners been tasked with a job earlier, would they have found living humans on that sub? Had Russia's stalling cost lives? If it had, the Russian public would have crucified the military as well as the government. Military bigwigs were accused of incompetence. Instead of offering apologies, one of the generals called the journalists traitorous and the Navy personnel who'd spoken to them scum. This was a bad time for Russia and for Putin. 
In a poll, 60% of Russians said the disaster hadn't changed their support for him, but 27.8% said the disaster had diminished their support for him. Losing almost a third of your voter base in a matter of days isn't exactly great for a political leader. Putin soon discovered that his own military had misled him, something he would take out on them in the weeks to come. For now, he had to save his own face, and he did that by offering what the US reported was an unprecedented compensation package to the close relatives of the deceased. This amounted to an apartment and 720,000 rubles, or $26,000. All of the dead were honored with the Order of Valor, while victims got other goodies such as free telephone services and electricity. This was exceedingly generous, given the men were on about $600 a month, and as we mentioned before, many of them hadn't been paid in a while. Even with his public relations save, Putin struggled to wipe the pie from his face. Russia looked bad in the eyes of the world. He looked bad. The military looked totally incompetent. No amount of free phone calls was going to clean up this mess. Some of the widows were suspicious of the kindness. One widow told the press, We get a lot more than Chechen widows, ten times more. The Russian government doesn't give money out like that for nothing. There must be something they're trying to hide. They must feel guilty. Indeed. That question again emerged. Could those men have survived if the Russian Navy hadn't been so incompetent, or their equipment had been better, or more importantly, had Russia allowed the UK and Norway to help earlier in the rescue? Just how fast had those guys died, and what had killed them exactly? Just before we tell you this, you should know that what people were saying had happened prior to an official investigation. Of course, there were some wild theories in Russia and also in the West. The main hypothesis was a collision, and less so, the sub hitting a World War II era mine. Russian officials clung to the collision theory. Some other officials wondered if NATO had struck the sub. And the odd armchair expert believed that a mass poisoning on board or a new secret Russian weapon hitting the submarine led to the disaster. Some even speculated that it was a UFO attack. It seemed Russia was going with the collision story at first. On August 24, the Russian main office of military prosecutor started proceedings against whoever had caused the accident. This was according to a Clause 263.3 of the Russian Criminal Code, which related to violation of safety traffic regulations on railway, air or water lines, entailed on carelessness, death of two or more persons. Guilty parties could be sent to prison for four to ten years. The officials involved in these proceedings were all under the hammer, so it suited them that a collision rather than equipment faults and their incompetence had killed those men. The worst thing about this investigation was that they led it, their own hand-picked team. Outside investigators were persona non grata. It was high stakes for President Putin, too, faced with what the Washington Post called the first major political crisis of his presidency. These were the days when the US media actually liked Putin, a man some said that the US could do business with. For Putin, only four months into his presidency, this was life or death. He'd been roundly criticized for choosing to stay at a seaside resort at the start of the chaos, a public relations nightmare for a president when your country's in the middle of a disaster. When Putin did finally meet with about 350 relatives of the crew, journalists were not invited. Although some pretended to be relatives, many of the real relatives screamed at him, their eyes filled with tears and their mouths firing off every curse word under the Russian sun. It looked as though they were going to beat the hell out of him. They screamed, who killed our boys? Who will be punished? Putin was under some serious pressure. One woman, Nadezhda Tylik, who was the mother of Kursk submariner Lieutenant Sergei Tylik, was absolutely enraged. She screamed at Putin and the other officials, you better shoot yourselves now, we won't let you live. A nurse then sneaked up behind her and injected her with a sedative. This also became a controversy for Putin. At first, Nadezhda's husband claimed he'd ask the nurse to do that because she, his wife, was prone to excessive emotions. A few months later, Nadezhda told the truth. She said her husband had lied. He hadn't asked anyone for help. The nurse was part of the official gang. Nadezhda told the press, the injection was done to shut my mouth. Immediately after it, I just lost the ability to speak and was carried out. She later told the St. Petersburg Times that Putin did not know how to respond to their questions. She added, they told us lies the whole time, and even now, we're unable to get any information. The Western media picked up on the incident, saying it harkened back to the Cold War days. The Russian response was that it was nothing out of the ordinary. Regarding the Cold War-style injection, the Times newspaper in Britain was told by Russian officials, we are simply protecting the relatives from undue pain. It was for her own protection. 
A Russian journalist later explained the likely reason why they knocked out Nadezhda. He said, I honestly thought that they would tear him, Putin, apart. There was such a heavy atmosphere there, such a lot of hatred, despair, and pain. I never felt anything like it anywhere in my entire life. Much of the Russian media knew something was amiss, and many newspapers weren't afraid to say it. The Russian newspaper Izvestia wrote, Lies and fears are the features of the Russian authority. When people's lives are involved, admirals, generals, and government officials should not lie, dodge, and think about their own career. This is blasphemy. The officials even took flack from retired Russian military bigwigs, one of whom, Yevgeny Ashnabayev, said, It's become a form of theater. This is a performance for the whole world. Even though a Norwegian company had been contracted to get the dead out of there, the Russians told him that after they drilled the hole in the sub, only Russian divers were allowed inside. This suited the Russian officials, of course. When those Russian divers finally got inside the sub, they did so through compartment 9, although it was difficult to see as there was so much ash in the water. The Russians gradually worked their way through several compartments, greeted on their way by badly burned bodies. This didn't look like a collision. Russian officials were still selling the story that there'd been some sort of collision. They said the vessel had plummeted to the seabed, and everyone had pretty much died immediately. Some officials entertained the narrative that the collision had been with a NATO spying submarine. A few of them stuck with this tale for years after the accident, given that anti-Western propaganda was how they stayed in their job. But once the Russian divers found 12 bodies in compartment 9, they knew this had been no collision and the instant death of everyone. Those brave men in the compartment had not died straight away. They'd made their way to that compartment, but how long they were alive after the initial event was the question. Some said three days, which would mean they could have been rescued had the foreign teams been able to help earlier. The investigations went on for years, filling 133 volumes. The relatives were then told something that started to sound more like the truth, something that refuted the story that the men had survived more than a few hours in compartment 9. They were informed that the crew had tried to load a dummy torpedo for the training exercise, but a problem with the weld on the torpedo had led to a leak of high test peroxide, which created an explosion. The torpedo manufacturer said outright that there was no way this could have happened. Still, that's the story that the Russian investigators stuck with, and it's the one that does make the most sense to anyone familiar with the story. They said the explosion started a fire and destroyed the bulkhead between the first and second compartments. They said this killed everyone in the control room or at least severely injured them. The much bigger second explosion was caused by five to seven torpedo warheads going off as a result of the first explosion. The sailors people heard had blown themselves up. This second explosion completely wrecked the compartments and tore a massive hole in the hull. The nuclear reactors, it was said, shut down without any problems. Just about everyone was already dead after explosion two, but 23 men managed to get to compartment nine where they did indeed survive, but only for about six more hours, not a matter of days. It was said the oxygen they were breathing was depleted, so they tried to change to a potassium superoxide chemical oxygen cartridge, but it somehow fell into the oily water and that blew up. Some more men were killed instantly, while others either died in the resulting fire or suffocated due to the fire consuming all of their oxygen. The only surviving notes from the sub were found in compartment nine. Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Kolesnikov wrote in one note, It's 1315. All personnel from Section 6, 7, and 8 have moved to Section 9. 23 people are here. We feel bad, weakened by carbon dioxide. Pressure is increasing in the compartment. If we head for the surface, we won't survive the compression. None of us can escape. Two hours later, he wrote, It's dark here to write, but I'll try by feel. It seems like there are no chances, 10 to 20 percent. Let's hope that at least someone will read this. Here's the list of personnel from the other sections who are now in the ninth and will attempt to get out. Regards to everyone, no need to despair. Kolesnikov. Russia's Izvestia newspaper reported that a note written inside a novel that was wrapped in plastic was found in the pocket of the deceased Lieutenant Commander Rashid Aryapov. The Russian rescue crew said the newspaper had taken the note when it was hoovering up secret documents. Part of it read, faults in the torpedo compartment, namely the explosion of a torpedo on which the Kursk had to carry out tests. This didn't, of course, gel with the collision theory the Russian government peddled for so long initially, which explains why the note went missing. So that was the story, but as you can imagine, it didn't exactly make the families of the dead men feel any better. They all asked what the BBC asked at the time. 
Why was the state-of-the-art nuclear submarine designed to withstand the full wrath of an enemy fleet so easily destroyed by a practice torpedo, which didn't even have a warhead? And why had the torpedo, which was apparently leaking explosive fuel, not been checked properly? The northern Russian fleet admitted that some mistakes had been made. It was time for the government shuffle. Putin transferred Popyov and the fleet commander chief of staff Mikhail Motsak. Igor Sergeyev resigned as Minister of Defense, and he was, for the first time in modern Russian history, replaced with someone not from the military, which apparently appalled other members of the military. Had the young Putin lost faith in his generals? During these shuffles, Putin made a point of saying that the collision theory was not true. Another proponent of that theory was Deputy Prime Minister Ilya Klebanov, who'd been sure a foreign sub had hit the Kursk. Putin demoted him to the Minister of Industry, Science and Technology. Twelve high-ranking military officers got the boot, but in typical authoritarian style, Putin said it had nothing to do with the disaster. The relatives were still furious. They'd heard there'd been stunning breaches of discipline, shoddy, obsolete and poorly maintained equipment, as well as negligence, incompetence and mismanagement. Relatives became even more angered when they heard about the escape capsules on the Kursk, which evidently couldn't have been used. Then, Vice Admiral Valery Ryazantsev said the unsayable when he told the world those men on the sub were barely trained, while the sub had been poorly maintained and inspections had been infrequent, which was likely why the crew made the mistake that led to the initial explosion. The crew had been taught all the maintenance routines that had to happen before firing off a torpedo, but the Kursk hadn't fired one before that fateful day for three whole years. Books were written about the incident and documentaries were made. Even after the official theory had been presented, alternative theories spread through the internet like wildfire. People blamed the two Dagestani weapons specialists on board, saying they were actually Chechen terrorists. Russia was at war with Chechnya at the time of the incident and remained at war until 2009. There were other theories that the Russian government certainly didn't want to be proven true. According to the book Democratic Breakdown and the Decline of the Russian Military, some journalists in the West as well as inside Russia claimed that they had evidence that the Kursk had been blown up after the battlecruiser Peter Velikitya accidentally launched a torpedo at it. The Russian Navy called this an invention, and to this day it seems that's true. Even so, we'll never know for sure what caused the explosions. We know they happened, but we can't be sure why they happened. It could have been mutiny, it could have been an accidental attack. Once the government started lying, the theory started expanding. As that book we just mentioned stated, the dearth of credible information undoubtedly contributed to the many absurd conspiracy theories. In a poll in 2000, 79% of Russians interviewed ticked a box saying the government was hiding the reasons for the tragedy. Only 11% said they were confident the government was telling the truth. It's often said the late, great George Orwell once wrote, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. It's a good quote to end our video with, but accrediting it to Orwell is itself probably part of a conspiracy theory. A platoon of US Navy SEALs gathers around the sparse cover at the base of a hill. The commanding officer receives a last-minute transmission and turns to his men with a grave look on his face. Despite being in almost constant action for the last four days and with only four hours of solid sleep to each man, the orders are in. The SEALs must take the hill. Leaving it in enemy hands would endanger friendly forces elsewhere. With grim determination, the SEALs check and double-check their equipment. They've got a job to do, but as the attack kicks off, the weary men are in for a shock for what awaits them. Machine gun rounds whiz over their heads as artillery drops just meters away. The ear-deafening explosions make them lose track of where they are or where they're going to. The smoke burns their eyes and blurs their vision, but that will not stop them from reaching the enemy position on the hill above. The only problem is getting there. To do so, they must crawl through hundreds of yards of mud and barbed wire, sometimes sinking all the way up to their neck in dirty water or mud. And if that was not enough, they must crawl through over a hundred feet of piping filled with muddy water and possible snakes to get through to the other side. But even if they survive the hundreds of yards of fire-swept barbed wire fields and muddy ditches they must crawl through, the final obstacle is a rope bridge they must cross under fire and ensure that no man is left behind. Despite all these challenges, the men persevere and take the hill with no casualties, the unseen enemy retreating before they could engage in the close combat the SEALs desperately wanted. While this scenario might come straight out of a war movie, it's actually based upon the culminating event of Basic Underwater Demolition School, or BUDS, Hell Week. It's a testament of their combat training so far. It incorporates lessons learned from the entire week, 
while teaching the aspiring SEALs that even when they're the most tired, exhausted, hungry, and weak, the most will be expected out of them. Combat is unforgiving and does not care what they've already gone through. Even though the scenario sounds intense, it actually is just a very small piece of what actually goes on at BUDS throughout the seven months the trainees, affectionately known as tadpoles by their instructors, attend one of the most difficult training programs on the planet. From day one, SEAL instructors are looking to maximize attrition, and for good reason. There's a high probability that today's trainee could be serving alongside an instructor tomorrow in an active duty SEAL team abroad. So while their methods might seem intense, out of the ordinary, or downright sadistic, they all serve the common purpose of crafting some of the world's finest warriors and ensuring those that do not want to be there quit. While that event might seem tough, the entire process from beginning to end is meant to find each trainee's limit and then exceed that every day. Before training even begins, all prospective SEAL candidates must attend what's called INDOC. INDOC is a five-week precursor to BUDS that each person must pass just to begin training. It's here that candidates receive their first taste of the SEAL community. Their days are long and regimented, usually starting at 5 o'clock in the morning and ending 12 hours later. During those 12 hours, they're constantly being pushed physically. Whether it's group runs on the beach wearing boots and oots, also known as camel pants, doing group exercises, swimming for hours in the pool, basic diving, or tackling in the obstacle course, the instructors unleash a full barrage of training to get the most out of their students. While those might sound easy at first, the instructors have a way of making even the simplest of tasks impossibly difficult. For instance, as a part of their swimming qualification, students must learn the practice of downproofing. The purpose of this is to expose students to a variety of controlled and extremist, Latin for the point of death situations, to see how they react. Students must also be able to get to the surface safely if any of their gear fails while on a mission in the water. There are a couple of ways to do this, and one of the most common is having students tie their feet and hands together, then jumping into the pool to free themselves before they pass out. Another way instructors place students in extremists is by purposefully pulling off their diving equipment while in the pool, and then watching as the student clears and replaces it back in working order. Useful for sure, but definitely not for the faint of heart. The terror in the pool does not end there. Another seemingly impossible task is to swim 50 meters underwater. While that might sound easy, it's not uncommon for students to pass out during this evaluation. The obstacle course is another not-so-easy task. There's a wide range of high and low obstacles that require agility, speed, and endurance to conquer, including an almost 60-foot rope tower to climb. Making matters worse is that in BUDS it pays to be a winner, and the weakest students are often punished severely with more exercises and mind games, with the slowest runner of the obstacle course usually being buried up to his neck in the sand by his classmates. While the instructors in INDOC might seem like they're trying to humiliate and beat down the students for no reason, in reality they're beating them down only to build them back up. The best way they do this is by assigning each student a partner known as a swim buddy, which is to remain with him at all times. Each swim buddy cannot be more than several feet away at a time, and if they do, each person risks fear of expulsion from training. This selfless devotion to another is the beginning of creating a coherent team. By indoctrinating students now that at the end of the day all that matters no matter how tired, stressed, or in pain they are is the person beside them, only then can they truly begin to grasp what it means to work in a team. Those that cannot grasp the concept or who psych themselves out now leave the program. Once a prospective SEAL makes it through INDOC, the next most grueling phase begins. The first phase builds upon most of the skills learned in INDOC and pushes trainees past any sort of mental or physical breaking point they might have thought they had before. It's here that the students are first introduced to some of the SEAL pipeline's most legendary challenges. The first challenge they must overcome now and almost every day throughout their training is the infamous PT arena called the Grinder. The Grinder does not look imposing at first. It's merely the asphalt courtyard in between where all the men live in their barracks. One would not even know of its use as an epic training ground minus the various pull-up and dip bars that adorn its sides, but make no mistake, many thousands of men have been made and broken upon it. Each day the men will train on the grinder. Thousands of push-ups, crunches, pull-ups, burpees, and other bodyweight exercises will be done here. But that's not all. Throughout their time here, instructors will continuously spray them with water to ensure their whole time spent here is wet. While this might seem refreshing in the scorching California summers, at night and in the winter it just adds another layer of misery. Speaking of being wet, this is one constant that trainees can count on their entire time at BUDS. 
In fact, the instructors give it an affectionate name, wet and sandy. Whenever a trainee fails to perform or even at an instructor's whim, the men can be forced to run into the surf and roll around to make sure their entire bodies are covered in sand and water. The added discomfort of the gritty sand and the chafing to follow serves as a constant stressor to the environment. The punishment of the first phase goes beyond just expanding the physical torment of Indoc, but the teamwork aspect as well. Now seals are broken up into roughly six-man boat crews to an inflatable small boat, or IBS. The IBS is one of the foundational platforms seals must conquer, since this small, silent craft is what they use to creep up on enemy shorelines across the world. The IBS weighs several hundred pounds, and once seawater and sand are factored in, it feels like it weighs a ton since it's required to be carried over their heads wherever they go. The boat team is expected to work together to accomplish tasks. Those that perform well are usually rewarded with extra rest or warmth, while those that fall behind will face a variety of punishments from before as well as a new one, rock portage. The beaches of Coronado are adorned with hundreds of rocks that jut out menacingly into the shoreline. Often as a punishment or at the direction of the instructors, boat crews are forced to row into the waves by these rocks and get smashed into them as the undertow flips their boats in the air. The punishments here go far beyond just physical though. For those that fall behind or fail to complete the events on time, they're assigned to what's called the Goon Squad. The Goon Squad is the slowest and lowest performing group of candidates in a class. These men are singled out for their extra remediation and punishment workouts that slowly suck their resolve. Here men are usually forced into a downward spiral since the extra time it takes to complete these workouts puts them further behind everyone else still working toward the events of that day. Ultimately, very few men sent to the goon squad will ever regain their place amongst the rest of the class. Further compounding the mental torture is the ever-present bell. The bell sits in the center of the grinder and is a constant reminder that getting out is only three rings of the bell away. Any trainee at any time can walk up to the bell to quit. Doing so ends their misery but closes the door to the SEAL community forever. For those that manage to make it to the end of the first phase, there's one last event remaining that sends a chill down the spine of all who know its name, Hell Week. Hell Week is the culminating event of the first phase. It's a brutal event encompassing a continuous week-long beatdown that tests the mind and body of all those who dare partake in it. The week starts with the men eating a large meal for dinner and then going down to their cots in the tents on the beach. The instructors give them a few frightful hours of sleep until sometime, usually around midnight. An instructor busts into the tent with an M60 machine gun firing blanks and throwing a flashbang grenade, telling the trainee to start running. This event, known as the breakout, signals the start of Hell Week. Throughout the entire week, the men will complete many of the events they've done before, only now they'll have no rest. The men are allowed two two-hour naps twice throughout the whole evolution. The chronic sleep deprivation makes them feel disoriented and hopefully lose focus on the pain and only on the next event. By the end of the week, those who did not quit or get dropped for medical reasons face their last challenge of a simulated combat scenario known only as Not So Sorry. Once this is complete, Hell Week is over and the next phases of their training can resume. While the next two phases are no less grueling than the previous two, they're challenging in their own ways. Most of each class will drop out by the end of the first phase and very few leave during the next two. Why that is can probably be explained that those who survive the first two are mentally and physically some of the toughest warriors on the planet. Toughest warriors on the planet. Almost all of those who complete Hell Week will go on to graduate from BUDS. Just exactly why that is, is probably because learning the actual skills of advanced diving and small unit tactics are things that can be taught, while the mental and physical toughness of being a SEAL is something students either have or do not. It's the Zoomies versus the Squids, the United States Air Force versus the US Navy, two of the most powerful, if not the most powerful forces on Earth, in a head-to-head -head matchup to determine just which branch is the best at their primary purpose killing bad guys and breaking their stuff. For the sake of this thought exercise, we're going to ignore the normal realities of warfare and focus solely on firepower and assets. After all, in a realistic war scenario, the US Navy could do something the US Air Force could never do, blockade ports and stop the shipments of supplies. So we're going to be pitting man and machine in a straight up deathmatch and find out which of the two services come out on top. Despite their close partnership with the US Navy, for this fight the Marines are out. Sorry sailors, but you're fighting this one on your own. Likewise, US Army forces which typically help provide ground security for the Air Force assets are also out. 
leaving the Zoomies to fend for themselves. Most of this war will naturally happen in the air, though without the support of their sister services the US Air Force does have one advantage that the Navy doesn't, the ability to deploy a moderate ground force against Navy targets. The Navy after all isn't just about ships, there's a long link of repair and resupply centers that are vital for keeping America's fleets out at sea. US Air Force Security Forces personnel are, traditionally speaking, military police no different than their counterparts in the other branches. However, during the Vietnam War, the Air Force realized that it couldn't always rely on the other services for protection of its airfields in hostile territory, and quickly established a training program to convert their military police personnel into small but competent infantry forces. Today, Security Forces personnel are all trained in air-based defense and receive qualification training with heavy squad weapons such as the 50 caliber machine gun and the Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher. Some of these personnel are even qualified for air assault operations. Numbers are hard to pin down, but there's an estimated 25,000 US Air Force Security Forces personnel currently on active duty, given the Air Force a sizable ground assault element that the Navy can't match. While US Navy Masters at Arms are trained in protecting ships and shore installations, their focus and training isn't as exhaustive in ground combat roles as Air Force Security Forces personnel. With the focus shifting from protecting airfields from unsophisticated terror and insurgent threats to a potential showdown against regular Chinese or Russian infantry units, US Air Force Security Forces personnel have recently begun a program to seriously upgrade their standards, training, and equipment to meet these near-peer competitor threats. The stated goal of the US Air Force is to produce a force comparable to US Army Light Infantry, powerful enough to repel a coordinated attack from near-peer competitors. This means new tools such as anti-tank and anti-air man portable weapon systems and fire support platforms such as mortars, as well as a stronger emphasis on assault and defense operations. On the ground, it's clear that the Air Force has a serious advantage, being able to deploy a sizable force to seize vital US Navy ground installations and repel any assaults against its facilities. But the primary combatants in this showdown are going to be aircraft and ships. So how do they measure up, and what can they add to this fight? The first step in this battle between the services will be establishing air superiority, as the primary armament of both services is going to be its aircraft. In the Navy's corner, we have the F-A-18 Super Hornet, an aircraft developed to counter advances in Soviet fighter design. Turns out the Navy completely overcompensated and created one of the most formidable fighter aircraft ever built. Responding to the Navy's Super Hornet threat is going to be the F-15 Strike Eagle, another development created in response to the advancements made in Soviet fighter design. Both aircraft come from the same manufacturer, meaning they share many of the same strengths, making this a difficult matchup to determine. The F-15 is an air superiority fighter, but it's primarily geared for ground attack role. The Hornet is instead a jack of all trades, doing everything from air superiority to suppression of enemy air defenses, recon, and even aerial refueling. That versatility gives the Navy greater flexibility and makes sense for a service which has limited space on its aircraft carriers. The better buy for your money is the aircraft that can do multiple things well, rather than a single specialized task. But in this fight, which is better? The F-15 is powered by dual Pratt & Whitney F-100 turbofan engines, producing 29,000 pounds of thrust at full afterburner versus the Hornet's General Electric F414 engines putting out 22,000 pounds of thrust at full afterburner. This gives the F-15 a speed advantage of a whopping 700 miles per hour, with the F-15 clocking in at 1875 miles per hour versus the F-18 at 1190 miles per hour. The F-15s are going to get to the fight first every time, and if they get in trouble, they'll easily outrun any pursuing F-18s, leaving them in the dust. By comparison, F-18s trying to flee from the Air Force's Strike Eagles are going to wind up getting splashed. The Eagle also has greater fuel and weapons capacity than the Hornet, with the F-15 carrying up to 23,000 pounds of fuel and weapons versus the F-18's 17,759 pounds. More fuel and more missiles means the Air Force's fighter can stay in the fight longer and shoot more, and gives the F-15 nearly double the range of the Navy's F-18. However, the Navy's F-18 can carry the AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation missile, giving it a robust capability in destroying enemy ground and even airborne radar, while the F-15 cannot. Conversely, the F-15 can carry the GBU-28 bunker buster bomb, while the F-18 can't. The F-18 is slightly more agile than the F-15, however, which would give it the advantage in close quarters dogfighting. Although as many enemy combatants around the world have found out, the F-15 is an absolutely terrifying dogfighter itself, 
Targeting and tracking systems on both aircraft are nearly identical, given that both aircraft operate for the same country. When it comes to long-range detection, the APG-82 radar has greater capabilities than the APG-79 radar used by the Hornet, although just how much greater capabilities is a mystery, as the data is a closely guarded secret. What's clear is that the Air Force Strike Eagles will get to the fight first, see their targets first, and fire first putting the Navy's Super Hornet at a disadvantage. However, the F-18 is equipped with infrared search and tracking capabilities, giving it a chance to take on stealth aircraft at close range. With 769 Hornets versus the Air Force's 454 Eagles, the number advantage may seem to be in favor of the Navy, except the 769 Hornets the Navy possesses represents the entirety of its air attack and air superiority forces. By comparison, the US Air Force can call on an additional 1,017 F-16 Fighting Falcons and 229 operational F-35 Lightnings. The Navy's own F-35s only number at 21 and are currently still only used for training. However, the absolute silver bullet in the sky for the Air Force is its fleet of F-22 Raptors, numbering at 186. While low in number, the Raptor is without comparison the world's most advanced air superiority fighter. Featuring a radar cross-section the size of a marble, its armament may be limited as it's forced to carry its weapons internally, but its powerful radar allows it to detect enemy aircraft and engage them at beyond visual range. While the Air Force initially wanted a fleet of almost a thousand of these incredible aircraft, the extreme price tag upwards of $220 million per aircraft, as well as a lack of a realistic threat to face off against by any other nation, shelved the original production run and limited it to the number the Air Force currently operates. Simply put, in an air battle, the US Navy is going to come out losing badly. Not only is it completely dwarfed by the numbers of the Air Force air superiority fighters, the Air Force's F-22 presents a threat that an F-18 pilot is unlikely to survive. Luckily, the number of these airborne assassins is relatively low. However, the Navy can call upon support from its large fleet of warships, who thanks to modern battle networks can add their firepower to an air battle. While its fleet of dozens of attack submarines may seem like an odd fish out in this fight, many of them are capable of taking on land attack roles thanks to the addition of cruise missiles to their magazines. With a range of 1,550 miles, Navy subs could deliver crippling blows to US Air Force installations with little if any warning. Likewise, its fleet of 91 destroyers and 19 corvettes could all strike at Air Force airfields. A vast inventory of anti-air missiles such as the RIM-174 and the RIM-162 Evolved Sea Sparrow can project serious anti-aircraft firepower into a fight, leaving US Air Force planes at risk in any air battle within range of US Navy ships. The US Air Force is not the primary service for neutralizing an enemy fleet. That task falls on the US Navy, but it is still very well equipped to deal with hostile vessels. The AGM-158 JASM and the AGM-86 are both extremely long-range standoff attack air-launched cruise missiles, packing a thousand-pound warhead capable of sinking enemy ships. The AGM-158C is the latest iteration of these anti-ship missiles and features greatly improved technology allowing it to locate, track, and target hostile vessels independently while ignoring civilian shipping. These missiles are all low observable, making them difficult to spot on radar and are programmed to fly extremely close to the ocean surface, which makes them even more difficult to spot and target by a ship's anti-missile defense systems. However, none of these weapons are supersonic, as the US is currently coming far behind Russia and China in developing supersonic weapons. This means the individual success rate of each missile is dramatically lowered when pitted up against the Navy's sophisticated anti-missile defense systems. Though the AGM-158C is capable of coordinating with other missiles to conduct swarm attacks, approaching a target from multiple directions in overwhelming numbers. Increasingly, this fight is turning bad for the US Navy. With an air superiority fleet that's less than half the size of the US Air Force, and with aircraft outmatched technologically by the Air Force, the Navy will never be able to establish air superiority. Even more importantly though, the Navy's Hornets will never be able to establish air superiority at the standoff attack distances required to stop Air Force bomber aircraft from launching anti-ship attacks. While Navy fleet defenses are likely capable of chewing up most of the Air Force's surface attack aircraft, the Air Force's ability to attack with long-range precision weapons means their vulnerable bomber aircraft can target and fire from well outside of the air defense envelope of the Navy. 
One way the Navy plans on protecting its surface fleets from this threat against a near-peer competitor such as China or Russia is to simply establish combat air patrols at greatly extended ranges using F-18s in tanker mode or new tanker drones to refuel F-18s assigned to long-range air patrols. However, no other nation can bring to bear against the US Navy the sheer number and capabilities of the US Air Force, and in a real-world situation, the Navy would always rely on Air Force help to protect its ships. Air power will determine this battle, and the Navy loses in that arena. While Navy ships would be able to launch attacks against Air Force airfields and ground installations, they won't last long against coordinated Air Force attacks by fleets of B-1 Lancers and B-52s equipped with standoff long-range munitions and protected by fleets of F-16s, F-15s, F-35s, and F-22s. Air Force planes would always be able to redeploy to civilian or even improvised airfields, but Navy fighters will find that their only safe landing site, their aircraft carriers, will very quickly end up at the bottom of the sea. With complete and total air superiority, the US Air Force is without a doubt the victor of this conflict. Though in reality, this conclusion is no surprise. Air power has long been the single most important weapon in modern war since World War II, leaving any foe without suitable air power at the absolute mercy of even an inferior army that is supported by a competent air force. However, it's also a matter of different mission sets that sees the Air Force declared a winner. The US Navy is indeed tasked with air superiority, but its vessels are also designed for a wide range of different responsibilities, from surface warfare to subsurface warfare, and the escort and deployment of ground combat troops to beaches around the world. The Air Force, however, has a far more limited scope of missions, air superiority, recon, and ground attack, and its equipment is thus far more capable in these arenas than the Navy's. In truth, neither service could win a war without the other, and the two are equal and vital partners in ensuring the US military remains the most powerful on Earth. But squids would totally get their butt kicked by zoomies any day of the week. Some of the world's most famous unsolved disappearances have happened in the mysterious Bermuda Triangle, but none are as baffling as the unexplained vanishing of the USS Cyclops. In 1918, the USS Cyclops set sail from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil to Baltimore, USA, making a brief stop in Barbados. After the vessel departed from Barbados on March 4th with 309 people on board, both the ship and its crew were never seen again. To this day, not a single piece of debris from the ship has been found. So how exactly did the massive USS Cyclops disappear without a trace? Let's go back in time and discover what happened. Built in 1910, the USS Cyclops was known as the largest collier in the US Navy. Colliers were coal-carrying ships that were used to transport the coal used for fuel to other ships. At around 540 feet long and 65 feet wide, the Cyclops was so big that it was the size of one and a half football fields. The massive steel-hulled collier was appropriately named the Cyclops after the fabled one-eyed giants of Greek mythology. In April of 1917, the US entered World War I and the Cyclops was commissioned on May 1, 1917 to join the US war effort. During the war, the ship was used to transport troops and resources and help refuel warships of the Allied forces. On its last trip, the USS Cyclops left Rio de Janeiro loaded with between 10,000 to 11,000 tons, the exact tonnage is disputed, of manganese ore, a much heavier and denser cargo than it usually had to carry. Some port officials in Rio at the time believed the ship had exceeded its carry capacity and appeared overloaded. It's also important to note that the crew had no familiarity with the ore, as this was the first time the USS Cyclops was carrying such cargo. Before the ship left Rio on February 15th, the ship's commanding officer reported that the starboard engine appeared to have a cracked cylinder and could no longer function. This reduced the speed and performance of the USS Cyclops from an average maximum speed of 15 knots to about 10 knots. A survey board that inspected the ship agreed with the commander's observation about the engine and recommended that the Cyclops return to the US for repairs. So the ship departed, making another stop in Bahia before leaving Brazil. Today, the Navy believes that there were 309 people on board, though contemporary accounts of the ship's disappearance list 293 people on board, including 15 officers, 221 crewmen, and 57 passengers. The passenger list included prominent figures such as Alfred L. M. Gottschalk, the American Consul General at Rio de Janeiro, who was returning to the US after a long-term post abroad. Though the USS Cyclops was supposed to head straight to Baltimore, the ship made an unscheduled stop in Barbados on March 3rd to resupply. To this day, it's still somewhat unclear why the ship made this stop, as the Cyclops should have had enough supplies to continue to Baltimore. Some think the captain was worried about the ship's cargo. A few inspectors in Barbados stated that the cargo wasn't stowed correctly. Instead of being level, it was piled up higher in the middle rather than spread out evenly. 
Additionally, the water was over the ship's plimsoll mark, a line on the ship's side which indicates the legal limit of submersion, meaning the ship was overloaded. The USS Cyclops left Barbados the next day, March 4th, and was supposed to arrive at the port of Baltimore a week and a half later on March 13th. After sending out a transmission of weather fair all well, just after clearing the port of Barbados, the USS Cyclops seemingly vanished, never to be heard from again. In the days after the ship disappeared, hundreds of American ships nearby made repeated radio calls to the USS Cyclops to try to establish its whereabouts. All the calls went unanswered. As the days passed, publications immediately started throwing around theories about the Cyclops' disappearance and what might have caused it. Did a freak storm sink the enormous collier? Or did an enemy German U-boat torpedo the USS Cyclops and send it to a watery grave? Multiple magazines at the time, including Literary Digest, even suggested that a giant octopus might have risen from the sea and twined the ship with its tentacles and dragged it down to the bottom. Perhaps understandably, the Navy spent little time investigating this last theory, much to the relief of Cthulhu. What was the actual fate of the Cyclops? Could a simple tropical storm have sunk the ship? After all, one of the reasons the Bermuda Triangle has so many disappearances is because the weather in the area is notoriously unpredictable, and storms can become very violent very fast. Most experts believe that the storm theory doesn't hold water, pun very much intended, because the Cyclops made no distress calls, and there were no major storms reported in the area at the time of its disappearance. Others point out that there are smaller thunderstorms known as mesometeorological storms that are unpredictable and hard to identify, especially with 1918 technology. Storms like those can start at sea and completely dissipate before they ever approach land. According to meteorologists like Joanne Simpson, these storms form very quickly, especially over the Gulf Stream which happens to travel right through the Bermuda Triangle, and they may just last a few minutes before vanishing. However, while the thunderstorms are brewing, they are particularly violent, causing giant chaotic waves to form that put any nearby ships in danger. The lack of any distress call might be explained by these storms, as they sometimes also cause electrical disturbances that interfere with communication systems, such as the radio transmission on the USS Cyclops. Without any thunderstorms definitively identified in the area, however, this theory remains just that, a theory. How how about the Germans? Is it possible that they sunk the ship? The USS Cyclops was a great asset to the Navy during World War I, and it would have made an excellent target for Germany. However, there was no evidence that any German submarines were in the area of the Bermuda Triangle at the time. Furthermore, no proof has ever emerged that Germany was involved, even after the US forces intercepted German communications and acquired German military intelligence. This makes it seem highly unlikely that a German military attack took down the USS Cyclops. However, part of the reason the theory about Germany destroying or capturing the Cyclops persisted is because of the ship's captain, Lt. Cmd. George W. Worley. Despite his English-sounding name, Worley was born in Germany as Johann Frederick Weichmann and changed his name after moving to the United States. Reports came out that some crew members referred to Worley as Damned Dutchman, a derogatory reference to his German heritage as the word Deutsch, meaning German, was confused with Dutch. Even while he commanded U.S. naval ships, some thought he might have supported Germany during the war and turned over the Cyclops to the Germans. However, as with the theory of Germans destroying the USS Cyclops, this seems unlikely. The US military combed through German records after Germany was defeated in World War I, and no record of the Cyclops being captured or Worley working as a double agent was ever found. Even though Worley most likely wasn't some sort of German 007, the captain had other problems that attracted investigators' attention. At some point shortly before the ship vanished, there were unconfirmed reports of a mutiny against Captain Worley. Crew members allegedly accused him of being a drunk and completely unsuitable to steer the ship, both pretty undesirable traits in a sea captain. Several books and articles have described the captain as a strange character who had a habit of pacing the quarter deck wearing just a hat, a cane, and his underwear. After the alleged attempted takeover of the ship by the crew, Captain Worley was said to have reacted harshly, imprisoning the mutineers and even executing one. It's unclear whether he dressed up for the occasion or gave out the execution orders in his hat and underwear. In a letter to the State Department after the USS Cyclops' disappearance, even the US Consul in Barbados said that the rest of the officers on the ship seemed to deeply dislike the captain. Offering their own theory on the disappearance, the Consul wrote, While not having any definitive grounds, I fear fate worse than sinking, though possibly based on instinctive dislike felt toward the master. In addition to the Consul, many other sources suspected a mutiny on the ship during the time of its disappearance. They assumed the crew of the USS Cyclops, tired of their captain's strange behavior and harsh punishments, decided to seize control of the ship. However, even if a mutiny occurred and the crew were able to take control, it still doesn't explain why the ship was never seen again. The fugitive crew would still have had to dock somewhere, and no records exist of a stolen US naval ship showing up anywhere.
There is also the possibility that the USS Cyclops' disappearance stems from a flaw in the ship's design. Some naval experts believe that the fate of the two Cyclops' sister ships provide the most support for the design flaw theory. The USS Cyclops had three sister ships, the USS Jupiter, the USS Nereus, and the USS Proteus. Sister ships are the ships of the same class that are built following almost identical designs, so if there was a structural flaw in the design of the Cyclops, there would likely be one in its sisters as well. The USS Jupiter was sunk by a Japanese aircraft in World War II, so the cause of its demise is known. But the other two ships suffered similar fates as the USS Cyclops, albeit decades later, both vanishing somewhat mysteriously in the Bermuda Triangle in 1941. At the time, US Navy Admiral George Van Duers thought the ship might have sunk because their design was incompatible with their cargo. Both ships, like the USS Cyclops, were designed to carry coal. Yet, while they vanished again like the USS Cyclops, both the Nereus and the Proteus were carrying ore. Though it was was bauxite instead of manganese ore. Some thought this cargo might have weakened the ship's structures. Additionally, vendors believed that support beams of the ship might have been eroded after years of carrying acidic coal, exacerbating any weaknesses in the design. No matter what happened to the USS Cyclops, one of the most perplexing pieces of the puzzle is the lack of any debris or trace of the ship's wreckage, even decades after its disappearance. Thanks to better technology and search tactics, more historical shipwrecks are being discovered year after year, yet the USS Cyclops still evades detection. Some scientists think it's possible the Cyclops disappeared in the Puerto Rico Trench, which is the deepest point of the Atlantic Ocean. Located at the southern tip of the Bermuda Triangle, the trench reaches down to 27,500 feet below sea level at its deepest point, just 1,500 feet shy of the height of Mount Everest. Shipwreck aficionados believe that not only the USS Cyclops, but many other shipwrecks have been lost in time to this deep sea trench. However, because the exact day and time of the Cyclops' disappearance is uncertain, Navy investigators aren't sure if the is actually in the trench or someplace else along the Atlantic coast. Relatives of the 309 people lost on the USS Cyclops are still searching for answers to this day. They are hopeful that the Cyclops will turn up as search technology continues to improve and give them some answers for what happened to their relatives over a century ago. In fact, in the 1960s, an experienced Navy diver named Dean Hawes stumbled upon a massive wreck off the coast of Cape Charles, Virginia. Hawes was reportedly stunned by the enormous size of his find and claims to have seen, among other things, a bridge on steel stilts while exploring the wreck, which is consistent with the design of the Cyclops. He surfaced with the hope of going back down and re-examining the wreck along with his dive team, but bad weather forced the crew to abandon the area and sail back to shore. After a few years, Haas happened to read an article about the USS Cyclops and recognized the ship in the photo as the wreck he had found off the coast of Virginia. Excited by his discovery, Haas convinced the Navy to lead another investigation at the site of the shipwreck he had found all those years ago. Unfortunately, a follow-up search of the area turned up a different wreck altogether and no evidence of the USS Cyclops was found. There are also some, like astronaut Gordon Cooper and treasure hunter Daryl Miklos from the Discovery Channel, who believe that aliens may be abducting ships in the Bermuda Triangle. Using maps of the Earth drawn from space that his friend Cooper gave him, Miklos found a giant submerged object in the Triangle's waters in 2018, which he couldn't definitively identify as a shipwreck or a natural formation. He believes it may be an alien craft. In Miklos's view, the Bermuda Triangle is an alien abduction hotspot, which explains why ships like the USS Cyclops go missing. What happened happened to the USS Cyclops remains a mystery for now. However, regardless of the reason for the ship's sinking, the disappearance of the Cyclops was undoubtedly a huge tragedy. According to the US Naval Institute, it remains the largest loss of life for the US Navy in peacetime. The Littoral Combat Ship, or LCS for short, was supposed to be the Ferrari of naval ships. They were designed to be fast, nimble, versatile, and crewed by a small team. Unfortunately, that's not what the LCS program ended up being. Instead, these ships were a huge disappointment fraught with mishaps and malfunctions. If you imagine everything that the littoral combat ships were supposed to do, and then imagine how all those things could go wrong, that's what ended up happening. Basically, after 20 years, the only thing that's impressive about the LCS program is how much of taxpayers' money it wasted. At first, the LCS program looked promising. The Navy began shaping the plan of action in the 1990s. It started with the idea of creating a versatile ship which could get into hard-to-reach areas. The other selling point for the government was that it would be inexpensive and only need a small crew. As we'll see, neither one of those promises were kept. Another aspect of the littoral combat ship that appealed to Navy officials was the plug-and-play modules that could easily be swapped between missions. Each ship would be like a box of Lego. The frame of the ship would be consistent, but based on what specific missions called for, different modules could be plugged into the ship's hull. 
The ship would become modified for the mission at hand. The modules could be equipment containers, anti-submarine sensors, countermeasure equipment, or mine detectors. In theory, this would be great, but you won't believe the crazy problems that the Navy ran into while getting ready to deploy these ships. Before the problems started, the LCS was hyped up to be a fighter. It was claimed to be capable of going up against larger ships with ease. It would also be able to infiltrate harbors and difficult to reach waterways because of the size. But none of this ever happened, and the new vision for the LCS in the 2000s was a fast, lightweight vessel that could carry out basic missions. Even this expectation ended up being too difficult for the littoral combat ships to meet. The LCS program planned to have two ship types. The first was the Freedom variant, which was designed and built by Lockheed Martin at their Fincantieri Marionette Marine Corporation's shipyard in Wisconsin. The second was the Independence variant, created by General Dynamics Bath Ironworks. The variant was constructed in the company's Mobile, Alabama shipyard. Something to note is that neither one of the variants was built by the Navy itself or at naval shipyards. This was most likely done to save money. In hindsight, it might have been worth it for the Navy to build the ships themselves to reduce the amount of problems they ran into in the future. Both the variants had to adhere to specific guidelines so the ships could be outfitted with modules, but the material and way of constructing the ships was left up to the companies. This meant two different ships were built, both of which had their own unique problems and ended up wasting much more money than was originally budgeted for. Let's dive into the problems of the littoral combat ship and why it ended up being the most expensive mistake the Navy has ever made. The first problem with the LCS program was that the ships were unnecessarily complicated. The fact that two independent contractors were making the same ship in different ways shows how things could get confusing fast, and they did. The first iteration of the LCS was so ambitious that there was no way they could ever have completed within the given budget. Later on, we'll break down exactly how much money was wasted, but just know for now, it was a lot. The only way to complete the ships was by making concessions. The design had to change, the modules had to change, and the amount of crew had to change. Basically, everything about the littoral combat ship had to change just to get it out of dry dock. The complicated process of dividing the resources and having two separate builders for the LCS program obviously was a huge waste of money. Of the ships that were built and put through testing missions all ended up having to make adjustments or repairs at one point or another. The initial tests were so bad that the Navy reduced its order by 20 ships. This brought the number of ships down to 35, which actually ended up being 35 too many. Some of the problems the littoral combat ships ran into were so basic you won't believe it. The word combat is in the name of the ship, so you'd think they would be able to carry out basic battle functions. This assumption would be wrong, as the ships were put through combat simulations they more than often failed, and were not lethal enough to finish the mission. It would seem that a combat ship should be good at at least one thing, combat. Unfortunately for the LCS program, their ships couldn't even do that right. The most frequent combat deficiencies that the littoral combat ships had was a lack of basic radar systems. Due to limitations in the ship's design, the radar system rarely seemed to work the way it was supposed to. This was a huge problem when a mission called for tracking down an enemy or engaging in combat with submarines. Another combat inadequacy was the limited anti-ship missile defense capabilities. The LCS ships might have had weapons enough to fight with, but the defense weapons were very limited. Maybe the designers thought the enemy ships would just never fire at the littoral combat ship in a conflict. We think this seems unlikely. On all naval ships, there are redundancies in place for vital systems. This is because if you're in the middle of the ocean and something goes wrong, there's no towboat to bring you back to dry dock for repairs. So the ship needs redundancies to prevent catastrophic failures. The littoral combat ships did not come equipped with such redundancies. Among other problems, this means that a single hit could result in a complete loss of propulsion, combat capability, or the ability to control and mitigate damage to vital systems. Again, maybe this is okay if the littoral combat ship never found itself in combat, but again, we think this is unlikely. If you find yourself on a littoral combat ship, we recommend bringing lots of books and other activities to keep yourself busy, because if you break down, it could be a long time before someone comes to rescue you. One of the big points of the LCS was their customizability using the module system. However, during testing, installations of the module seemed to always take longer than planned, thus delaying the mission. Once the littoral combat ship was finally equipped with the correct modules, they sometimes failed to work properly. Imagine being on a minesweeping mission in a deadly underwater minefield. All of a sudden, the mine detection module on your littoral combat ship stops working. You'd be up Poop Creek without a paddle which is pretty much how every sailor felt while working on the problems that plagued the LCS. The failure of modules was not an isolated incident either. In three different modules, there were crippling technical failures and unscheduled delays. 
The plug-and-go system of the LCS modules was more of a hindrance than a help. As the LCS and modules ran into more and more trouble, the Navy began rethinking the whole program. By this time it was too late, though. They already had several ships made and ready for testing, but the next problems they ran into were truly remarkable. After the module mishap, the Navy decided to do away with the multi-mission concept of the ship and stuck with the basic uses and capabilities of the design. One thing that the littoral combat ship had going for it when it was equipped with specific modules was that it only needed a small crew to make the ship operational. Specific jobs and missions meant only specific people were needed to man the ship. Less sailors meant less casualties in combat situations and lower costs when carrying out missions. Now that the Navy had decided the ship was going to carry out several functions all at once, it needed a bigger crew. This obviously led to higher costs to man the vessel and more sailors being put into harm's way. But even with the larger complement of crew, the sailors couldn't keep the littoral combat ship from falling apart, sometimes literally as you're about to see. The littoral combat ship was designed to move quickly and to infiltrate difficult to access places. However, this can only be accomplished if the ship has working engines and fuel. Two things that the LCS program seemed to fail to take into consideration. The Navy prioritized ship speed over most other basic functions. It was supposed to be able to reach 47 knots, or around 54 miles per hour. The speed came at a great cost. The littoral combat ships burnt through fuel at an alarming rate. This meant that the ship would not be able to compete with similar crafts in the Chinese and Russian navies. The littoral combat ship may have been able to initially outrun or pursue another ship, but once it ran out of fuel, it'd be useless. Another problem with the propulsion system of the littoral combat ship was constant breakdown of the engine. One such breakdown occurred on one of the freedom variants of the ship. Due to the lack of redundancies for vital systems mentioned earlier, a seawater leak flooded part of the engine on the ship. The salt water got into the engine's oil supply and caused a catastrophic failure. The ship had to be returned to dock where most of the engine needed to be rebuilt. The engines are what make the littoral combat ship so fast, but if they're constantly breaking down, it doesn't really matter how fast the ship is supposed to be. All the failures of the LCS program has led the Navy to scrapping their plans for the littoral combat ships after two decades. Initially, each ship was supposed to cost around $220 million, but due to setbacks and poor designing, it's estimated that each of the 32 completed littoral combat ships cost around $655 million per ship. That's over $400 million more per ship than was budgeted. In case you don't want to do the math, the Navy spent around $21 billion on the LCS program, making it the most expensive mistake they've ever made. At this point, you may be asking yourself, what does the Navy plan to do to rectify their mistake? Can the littoral combat ship be fixed? The Navy has decided to take the money that was not flushed into the LCS program as of 2019 and use it to purchase 20 new missile frigates that have proven to be more reliable instead. As for the already constructed littoral combat ships, the Navy plans to retire them even though they're only six years old. It seems as if the only way to mitigate the most expensive mistake the Navy has ever made is to get rid of that mistake and forget it ever happened, which is what the plan is for the littoral combat ships at this point in time. It's said that the greatest heroes hail from humble origins, and when World War II exploded into the history books, surely nobody would have predicted that a dentist would become one of the world's most elite soldiers. But it's true, today we're taking a look at the orthodontist who became the first US Navy SEAL. US SEALs are world renowned as some of the best special forces operators in history. Fielding the most advanced and often highly classified equipment anywhere in the world, SEALs are routinely sent to do impossible missions in impossible places, trained to operate in the sea, air, and land. Hence the name SEAL. SEALs are deadly warriors who can reach any target anywhere it chooses to hide. From counterterrorism to direct action missions, SEALs are flexible enough to be sent on a hostage rescue mission one day and to blow up an enemy dam the next. To meet the stringent requirements of the Navy SEALs training program, you must not only be physically tough, but mentally tough as well, with an iron will and an attitude that doesn't know the meaning of the word quit. Yet these legendary warriors can trace their lineage down to a single man widely recognized as the first unofficial American SEAL. Navy Lieutenant J.G. Jack Taylor's service in World War II preceded the official formation of the U.S. Navy SEALs by almost 20 years, and yet he is the first U.S. commando to have been trained and to have actually operated on the sea, air, and land. 
As an orthodontist in Hollywood, California, Lieutenant Taylor answered his nation's call to arms. After the surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, a trained boater, Taylor assumed that he would become an instructor teaching boat handling skills to U.S. and Allied soldiers. But during his initial training, he certified on the Lambertson Amphibious Respiratory Unit, a predecessor to modern scuba gear. Having qualified on the water lung, as it was known, and with top marks for intelligence and physical fitness, the Office of Strategic Services was quick to recruit him. Established in June 1942, the Office of Strategic Services was America's response to the asymmetrical warfare units of Germany, Japan, and Britain, seeing a need for a different kind of war, a much dirtier type of warfare, that would take place behind enemy lines. The United States formed the OSS and gave it a degree of autonomy from the rest of the military, famously recruiting American playboys, socialites, and business elite. The OSS sought out operators who were not just physically fit and could take orders, but who knew their way through social situations and could blend in behind enemy lines. For the majority of the war, the rest of the U.S. military would deride the OSS as a bunch of playboys fooling around at war. But the reality is that OSS operators faced incredible danger and were directly responsible for many of America's greatest successes during the war. OSS operators were trained in intelligence gathering, demolitions, sabotage, and even in recruiting and organizing resistance movements. They had to be able to swim through choppy seas, parachute behind enemy lines, and evade enemy patrols through the wilderness. They brought with them a bag of dirty tricks, which could be used to sabotage enemy railway lines, the engines of motor vehicles, or even poison and assassinate high-priority individuals. As was famously said of them, OSS operators were experts in ungentlemanly warfare. Upon being recruited to the OSS, Taylor was assigned to the first underwater swimmer group, but was soon redirected to become the chief of the Office of Strategic Service Maritime Unit. The MU, as it was known, was responsible for infiltrating agents and supply resistance groups by sea, conducting maritime sabotage, and developing specialized maritime surface and subsurface equipment and devices. Its operators could be ferrying secret agents past enemy patrols into hostile territory one day and be swimming under the hull of a battleship and attaching an underwater limpet mine to the bottom of the mighty ship the next. Often these small teams of expert divers, boaters, and swimmers could do more damage than several destroyers together could. From September 1943 to March 1944, Taylor found himself operating in the Mediterranean. Here, Germany had been forced to send forces to aid its ally, Italy, after the Italians suffered defeat after defeat to Britain's African forces. With the Allies holding key bases in the Mediterranean, the Axis powers waged a brutal campaign against what they feared would become an Allied toehold, which could lead to an invasion. To support the war, Taylor and his men helped deliver spies to their targets along the Greek and Balkan coasts, as well as weapons, explosives, and other supplies to partisan forces behind enemy lines. As the Germans devastated Allied supply convoys, Taylor and his men became critical in quickly delivering critical supplies to Allied forces, his small, agile boat proving difficult to spot from the air. For three months, though, Taylor left the sea behind to personally lead a team of commandos behind enemy lines in central Albania. There, Taylor and his men carefully scouted out and reported on the location of enemy fortifications, supply dumps, and artillery positions. He would also shadow major troop movements and relay their plans via radio. Aware that a team of enemy spies was in the area, the Germans hunted for Taylor and his men time and again. Yet on three separate times, Taylor and his men narrowly avoided the German ambushes. For his daring feats behind enemy lines, Taylor would be nominated for the Army's Distinguished Service Cross. But being a sailor was instead awarded the Navy Cross. After D-Day and the successful landings at Normandy, the Allies began a push toward Germany itself. In Italy, Allied forces fought a brutal campaign north, pushing back the Germans inch by inch. The whole way, Allied forces were helped by partisan groups who had often been fighting the Germans for years behind enemy lines. Yet, as the Allies prepared to break out of Italy, military planners realized that they had no contact with partisan groups in Austria. In order to break Germany's grip on Europe, the Allies would need the help of these freedom fighters, but making contact would be an extremely dangerous undertaking, and exactly the type of mission the men of the OSS were perfect for. Personally picked to lead a four-man team into Austria, Taylor was tasked with making contact with Austrian partisans and gathering intelligence on German troops and fortifications. Parachuting into Austria would fulfill Taylor's air requirement of a Sea Air Land Commando, and he became the first U.S. soldier to conduct commando missions in all three domains. However, the mission ran into trouble almost from the get-go, with the pilots unable to drop the team's radios and other major equipment after the men had jumped. Accompanied by three Austrian corporals liberated from a POW camp, 
One of them became extremely ill in the first few days following the jump, and Taylor was injured on the jump. Nonetheless, the team gathered what equipment they could and began their mission to collect intelligence and make contact with friendly Austrian partisan forces. The team would photograph many German defensive positions and made contact with and ascertained the loyalty of various anti-German groups. As the mission neared its end, they formed a network of supporters who could be counted on to aid the Allies when the major push into Europe began. Yet, without a radio to communicate their critical information, the team was forced to attempt to slip through German lines and into Italy to rejoin Allied forces. On the night before their escape attempt, Taylor and his men were ambushed at their safe house and captured by German forces. Delivered to the Gestapo, the Germans slapped and kicked Taylor around, trying to force him to admit that he was a civilian and not a U.S. officer, which would have exempted him from the Geneva Convention protections. Taylor steadfastly refused to make the false confession, and eventually he was transferred to a holding cell and taken to a new interrogation. There, his interpreter would end up being an undercover Allied agent who was so visibly shaken at recognizing Taylor that in a later report Taylor would say that he was afraid the agent would blow his cover. The German commander asked about Taylor's mission and then asked why the Americans were bombing them when they had never once launched an attack against the US. Taylor quickly pointed out the fact that the only reason the Germans hadn't bombed the US was because they were thankfully out of range. Then the commander asked him how long he had thought the war would last, and Taylor said six months, to which the commander agreed. However, when he asked him who would win and Taylor said the Allies, the commander laughed. In less than a year, the Germans would surrender. After four months of interrogations, Taylor was eventually transferred to the infamous extermination camp of Mauthausen. After the guards discovered that Taylor was an American officer, he initially received humane treatment, even being offered cigarettes and brandy. Yet when he refused to cooperate with his interrogators, he was stripped of his legal status as a captured POW and instead labeled as a political prisoner. This was a violation of the Geneva Convention, but allowed the Germans to dispose of him as they wished. His uniform was taken away and he was forced to dress in civilian clothing. He was beaten several times and witnessed numerous executions of other prisoners. During his stay at Mauthausen, Taylor was twice scheduled for execution, but the first time a friendly worker in the camp's political office spotted his execution order in a stack of orders for other prisoners. The worker snuck Taylor's order away and secretly burned it. The German camp officers, however, eventually realized that Taylor was still alive when he very much shouldn't have been, and scheduled a second execution. Before the date arrived though, the German guards fled the camp as the American 11th Armored Division approached and liberated it. Just a few hours after liberation, Taylor was being filmed by an American film crew who was documenting the various prisoner and extermination camps. He gave the filmmakers a detailed account of daily life for the prisoners, as well as the inhumane and cruel actions of the guards. At the Nuremberg trials after the war, Taylor would testify as a key witness against the German war criminals, ensuring their sentencing for crimes against humanity. Lieutenant Taylor preceded the official establishment of the U.S. Navy SEALs by almost 20 years, and yet his courage and actions behind enemy lines set the standard for what would be expected of future SEALs. While he may never have officially been one, each new American SEAL can trace back their warfighting heritage to the man who was the first American commando to operate from the sea, air, and land. It's yet another matchup for the ages. The U.S.'s premier special operations force versus the infamous nighttime stalker and dream killer in the fashionably retro sweater and fedora, Freddy Krueger. When Freddy comes looking to score some nighttime kills on innocent Americans, it's the U.S. SEALs coming to the rescue. But who would actually win a showdown between one of the greatest horror villains of all time and a squad of the finest fighting men to ever walk the earth? In our blue corner is the squad of Navy SEAL operators, arguably the best special forces in the world. Whether it's fighting terrorists in Afghanistan or taking on aliens in space, when you've got a big baddie in either real life or fiction, SEALs are usually who you're thinking of to come to the rescue. Real SEALs are divided up between eight teams, with each team comprising six platoons of 16 SEALs each. This makes SEALs one of the largest special operations forces in the world seeing rapid expansion during the Cold War when they were expected to take on some of the toughest and most critical missions against Soviet bloc assets. If World War III had kicked off during the icy decades of the Cold War, you can bet that some of the finest attacks would have been carried out by American SEALs against extremely high value and sensitive Soviet targets. On their individual level, SEALs are amongst the best trained soldiers in the world. And much like their British SAS counterparts, they're taught to be able to utilize any firearm they may encounter on any battlefield. This ensures that even when their own rifle is lost or no longer useful, a SEAL can carry on the fight using the enemy's own weapons if need be. 
Exactly what equipment a SEAL will carry into battle depends on the battle to be fought though, with even the specific rifle to be used coming down to what the mission is and where it's taking place. SEAL snipers, for example, could have up to eight different rifles to be used in different conditions, battlefields, and mission types. For instance, SEALs involved in an operation to secure a target inside of an apartment building will likely be equipped with a shorter barrel weapon to aid them in such close quarters, and favor a 45 caliber round with a lot more stopping power at shorter ranges over a traditional 5.56 round with greater accuracy at longer ranges. Mission dictates equipment for a SEAL, in effect making them the battlefield specialists, akin to a surgeon on an operating table. Only the prescription is death. SEALs also have access to the world's largest black operations budget, which means that they get all the best and coolest toys. These toys include cutting-edge thermal vision goggles capable of penetrating very thin walls, radio frequency identifiers to track down an enemy's radio signals, and drones of all kinds. Miniature drones the size of insects can be used to identify enemies inside a complex urban structure, while larger drones can be dispatched from vehicles or even launched by soldiers themselves to monitor an area from above. Air Force Predator drones can also provide complete eye-in-the-sky situational awareness, beaming down infrared night vision or color picture images on demand to operators on the ground. As masters of improvised warfare though, an unarmed SEAL is not a defeated SEAL. And even without weapons or fancy equipment, SEALs can make life a living hell for the enemy. Every SEAL is a trained demolitionist and capable of constructing IEDs with commonly available materials on either a battlefield or a home. Expert hand-to-hand -hand fighters, SEALs are also trained in various martial arts, with techniques designed to either kill or incapacitate. In fact, after the war in Iraq and Afghanistan began, US military martial arts programs had to be redesigned as they simply presented too few non-lethal options for subduing a foe. With the world's strongest military at their backs and plenty of high-end weaponry and fancy gadgets, SEALs are a force to be reckoned with. But how could they cope with the original dream killer himself? Freddy needs no introduction. He's been haunting our nightmares since the 80s when he made the leap from Wes Craven's fertile imagination to the big screen. Since then, he's been slashing teenagers and nosy stepdads alike, but also taking on other big screen horror villains like Jason. Freddy survived them all though, probably because he can't ever truly die. Instead, Freddy's often temporarily defeated and must carefully work to cultivate nightmares in people so he can feed off their fears and return to stock more victims in the world of the living. Freddy's primary armament is his infamous glove stuffed full of razor blades, an impractical weapon in the hands of anyone but a supernatural dream stalker. Freddy is strong enough to push those razor-sharp blades through a few inches of plywood, and given enough time could even slash his way through a regular home doorway. This clearly shows Freddy doesn't have superhuman strength, but he is stronger than the average human, averaging out somewhere around peak human physical fitness but not truly surpassing it. Freddy's greatest power, however, comes from his ability to seamlessly transition between the real world and the dream world, making him an extremely elusive adversary. Just when you think he got Freddy cornered, he can leap through a mirror or otherwise disappear from reality and escape to the dream world where he can plot his revenge. However, as incredible an ability this is, there's one serious catch in Freddy's supernatural powers. They don't work very well if nobody's afraid of him. Like many evil supernatural beings, Freddy is fueled by fear. The more of it his victim experiences, the stronger he becomes. Unlike other supernatural villains, though, other people's fear of him can power him to hurt other people who themselves aren't afraid of him. In the Dream Master, we can see this happen when Debbie tells Freddy she isn't afraid of him, and while it's true that she isn't, others have already powered Freddy up, giving him the power he needs to kill Debbie. But if an individual is especially fearless enough, Freddy is completely powerless against them. These individuals can even have the power to banish Freddy back to a special part of the dream world where he can't hurt people anymore until he can slowly cultivate fear through dreams again in others. Unfortunately for Freddy, he's going up against some of the most fearless men in the world. Nobody is ever truly fearless, unless they have some sort of brain damage or a severe psychopathic disorder. Navy SEALs may be brave, but they're certainly not fearless as any of them will admit. However, SEALs train themselves to not just suppress their fears, but to actually thrive in the throes of that fear, and they have developed techniques to do so. One of the most prominent techniques for overcoming fear that SEALs utilize is pre-visualization. In this fear training, an individual will move themselves to a quiet place and meditate silently to themselves on every possible thing that could go wrong in any given scenario. By rehearsing their own reactions and realistically visualizing every disaster that could befall a SEAL in combat, 
they're less affected when the worst comes to pass. With enough pre-visualization practice, a SEAL will already have simulated the disaster so many times that they have an effect conditioned themselves to the fear response, greatly lowering its effect. Another extremely effective technique for combating fear used by SEALs is fear conditioning, or as it's known in the psychological community, exposure therapy. By gradually exposing themselves to things that are terrifying, people can better work to suppress their fears of those things. But obviously a SEAL can't practice exposure therapy with Freddy or they'll be dead in their first encounter. However, with some of the most difficult and dangerous training and missions in the world, veteran SEALs will have experienced so many terrifying things that, as a fringe benefit, their fear of new terrifying experiences is dramatically reduced. SEALs may be helpless to physically defeat Freddy. After all, we're talking about a dream killer who can be blown up, torn apart, have his head cut off, and even drowned and still come back minutes later for round two. Freddy is in effect immortal, and thus even superior SEAL firepower is going to do little to stop Freddy. However, with zen-like mastery of their fear response, a veteran team of SEALs will provide very little psychic energy for Freddy to feed off and fuel his powers with. The normally fearsome Freddy with his gauntlet stuffed full of foot-long razor claws will be as helpless as a mewing, declawed kitten if he can't get enough fear juice to do anything to physically harm our SEALs. And since most of his power comes from his supernatural abilities and Freddy is really no stronger than a peak physically fit human, we really doubt that a fearless Freddy is going to want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with eight highly trained martial artist SEALs. We're giving this win to the SEALs, but while they won this fight, Freddy can never truly be defeated, and with his penchant for violence, we hope that our SEALs' descendants grow up to be just as fearless as their fathers, because Freddy always comes back, eventually. Now go check out you versus a Xenomorph and see how you'd match up against a space monster, or click this other video instead.